Original. Shinnick, Marvel. Author, Moshe L. Copyright Web Novel. Chapter 1, Prologue 3. Shout out to hashtag Omega 200 author of MHA, True Power of Telekinesis for giving me the idea for this FIC. 18. Asterisk, 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 asterisk. The gloomy sky prevented the moonlight to shine into the land as thick heavy clouds littered the atmosphere occasionally rumbling as lighting flickered through it. 8. Helicopters hovers in the sky as its blades whip through the air, spinning as the soldiers tries to stabilize it. 2. Fuck. A soldier who was piloting one of the helicopter couldn't help but curse as he looked at the two figure who was floating about 20 meters away him. 3. The two figures was floating in the air as they talked indistinctly. One of the figure was a teenager wearing a hoodie and pants while the other one who looked pissed off was also a teenage boy with an obvious thin body wearing hospital gown. The one's neat white bandages that is wrapped in his arms and legs now crimson red as drops of blood seeped through it from his wounds and drops continuously. 21. We are now right at Seattle City where two presumably mutants are fighting, and as you can see they are now floating beside the top of the Space Needle and it seems that the one wearing hospital gown are the one wreaking havoc while the other one is trying to calm him down. This is one of the biggest mutant destruction we have seen over the years or their history and we. 21. A middle-aged female reporter said as she points to the two in the air while talking to the camera that is being carried by the cameraman. Listen, just focus, okay. The one in hoodie said as he slowly inched closer to the other one. I dropped him the one in hospital gown shouted. Why did you catch him? Andrew, this is not a game, do you understand? You're hurting people Andrew, said the one in hoodie as he tried to reason to the other one. 8. You're weak Matt, you're all weak. The one in hospital gown now known as Andrew shouted like maniac as he smiled madly. 13. Andrew, just listen to me for a seco. Don't tell me what to do. 3. Andrew they can't stop us. It's not too late for us to go. The one in hoodie now known as Matt said as he pointed to the helicopters and police. 1. It's too late. It's done it's over. You treated me like shit. You left me alone. You're not alone Andrew I'm here with you. I should have been with you all along. We can stop this right now, you and me, we can be family. Matt said. 14. Andrew looks at all the people on the ground, he looks at how they look so small. So, fragile, like an ant, he then looks at Matt as they floated in skies and then said, I'm an apex predator as a bus appeared on their vicinity and slammed onto Matt. 18. Andrew stands at a platform in front of a bank as some soldiers and police pointed their guns at him. He raised his hand and the soldiers immediately took this as a sign as they immediately fired at him rapidly but to their shock, the bullets just stopped in front of Andrew as he had his hands in front of him while screaming his lungs out. 2. Andrew then took a deep breath and then waved his hand in a pushing manner in front as the bullets that were in front of him blasted towards their owners. Body as they and their cars flew away from the force of Andrew's ability while being pierced by numerous bullets. 1. Andrew? Please stop this. Matt shouted as he cried while looking at his cousin who was now consumed by his power. 2. H-A-A-A. Andrew screamed as he raised his hands as the glasses of the buildings around them started to break and shattered the next second with some of the glass injuring the fleeing people. 2. Andrew? Please stop this. Don't make me do this. Matt screamed as he looked at the people being hurt while he lay on the ground with numerous wounds. It was a miracle that he was alive despite being slammed into buildings and being hit by a flying bus. Andrew. Please. Matt said weakly as he looked at the golden colored statue with a spear behind Andrew. He cried as he shouted and telekinetically controlled the spear in the statue's hand as it flew to the air. 11. Shluk. 2. With a sound, the spear pierced Andrew straight through the back as it came out of his front and stabbed onto the ground. Andrew stands impaled, a look of shock on his face, and then Matt flails up his hands, a bullet on the ground lifted and immediately lodged itself on Andrew's head, killing him instantly. Matt collapses, after a moment, the police advances. White room. 2. Matt lays on the floor of a perfectly white room. At the far end is a blackened out two-way mirror. There's a camera on. The inside of this as well as on the white room, and we can see resolute men in suits reflected on the inner glass, watching with unreadable expressions. There is a chair and a table, but he's clearly fallen out of the chair. It's maybe an hour after the scene in front of the bank, and he's received no medical attention. To this end, Matt is suffering from, among other things, massive blood loss, multiple broken bones, dozens of gashes and cuts, presumed internal bleeding, and a broken back. He can barely move, sliding around on the floor in his own blood, watched by the compassionless eyes of them. He is barely coherent, screeching in agony. Please, help me, help me, please, I'm sorry. I'm so sorry, I tried help me, help me, I'm dying, I'm dying. Stars I see stars, somebody it hurts, please. I'm the blood, I tried. 2. Matt screamed as he twisted on the ground in agony. Two men in contamination suits enter the room, wielding some kind of radiation sensors. They go over to Matt, scanning him. The men ignored him as Matt makes some gasping sounds, his eyes going wide. I can, I can hear the, singing. Matt said as he stops moving. He lays there, not breathing, completely still. Chapter 2, Chapter 01, Rebirth. In a well-lit room, a young man lays on a bed with his brows furrowed as if he was experiencing some sort of nightmare. The man's oceanic blue eyes slowly opened as visible confusion was present in it. What? The. 1. The man slowly raised himself in the bed as he took on his surroundings. 11. The unfamiliar room confused him. This was definitely not his room. The room only consists of the bed, which he was now on, a lamp on his side, a chair, and a mirror beside the door and a small window. Nothing else. 2. The tough-looking door of the room which was definitely solid metal made a screeching noise as it slowly opened. From it, a woman revealed herself. She has a gentle face and looks at about early 30s to late 30s. A slight smile adorned her face as she walked slowly towards him. She stops in the side of the bed while holding papers and looks at him. How are you? Andrew. Who are you and? Why are you calling me Andrew? 1. The man now known as Andrew spoke as he furrows his eyebrows his confusion. He swears that his eyebrows are now tired of all the confusion right. You can't remember anything. Impossible. You had a severe concussion after all apart from being speared through. 9. Wait. What do you mean by, arg, dot? Andrew asked trying to clear out the confusion but then a piercing headache suddenly assaulted his head. His head felt as if hammers are pounding his brains right now and he can't help but scream in pain. Are you okay? The doctor immediately hurried to his side and looked at him with concern. She then said, take a deep breath, okay? Inhale, exhale. Andrew still trashed in his bed from agony. This lasts for five minutes as the pain slowly subsided in his head. 
His body was soaked in his own sweat as he shifted uncomfortably in the bed. He then raised his head and looked at the doctor in front of him and repeated his question. Who are you and where am I? 1. I am Dr. Cecilia Reyes and you're in Milbury Hospital right now. She said with a harmless smile on her face. 5. After being speared through by your cousin and a bullet lodged itself on your brain. You immediately died. But you survived. We don't know how but your body started to heal itself on its own after we took your body. So, can you now remember anything? She continued. 18. Is that so? Andrew said with his head lowered and staring blankly at his hands. As I said earlier you're now in Milbury Hospital. This is where we nurture people like you who have special abilities and train them. 4. People like me. Andrew said. Yes, people like you who have special abilities. We call them. Mutants. Dr. Reyes said as she pulled the chair at the side and made herself comfortable in it. 6. Mutation mostly occurs in puberty. You may spend the next 13 to 15 years of your life relatively normal but after that, it just collapse. Yours and your cousin's case isn't rare as your mutation activated at around 17 years old but having the same ability definitely is rare since mutation varies from people to people even if they are related. Dr. Reyes stands up as she said, I and the other patients will have a session gathering later on the study. Patients who are the same as you, you are not the only one here. I know you've been through a lot Andrew but remember, you are not alone. 5. Andrew stands up from his bed as his body made some light popping sounds, he then made his way to the window as a vast green field with some trees that surrounds the place greeted him. He opened the window and took a deep breath, inhaling the healthy fresh air that seems to be filled with vitality washing his lungs. Can I leave? He said while savoring the fresh air. 1. No, not yet, not after you wreaked havoc in the city of Seattle like a maniac, we will need to assess if you're still salvageable or not. But until then, you will need to stay here, Dr. Reyes said with a calming voice. 4. Okay, Andrew said neutrally. Hmm. Dr. Reyes nodded as she looks deeply at Andrew who had his back at her and then made her way out of the room. What the fuck is happening? I transmigrated. Andrew thought as he tried to remember what happened before he woke up in this body. It was already the late 2022. Mikhail was your everyday person you can find basically anywhere. He was a student who is just trying his best to survive in the hellhole known as college. He, like many of his age, watches some entertainment like anime but not enough to call him an otaku since he just watched sometimes. He also reads some comics and his favorite was watching movies. His parents died when he was still young so when he became one of the unfortunate ones who got the covet just after it started to spread, no one was there to take care of him. But luckily or unluckily for him, he survived like a cockroach and after recovering he got back to his monotonous life. 13. One day, while he was on his way home after school, riding his cheap motorcycle that he managed to buy courtesy of the part-time jobs he takes while studying, a basketball suddenly appeared, rolling from the side of the road and into his path followed by a boy around 7 years old running after it. 6. He immediately tried to evade the two in panic and was successful with it. But then another rider suddenly appeared from the intersection. He tried to maneuver to no avail as he slammed at it inevitably. He got thrown from his ride with such impact and rolled on the pavement at high speed, his body out of control as his head slammed into a concrete post. His brain and blood splattering as he instantly died. 17. Heh, what a dumb way to die Mikhail or now known as Andrew Detmer shook his head. 24. He looked at the vast green field and thought of why did he transmigrated. Why in the body of Andrew Detmer from the movie Chronicle? 10. He thought deeply and reviewed the new set of memory in his mind. He then saw how Andrew grew up with his mother and father who while the former loved him, the latter always hated him and would always scold him with every chance he got. Andrew felt his anger rising as he saw this abuse that became worse after his mother became sick and bedridden and needing expensive medicines. His father would beat him, punch him, and treat him like a punching until he have completely vented his anger blaming him for his pathetic life. 2. He shuffled through those memories as his anger suddenly subsided as he came to a shocking part. There is a Tony Stark here along with the information about mutants whom the masses hate. This things made him confirm one thing. He's in Marvel Universe. Fuck. He couldn't help but curse as he realized this, this universe is one of the most dangerous universe you can find out there, and he actually transmigrated here where half the population of the universe can just disappear with a snap of a finger and entities bigger than the planets itself exists. 43. He just sighed as he thought of this and thought why is he here, here in this facility for mutants when he clearly got his ability from some crystalline structure that sits in the underground and not some X-gene. That is what he is gonna find out. But first, his ability comes first. 28. He looks at his hands and then using his ability to consciously control where his energy is being sent. He willed it form a wall in front of him but then suddenly, his telekinetic energy suddenly acted on its own as a film-like energy manifested around him, it shone like a clear water, sparkling as it surrounds him. It's a force field. Andrew furrowed his brows as he felt that the force field was like a separate ability from his telekinesis even though it also uses telekinetic energy to manifest. He was curious as he clearly remembered that he can't do this shit before, but didn't do anything about it as this was obviously a good thing. 8. He played around the forced field for a little while and then deactivated it. He looked around the simplistic room, he then settled for the chair as he looked at it with narrowed eyes, slowly, the chair began lifting to the air as it hovered there. 1. It hovered in the air as it moved again and began to make its way to him. After it got near him, he willed it to drop slowly on the ground. He looked at the bed after as he focuses a bit on it, the bed then began to also lift in the air as he willed it to stay about 5 inches off the ground. After about 5 minutes, it slowly got back on the floor. Telekinesis huh? I lifted that bed without much effort since I can also lift a cars and bus. Hmm. I wonder what's my current limit Andrew thought. 9. Andrew then looks at the mirror beside the door and approached it. He stands in front of the mirror and looks at his new self. He majorly resembles Dane Dehan, the actor, except for that he's actually more taller, probably around 5 foot 11 to 6 foot. Although all of this is being overshadowed by his physique which is thin. Not at the malnourished level but definitely thin. 38. Andrew sighs at this and just looks at the door thinking I should first know about this place before I make a move. This world is a mix of different worlds so I can't just assume that what will happen will happen since there is definitely something that is bound to be different here. 
2. He thought about all this for about half an hour and after that he was now ready to see the wonders of this place as he stood up from the bed and turned towards the door as it slowly opened and he got out. Chapter 3, Chapter 02, The New Mutants. Andrew walked through the long hallway as he practiced his ability by sensing the interior of the rooms that he passed by. He then slowly came to a stop in front of a door as he can hear voices inside. He then tried to sense what's happening inside by spreading his telekinetic sense in the room. Meeting room. Dr. Reyes and three young women and two young males sat in front of her, all of them gathering in a circle shape. Does anyone else like to share their first time? Dr. Reyes spoke as she looks at them. 13. New girl said the woman with long golden hair and a dragon puppet in her hand as she turned her head to look at the teenage girl who just came inside the room a moment ago and continued with, How fucked up are you? Iliana Dr. Reyes said but then got cut off. 1. Drugs I bet, or a nympho maybe. Hopefully. The man who cut her off said as he smiled at the teenage girl. Iliana. Roberto. Keep behaving exactly like what you are doing right now and maybe we can just spend the rest of the day in solitary. Dr. Reyes said calmly as she looked at the two who was trying to cause trouble. 8. The two fell in silence at that sentence. Clearly not fond of being in solitary. Andrew listened for a bit and, and then decided to make his entrance. Andrew opened the door and came in as he looks at the people inside. The main characters looks exactly as their movie counterparts. 1. Iliana having her signature annoyed look and long golden hair with her dragon toy Lockheed on her hand. Iliana aka Magic is a relatively strong mutant with the ability to teleport to Limbo. Invoke her soul sword and enhanced physical capabilities. 21. Sam looking like he was beaten with his eyes blackened and having a cast on his right arm. Sam aka Cannonball possesses the ability to generate thermochemical energy from his body. This energy is used as thrust to cause his body to be propelled through the air, like his namesake, at great heights and speeds. 6. Roberto having the usual smirk on his face and the narcissistic aura that surrounds him as he cockily sat on his chair. Roberto aka Sunspot is a mutant with the ability to absorb and manipulate solar energy. Using solar energy he can augment his physical abilities to great heights. 22. Ronnie with her ever innocent look as she looks at him with her big bright eyes with her short hair. Ronnie aka Wolfsbane is a mutant with the ability to transform into a werewolf. This gives her an enhanced physical capabilities and heightened senses. However, she is not a real werewolf, and, therefore, is not restricted to the limitations of a creature of the night like the full moon and silver-based items. 11. And we got the protagonist. Danny sat on her chair with a downcast look after the two made fun of her. 5. Danny has the mutant ability to generate and even manipulate powerfully realistic psychic illusions in the form of an individual's greatest fear or desire. By using her power, she is able to manifest the greatest fear of others in the form of near-reality shattering illusions, capable of inflicting both physical and mental damage on her targets. 10. Ileana and Roberto looks at him and immediately lost their interest after seeing nothing out of ordinary from him. Ronnie just slightly smiled at him. Danny looks at him curiously. Sam nodded at him with a slight smile clearly happy at having another guy in the group. Dr. Reyes sighed and then said, Okay guys heads up, this is Andrew. Andrew this is Ileana, Ronnie, Danny, Roberto and Sam she then introduced them respectively. Ileana, since you seem to be itching to get out of this room, why don't you give this to a tour yourself? Dr. Reyes said as she turns Ileana. 1. Why do I have to? Ileana said as she stands up and looked down at Dr. Reyes with annoyance. 2. Because I am asking you, Dr. Reyes said with calmness as she tries to assert dominance. 4. Ileana rolled her eyes with a groan and immediately got out of the door as Danny and Andrew who just chuckled followed her. 1. Andrew followed Ileana quietly while Danny kept asking questions. They got out of the building as Ileana introduced the establishments to them with visible annoyance. Andrew looked at this wide and vast place filled dilapidated structures. He then looked as the two talked with Ileana spraying paint on a fountain. 1. The two talked as Danny suddenly ran while Ileana sarcastically motivated her. Andrew looked at the running Danny and Ileana who followed her while walking. Andrew shook his head as he slowly floated in the air and began to rise in altitude. He took a look at the place which consists of some small buildings and with trees surrounding the whole place. He then continued to rise slowly and came to a stop at around 50 meters in the air as he raised his hands above his head as his hands came to a stop because of a barrier. The barrier revealed itself from being invisible and shone in orange color as Andrew touched it. Disappearing and returning to its invisible state after he removes his hands, he then flew down after that. Andrew made his way inside the cafeteria and approached Roberto who was the one serving their lunch. He took his lunch as he said, thanks. He took a sit in the table where Sam was also eating. He sat as Sam looks at him silently and got back to eating. Andrew broke the silence as he said, What's up, I know you already know me from earlier but just want to introduce myself personally. I'm Andrew, Andrew Detmer. He then raised his hands asking Sam for a handshake. 14. Sam looks at him and then shook his hands I'm Sam, Sam Guthrie. The two quickly hit it off as they finished their foods and then gave their plates to Roberto who was the one washing the dishes. They made their way outside while Sam gave Andrew some information regarding where they from or what were their powers etc. 1. They came to the damaged basketball court while Sam saying that he was gonna practice his ability. Ronnie and Danny also arrived at the place as they talked while looking at Sam. Sam's body began to glow with red veins began to get visible on his body as he, boom whoosh, blast off and began to flying at high speeds while slamming at the ground a few times. 5. After a few minutes of him miserably attempting to land smoothly, he stops after slamming into some wood boxes and groans. That was, smooth Andrew said after walking near him with his face twitching as he tried to hold himself from laughing. Fuck you man Sam groaned as he shakily stand from the ground as glares at Andrew. Haha. Ha. Andrew laughed as he helped him stand. The day quickly passed as another day came. The sun shone brightly as it illuminated the family. Andrew who had just taken shower sat in a meditative position in the vast green field away from the facility as his telekinetic sense spread throughout his surroundings. He tried to sense everything in his range of 50 meters. His face contorted as huge information came crashing through his head all at once. How the trees around him danced, how the grasses waves at every whip of the air. The headache continued for an hour before it slowly subsided as he opened his with a smile. 6. He looked down at his hands and slowly spread his palm, he then controlled his telekinetic energy to form a blade construct. 3. After two seconds, his telekinetic energy formed an invisible blade. He then pointed his palm forward as the blade moved in high speeds cutting blades of grass in its path as he willed it to slowly dissipate after reaching far away from him. 2. 
He then stands up and stretched his body as he made his way in the facility while still practicing his ability by passively coating his skin with a thin film like telekinetic energy. This is one of the way he thought of that would increase his control over his ability even when he's not focusing on practicing. Night came quickly without anything happening out of ordinary except for Ileana and Danny whose heated argument turned into a fight with Ileana attacking Danny with her soul sword who was saved by Dr. Reyes who arrived on time to stop the fight. The two ended up in isolation to reflect on their actions. Chapter 4, Chapter 03, Upgrades 3 in a room filled with tables, chairs, and bookshelves that are filled with numerous books we can see six people sitting in a meditative position on the ground with closed eyes as they inhaled and exhaled in rhythm, with the exception of Ileana who was just casually sitting while looking at Dr. Reyes lazily. Control. Dr. Reyes said repeatedly with her eyes closed and with the final control. She opened her eyes as she looked at them and just sighed after seeing Ileana. After the session finished, I said goodbye to the young mutants and then immediately made my way back to my room after an epiphany struck me after meditating. 1. I sat at my bed with my legs crossed and cleared my head of anything that will distract me in the middle of my little project. After clearing my head I then tried to look inside me. Instead of bringing the telekinetic energy inside of outside, I tried to sense inside the energy itself. It did not take long for me to find what I was looking for, after looking carefully through the realm of the energy itself. I found the source of my ability. I saw a bundle of energy that glows in mystical red and blue as it pulsated like it's alive. I then slowly made my consciousness move towards it to try and probe it. Seconds after doing that, I immediately believed in the phrase curiosity kills the cat as headache that feels nothing like I experienced before assaulted my head. It felt like a thousands upon thousands of needles are poking my brain slowly but continuously. I gritted my teeth in pain and tried to not make a sound. 6. Ah. The mystical energy that gave me my ability screeched like a fucking banshee even without a visible mouth adding more pain to what I am currently feeling. Some things kept flashing through my mind as I could not think of anything anymore and immediately lost consciousness after enduring that for five minutes. I slowly opened my eyes and shifted in the bed uncomfortably as I felt cold sweat soaking my clothes. I then helped myself to sit as I held my head feeling the leftover pain pulsing in my head. Before I could make any more move, the door to my room opened and with it, Dr. Reyes revealed herself as she approached me. What happened Andrew? I saw you holding your head in the camera earlier. You look like you were in so much pain. She said with worry visible in her voice and her eyes revealing such a deep concern that it almost made me shed a tear. 2. If didn't know shit, I would have thought this woman is really genuine. Andrew thought, he looked at Dr. Reyes and just smiled wryly. He then said, I was. I was actually just playing with my power and thought that it would be good to probe my mind with it, but then, you know what happened next. Andrew said while scratching his head which he lowered because of embarrassment. 3. Dr. Reyes sighed as he neared him and sat on the side of the bed. Andrew, you shouldn't mess with your power like that, especially with your brain. You should know that brain isn't to be casually meddled with right. She then sighed as she patted Andrew's left shoulder and then continued with. Andrew, I can see that you've definitely adapted and become more close with the other patients. That is a good thing Andrew, I can see that, you're really on your way to great improvement. Continue like this and sooner than later you'll definitely be free from here. Okay. She gently smiled and then stood up. 2. Okay. Andrew said with his head still lowered. Hmm. Dr. Reyes nodded as she made her way to the door but then. Dr. Reyes. I just want to say. Thank you. For accepting me and not giving up on me despite of what I have done before. Th dash. Thank you. Dot. Andrew said as he raised his head to look at Dr. Reyes with his eyes glistening with tear and overflowing with gratitude and appreciation. 12. No problem. You're always welcome Dr. Reyes said and got out of the door with a smile. Clearly satisfied with the future killer. 19. If there is a rank for acting somewhere, I'd definitely be on the S rank already, ha. Huh. I thought as I laughed in my mind but my external appearance still retaining its smile. 24. Now, let's talk about the changes that happened after I lost consciousness, I looked at the clock and saw that just an hour has passed since. The bundle of energy before have now completely disappeared, I found out that when it dissipated, its very essence merged with me, my mind specifically. It gave me an enhanced and more precise control over my TK and more clear view of what I can now do and what I will be able to do. 9. I also found out that that bundle of mystical energy that pulsated like it was alive was actually a remnant parasite attached to the very power that I got from the crystalline structure. Furthermore, that crystal was actually a product of something otherworldly after I saw some memories from that parasite. I don't really know the details but from what I saw, that crystal was actually something that the alien race uses as an invader. The crystal will be sent by them to planets to planets and then the crystal would do its work by slowly corrupting the life forms inhabiting the world and then finally after the whole world was under the crystal's control, the aliens will do the rest, reaping the benefits without doing much effort. 13. Fortunately, from the flashes of memories, the alien race was actually already extinct after trying to infiltrate some world that they can't take on. That crystal was actually the last of its kind and the reason why I, Matt and Steve wasn't corrupted and controlled was because the crystal was actually approaching the end of its life and was suffering to some unknown illness, so instead of controlling us, it accidentally gave us our abilities while using all of its remaining energy and leaving only its last security, the parasite. 10. This parasite was the last line of its security, added by the alien race in case something happened to their crystals. It will feed on me as I grow strong and when I am strong enough this parasite will take over my body without me even having the slightest capability to resist it and will begin the job of the crystal, corruption and invasion. 1. Now now let's end the boring talk and let me tell you about my ability since that parasite is now in heaven. Parasite heaven? Or hell? Never mind. 7. First, I then crossed my legs again and took a peek inside my body using my telekinetic sense and surprisingly, I was not blocked by just muscles and blood, I could now see my insides in much more detail but still not to the point of seeing cells. But I can feel and I instinctively know that I can somehow control some part of my very being like my muscles, bones, tissues, organs, and my very own blood which equates to me now having a limited form of hemokinesis since I can feel that the possibility of me doing blood bending on others is still low. 15. After all that, I removed my senses from my inside and then focused as I tried to manifest the force field around, it formed much quicker than before and it is also more tough since I could see that it is more thick due of the increase to my control. 
3. After that I instantaneously spread my TK sense which now has expanded its range to about 150 meters, 200 if I really push. It also seems able to bypass restrictions as I can clearly sense the ground outside the force field that Dr. Reyes passively puts on. I could now see things much more clearly inside it. 2. As I recall my telekinetic domain, I felt something, as I focused, I found out that this was signals. That comes from a group of people, it was the mutants, I then focused my telekinesis while using my telekinetic domain simultaneously on them. 4. I then focused on Berto who was sitting in a chair with wire clips attached on his fingers, and as I focused on him, I suddenly felt a feeling of nervousness. And it came from him, oh I'm also now an empathy huh, I should work on this for it to become telepathy. He thought as he discovered this. 7. I then tried gathering a small amount of telekinetic energy in my palm which I carefully hide from the camera that was on the corner of the ceiling. I slowly compressed it, slowly but surely to make sure no incident happens, a small ember of fire suddenly manifested above my palm and just as it came I immediately extinguished it. Pyrokinesis? Check. 10. After that I tried gathering the water vapor in the air which I wasn't successful. It felt like I would be able to do it if I train a bit more. I then tried other basic forms of kinesis that I can think of which was of course not successful again. 3. After the unsuccessful experiments, I then thought of something brilliant and then I tried to think of different things all at once and was surprisingly able to do it. Parallel thinking? Check. 9. I began to feel a little headache after I tried to think above a dozen different things at once so I turned it off. 4. After all that, I activated my telekinetic domain and controlled it to only be about 10 meters around me and using parallel thinking, I then made it passive. 3. The increase to my precision also obviously comes with the increase of things that I can lift with my telekinesis. If in the past I can blast away multiple cars and lift bus, then now I roughly estimates that, that increased by about twofold. 4. After reviewing all the upgrades that his power gained, Andrew smiled with satisfaction as he stretched his body in the bed and then stood up. He frowns a bit as he smells his clothes that stuck to his body and began making his way quickly to the shower. Chapter 5, Chapter 04, The Plan I walked in the long boring hallway of this facility after taking a refreshing shower and began making my way to the attic of this building where the young mutants are currently gathering at and having their fun. I killed 18 men. One by one Ileana said as she sat with a smug smile on her face. You're lying Danny said in disbelief. No, she is not Sam said also stunned as he saw the readings in the polygraph. You don't believe me? I'm the most powerful mutant here. Ileana said and stood up immediately as she glares at Danny, angered by the fact that the newbie doesn't believe her. Maybe, but we don't know that. We still don't even know what's the power of Andrew after all. Sam said denying the claim. It's telekinesis. The door opened as Andrew came in with a bored look on his face and answered their curiosity. Telekinesis? What does that do? Control telephones. Roberto said while genuinely curious. Well I can do this. Andrew said and then telekinetically lifted all the seats that they are currently sitting on bringing sudden fright in them. Whoa whoa. Roberto said in surprise and others also expressed their surprise as they are all lifted about 5 feet from the ground. Andrew then returned them slowly as he willed it to the ground easily without even spending a single sweat. That's a cool power dude, with that, you don't have to fight in close range since you can just throw things at them, damn. And then I got mine which is basically useless since I can't even control it. Sam said in amazement but then as he remembers his power, his mood then quickly go down the drain as he can't even control his own power and it even killed the ones he cherish. I'm sure you will definitely be able to control that sooner or later, don't worry. Andrew said with a smile as he willed one of the chair to go into his position as he sat on it comfortably. That still wouldn't be enough to defeat me. Ileana wasn't the one to be defeated as she crossed her arms and spoke with confidence dripping from her voice. The time quickly passed with them just talking and this brings them more close to each other as they talked about the recent nightmares, etc. And when the time was approaching midnight and they are all done and exhausted from talking, they made their way to their respective room to rest. While Ileana was once again pulled to her nightmare about the men in a smiley masks and in the end, didn't manage to sleep that much. The same was happening to the rest of the young mutants except Andrew as they began experiencing their worst nightmares that wouldn't let them sleep. Today, I want to talk about obedience. This one of the most important thing that you need if you want to get better and move to my superior's facility. Dr. Reyes said calmly as she looks at the young mutants gathered in front of her. What if we don't want to move to your boss's facility? What if, you know, we just want to go home? Sam said. Sam, you remember what happened. You think they stopped looking for you, you think they have stopped hunting you. Dr. Reyes said as she continued, if you weren't here right now, you would be in prison. Or even worse. That was, that was clearly an accident? I didn't mean for any of that to happen. Sam said, explaining his side. Do you think that anyone outside this room would believe that? Dr. Reyes replied rather calmly. I would. Sam is a good guy. Danny said as she joins the argument. Even if I'm not. What? Do I do I really have to spend my whole life in here for one mistake? Sam said getting agitated as he felt that the doctor wasn't even helping him at all. Once you're better. Dr. Reyes replied. When am I gonna get better? Sam said as his voice raised. What's gotten into you Sam? Dr. Reyes said with curiosity since Sam have never acted this way before. Look. Something's not right here. I'm seeing things. Terrible nightmare. Sam said explaining his side while remembering his nightmare last height and continues with when will I gonna get better. Dot. You're better when I say so. Dr. Reyes said rather dumbly. Clearly not good at this things. You know what? Forget it. This is bullshit. You're not even listening to what I'm saying. Sam said as he finally gives up trying to explain himself and walks out of the room quickly and made his way outside to take a fresh air. Dr. Reyes looks at Sam walking out and looks at the rest of the new mutants. She stands up as she also gets out of the room. Ileana hugs her knees on her seat with her head lowered as she also remembers seeing nightmares. While the others was also the same except for our MC who was at the same time also thinking what's for their lunch. Dash. I just kept quiet and observed them as I now knows that things are about to get messy from here on. I don't intend to mess with the direction that the future is going since I want all of them to learn the lesson that they very much need to learn from here onwards. The reason why I want to? Nothing. 
But of course, this doesn't mean that I will be their babysitter and do things for them. No shit. Why would I even do that? I just wants to see if things will really go into their original path because you know, I'm fucking here, and because of all those butterfly effect and shit, things are definitely bound to be different. But the main reason why I will actually go through all that and not just crush that doctor and leave was because I am Andrew freaking Detmer who have wreaked havoc and killed numerous people in Seattle I am pretty much sure that most, if not all, of the different kind of organizations and government are now looking for me for what I did. While I am not afraid of them, my current strength still doesn't give me the capability to be arrogant so I'll bide my time here planning my future and mastering my ability while waiting for the inevitable outcome that I will leave this place maybe the X-Men will take us after we're free from here that's a plus. While waiting here I have actually devised a little plan regarding my new life right now and what I want to and need to do in order to live life to the fullest while surviving and that are first master my power this the most important thing I need to do because only with enough power can I truly be free from all the bullshit things that this universe have next is be the strongest I'm not really sure about this but oh well since I'm already here and I've got one of the most limitless ability I can get why don't I see if I can stand at the top of this crazy universe or not and finally live the best I will definitely do this since in my past life and as Andrew my life is too pathetic so gotta do something about that that's basically all of it all I want to do is to survive to see all the things this universe have because as dangerous as it is it also holds many things from powerful artifacts that can literally let you erase half the universe to beautiful womb cough I mean places that will let you realize the true meaning of life and achieve inner peace Amitabha slash amen slash a with macron mn whatever you want after that intense argument of Sam and Dr. Reyes, I got back on my room and spends the whole day in my room trying to improve my control over my abilities. Oh and of course I did my practice carefully to and avoided the security camera. I still have no hopes of improvement regarding the prized molecular to atomic control over my telekinesis that will let me harness some of the true potential of it. But I'm not worried since from what I know, it's only 2011 right now, which is different from the original timeline of the movie Chronicle. I still have time to be stronger before things go to shit starting with the Battle of New York. Night quickly came as I got out of my room and began making my way towards the canteen to fill my stomach since I got a bit tired from all the practice I did. In the canteen, I saw the new mutants gathering and eating in one table while talking with low voice, approaching carefully from behind them stealthily after getting my food myself. Boo, I shouted. Ah, who the foo? Oh it's you Andrew, come on man, don't scare me like that, I thought I was about to blast straight through the ceiling. Sam who was greatly startled said as he pushed Andrew's shoulder jokingly, his previous anger from the argument earlier clearly gone. What are y'all talking about? Andrew said as he sat beside Roberto as he took a bite of his dinner. Well, Ileana here found a sleeping powder in the attic last night and she intends to put it on Dr. Rea's tea later after dinner, so that we can finally have time for ourselves that is free from her eyes even if it's just one night. Danny leaned near Andrew as she explains the reason in low voice. Well, do you want me to do it? Andrew said as he took a bite off his food. Can you do it? Ileana said not believing in his capabilities. Oh come on, you know that I can move things with my mind right? That'll be a piece of cake for me. Andrew said as he levitates the spoon he was holding while smirking. The new mutants realized that fact as they immediately agreed to this and then continued eating till they finished it and waited for Roberto the rich dishwasher wash the plates. Chapter 6, Chapter 05, The Nightmare Begins 2. Putting the sleeping powder in the tea of the oblivious Dr. Cecilia Reyes was of course just a walk in the park for me. First what I did was walk past the office of Dr. Reyes appearing as if I was just seemingly strolling while humming a tune and when I passed her door I dropped the small plastic that contains the powder. After that was controlling the plastic to make its way to under her table and when I sensed her standing up with my TK domain while trying to reach something over her table, I then telekinetically controlled the plastic and quickly emptied it contents in her tea and voila. Dr. Reyes quickly fell asleep soundly, comfortably even, as she began dreaming her old days in her previous facility, oblivious to the fact that her patience was the one behind her embracing the arms of cold hands of Morpheus. 6. Ileana walked the corridor where the office of Dr. Reyes casually while she took a quick glance to the window sneakily confirming if the wench of a doctor was really asleep. Ileana returned to the game room as she gave a thumbs up to Andrew who just smirked at her from the side while playing billets. They spend the night partying and having fun, clearly taking this one chance to freely express themselves without the eyes of Dr. Reyes. They gathered at the center of the game room as they sat on couch and chairs talking. You guys are one of the worst mutants I've ever seen. Oh, what will say to my superiors after this? Ileana said as she dramatically act with her hands on her forehead. 1. Who is this superior that she has been talking about? Danny said as she ate snacks beside Ronnie as she laughs. Isn't it obvious? You know the X-Men right? The team of mutants that debuted as the good ones just a few years ago? Trying to break the stereotype that all mutants are evil as they try to protect normal folks? That is where we are going after this. Sam said. 14. Yeah, I know them. It's just, why would I want to be an X-Men? Danny asked, not really into the idea of wearing the costume that the supergroup wears while saving people. Right. I ain't fighting and saving people while wearing suit. I'm rich. Roberto said arrogantly as he rolled around in the wheelchair he was seating. They're paying you to be an X-Men now. Sam said jokingly, I wouldn't mind being an X-Men. I mean they're cool. They're good. Ronnie said on the side. And why would they need a dog? Ileana asked sarcastically as she crossed her arms. 4. Ronnie just looks at her and throws some peanuts at her. Sigh. Children. Ileana said as she rolled her eyes acting like an adult. 6. The time passed as they talked and talked about different things. In the middle of their fun Ronnie and Danny goes out, clearly wants to have some fun themselves. Roberto looks at the two leaving and turned to Andrew and Sam as he asked, what are those two up to? Oh, come on, it's obvious, you don't have to ask. Here, cheers. Sam said as he lifts his glass. Galt you know how much trouble we're gonna get in for this right? Roberto said to the two of them, haha, what is she gonna even do about it? Kick us out. Sam said as he laughs and continued with, I don't wanna be in here anyway. Hmm, as long as she has her magic bubbles over the grounds. We don't have a choice. Roberto said, sighing. Yeah, I never did have a choice. Sam said, his mood starting to go down the drain. What do you mean by that? Andrew said as he drinks from the cup he is holding. Well, sighs. You know that I used to go to work on mines with my dad. Sam said quietly. I was still new to the job. And then this one day, I got claustrophobic. Like, I couldn't. Couldn't really breath. And then, Sam said as he gritted his teeth remembering that day. And then he blasted. 
Andrew casually said from the side as if he can't read the atmosphere while drinking and eats some peanuts. One. Yeah, I killed my dad and most of his crews. I just. I can't forgive myself. Every night, that very moment hunts me as I dream. Sam as he slightly teared up and then continued, it's just. I would really do anything to change that you know. One. I'm sorry man. Roberto said as he tapped Sam's shoulder. Sam took a deep breath and composed himself and then looked at Roberto. What about you? What did you do? Me? I I. Nothing. Roberto hesitated a bit and decided to not just talk about his past and immediately walks out of the room without saying anything to them. Okay. Andrew what about you? What did you do that brought you here? Dot. Sam said as he looks at the leaving Berto and turned to Andrew who was still drinking as if he didn't even heard the story. One. Me? Well. Where do I start? Hmm. My father would always beat me into a pulp. Yep that's the start. He likes to vent his anger on me for his pathetic life, blaming me and whatever and umm what else. Oh. After I gained my power. I let's say that I lost the light. I destroyed the friendship that I managed to build with some people and took the so-called dark path. After that I think. I lost my mind for a while and, killed some people in fit of rage and, the rest is history. Andrew said nonchalantly as he revealed his past. It's not that he trusts Sam to keep this past of him a secret since this was definitely known already by some people. 1. He's also not scared if for example, they started to avoid him based on his story since he basically portrayed himself as someone who became a psychopath after gaining power, they wouldn't even think of doing that since they are already had enough of crazy with Ileana around. So what you are saying to me is, you're crazy? Like Ileana level crazy. Ha ha ha, dude that's funny. Sam asked incredulously as he cannot believe him. But, whatever. Even if that's really true, you can just call me if you need any help man. We're just in one building. I can definitely see that you have already left the what you call the dark path so yeah, keep it up I guess, dot. Sam said as he tapped Andrew's shoulders and then adjusted his position in the seat to find more comfortable angle. I know that. Andrew said with a slight smile. Siren sound? Three. What's that? Sam said as he immediately stood up from his seat. Andrew also stood up. Let's go. They immediately left the room as they ran through the corridor and met Dr. Reyes on the way who have just woken up. What's happening doc? Sam asked. Go back to your rooms. Dr. Reyes ordered as she immediately began to make her way to the pool area with Sam and Andrew who as if didn't heard her order and followed her from behind. Dash. Mariella? No. Sniff I'm really sorry Mariella. Please? I didn't mean to burn you. Berto wailed in the bleachers of the pool area while hugging his knees and hiding his face in between them as a flaming figure steadily approached him. The flaming figure came near Berto as it stopped and looks at him. Berto slowly raised his head when he felt nothing happening. The flaming figure looks at him in silence. A sweet soothing feminine voice suddenly came from it. Berto. Ma. Mariella. Berto looked at the figure, stunned, and couldn't believe what he just heard but all that was broken when a terrifying voice that seems to come to the depths of hell came out of the flaming figure's mouth why did you kill me, as it suddenly lunged at him. 9. On the way to the pool area, Andrew Sam and Dr. Reyes met Ronnie and Danny who is also running for the pool room. As they came through the door of the pool room, searing heat assaulted them as a figure covered with fire all over its body greeted them. Oh wow, Danny said as she looked at this. Berto, calm down, take a deep breath. Dr. Reyes said as she tries to calm Berto down. Andrew who was looking at the side side as he slightly waves his hand to the left as Roberto with his body uncontrolled suddenly flew to the pool. Large amounts of steam rose from pool as Roberto revealed himself hugging his body with his upper body visible with no clothes on. Cough damn. What happened here? Ileana coughed because of the smoke as she came in the area seeing the scene. What's the code? Roberto, now with clothes on said as he walked the corridor to the main door while holding the phone of Dr. Reyes said with anger visible on him. Give me my phone back. Dr. Reyes said as she followed Roberto as continued. I'm in charge here. You're not in charge of any shit. Roberto said after failing to open the main door and confronts the doctor face to face. Did you not see what happened? Huh? Ileana tried to kill me. Roberto said with visible frustration. It wasn't me. Ileana said on the side leaning on the wall as she shrugged her shoulders. Ileana was in her room. There was nobody in the pool but you. Dr. Reyes said as she tries to reason. Did you see what I saw? Huh? We're trapped in here with fucking demons and you want us to stay trapped. Roberto shouted as his anger began climbing. Give it back. Dr. Reyes said as she tries to snatch her phone back from Roberto. What's the code? Roberto said as he pushed her after trying to snatch the phone. Wait, bro chill. Sam said as he interjected and tried to calm Roberto down. Chill nothing. I'm calling the cops and I will get the fuck out of here. Roberto said fiddling with the phone trying to get something out of it in vain. 3. You're not calling anyone. Dr. Reyes said with slightly raised voice as she tries to assert her dominance. Oh yeah, says who? Roberto said as he neared the doctor and asked her with mockery. Your doctor, said by the doctor. Bullshit. Ileana being just Ileana, interjected after hearing that. Dash. The whole argument continues with Roberto calming down as he just returns back to his room to rest, thanking himself inwardly that he wasn't put to solitary. While Andrew just shook his head as he can already see the following days becoming more chaotic. He then also returns to his room and began training his ability for a bit and then settled with a TK aura surrounding him that hovers about one and a half inch from his skin and clothes and then slept after making it passive. 6. A slash N. Another chapter. Now we see the plot progressing, and was now halfway through the plot of the movie The New Mutants. BTW, you can also suggest if you have an idea for the novel so maybe, just maybe, I can incorporate it to the story. And also be sure to be sure to leave reviews, I like constructive criticisms, so make your reviews worth it, and comments on what's up my with my writing and how I can improve it and whatnot. Chapter 7, Chapter 06, Finding Out 1, Morning. The next day comes as the sun illuminates the whole Milbury Hospital. The fresh breeze that embraces the place with the trees and its leaves swaying left and right in rhythm, bringing tranquility and peace to the surroundings. Andrew sat in crossed legs under a tree with a calm expression on his face as he breaths in and out in a rhythmic manner. His TK domain spreads as he observed what is happening in the medical room real time. 
He carefully made his TK energy encircle Danny who was seating on a chair with Dr. Reyes in front of her trying to ask her questions. His TK domain analyzed anything that is not normal in the room not trying to leave anything. We uh, a subtle whistling sound passed as his mind perked up and he immediately pumped more telekinetic energy on his domain. He waited a bit more before he heard more whistling sounds but this time, it is more pronounced and clear. His domain tried to find its source and after a few tries he was successful. His domain found its source which is a large amount of bluish purple energy, invisible to the naked eye, that constantly twists, turns, and rolls in the very space that Danny and Dr. Reyes was in. After finding that, he traced its source again just like what he did before and found it coming from Danny. He probed Danny as he felt her emotions spiking up with his empathy. This spike in emotions made her body release more of the bluish purple energy unconsciously. So this is her form of shinnik energy huh? Wait let me try something. 1. Andrew then willed his TK to carefully wrap some of the shinnik energy into the room coming from Danny and carefully tried to analyze it. He first tried to carefully deconstruct the shinnik energy but after a couple of times, he was unsuccessful. Seems like I'm still not at that level huh? Andrew thought aside regretfully. After the unsuccessful experiment, he looks at the energy and then began using his parallel thinking to come up with different solution. After a few moments he thought of something again. He then cleared his mind of any distraction and took a breath and started. On the second experiment of his, he tried to sense the specific frequency that the shinnik energy of Danny is emitting and tried to carefully memorize it. After making sure that nothing was wrong, he then tried to make his telekinetic energy beat with the same frequency that Donnie's shinnik energy and voila, he felt his mind cleared a bit as the surrounding became more clear for him. He then focused his telekinetic energy to Ileana who was on her room and then, he then heard her humming a tune and singing like a kid but it's clearly not coming from her mouth whatsoever. Is this telepathy? Well it's limited but hey, not bad. Andrew realized that it was just a limited telepathy because he tried to pry more into the mind of Ileana but was unsuccessful. His new telepathy seems to only grant him the ability to read surface thoughts. Andrew was already satisfied with this since with enough training, this can be upgraded to become a full-fledged telepathy. Andrew was about to do something again but then he saw a humanoid-shaped shinnik energy with his sense standing in front of Ronnie who has her claws and fangs out in the middle of the dark bathroom. He stopped for a moment as he vaguely remembered this scene. He then slowly lifted off the grounds and then immediately flew at high speeds to the facility and dashed inside. Ronnie rubs the soap all over her smooth light body as she hums a tune. The lights suddenly started flickering as she looks up at the lights. While looking at the flickering lights, she noticed a shadow from the blurred door of the bathrooms with her peripheral vision. 2. She looks at it with caution and immediately took the towel that was hanging on the side and wrapped her body with it. Hello, I am not gonna play one of your pranks Ileana, dot. Ronnie said with high voice and assumed that this was Ileana. The flickering lights at the ceiling flickered with increased speed and suddenly turned off, bringing darkness over the bathroom. The door to the bathroom made a sound of being opened as Ronnie immediately released her claws and fangs in apprehension. Footsteps resounded as a tall figure slowly revealed itself and stands about seven feet away from her. Take one more step and you'll see yourself regretting that. Now who are you? Ronnie said as realized that this wasn't Ileana and then she spread her claws wide as she threatens the unknown figure. The light above suddenly turns on revealing the figure to be a middle-aged white man with a scarred face wearing a red priest attire holding a steel rod with a letter W on its tip emitting smoking hot temperature. The priest then talked. 1. Hello witch. Ah. Ronnie looks at this priest with fear slowly filled up her eyes as she immediately screamed. Her claws and fangs retracted as she backed away while crawling. Did you really think you will be able to get away from me? Now die in the name of God. You devil spawn. The priest laughed sinisterly as he slowly neared her, crouched and held her hand as he raised the hot rod he was holding and prepared to press in on the neck of the supposedly witch but then a whooshing sound filled the room. Ronnie desperately tried to struggle to get out of the priest's grasp forgetting that she has powers. She then felt his grasps loosening as the maniacal sounds of his laughing suddenly died down. She slowly raised her head and looked at the priest who still has its sinister smile but a has big hole on his chest. The priest's body along with his steel rod suddenly started to dissipate, starting from head to toes, his body dissipated into bluish purple mist and disappeared in thin air. As the priest dissipated, she saw Andrew standing by the door with his hand slightly raised. His fingers moved as the towel who was removed from the struggle levitated and came to her as it covered her body. With that Andrew got out of the door. Andrew walked out of the bathroom as he stands on the wall waiting for the others. The other young mutants quickly came running from their respective rooms with Dr. Reyes also coming. What happened? Why did Ronnie scream? Dr. Reyes immediately asked as she then tried to go inside the bathroom. Andrew stops her and told her that Ronnie is still getting dressed. What happened, Andrew? Ileana asked, curious. Ronnie got out of the door with a blank face as she starts to walk away. Ronnie, what happened? Dr. Reyes asked. It wa it was. It was the. Ronnie said stuttering as she stops and looks at them and suddenly falls down the ground on her knees as tears slowly fell from her eyes. Ileana was about to ask her with same question when Andrew interjected and said, it was a middle-aged man in a priest attire who attacked her. After I attacked him or that, I don't know if I can call that a human since after I attacked it. It dissipated into smokes. What do you mean a priest? And how did he dissipate? Roberto said on the side. Wait, Ronnie, is this the same priest who gave you that mark on your neck? Dr. Reyes asked as she approached Ronnie and crouched at her level. Two, yes. Ronnie said quietly as she buried her head in her knees. Aren't you all seeing something from here? Ileana suddenly said as she walked and stand in their center. What is it now Ileana? Sam said as prepared himself for whatever she may drop. Really? How dense can you all be? Ileana said as she looks at them like they are idiots. She then continued, from what this woman has said, that priest is clearly major part of Ronnie's dark past. That priest is clearly her nightmare by how she's crying. And last night, Berto said he saw some kind of demon in the pool. He was definitely terrified by what he saw. Can't you all see the pattern here? This incident started happening after Andrew and Danny got here. What are you pointing at here Ileana? Just say it. Sam said as he helped Ronnie stand up after she calmed down. She is basically saying that Danny was the reason of all that is happening here. Since she's the only one here who we don't know the power yet. Andrew interjected to not make the conversation longer. What? Really? Roberto said on the said. 
And from what I saw from how you all acted, seems like her ability is to summon or somehow give form to something or someone that we greatly fear. Dr. Reyes said from the side as she asked Ronnie if she's okay with Ronnie saying she was fine, after that she immediately made her way to her office. The young mutants followed after Ronnie who walked to the location of the medical room. On their way, Ronnie turns to Andrew as she thanked him with utmost gratitude while tears glistened in her eyes. 7. In medical room, they saw Danny removing the medical apparatus on her forehead and holding her head while groaning. Ronnie immediately dashed at her as she supported Danny. The other young mutants and Andrew began to leave with a reluctant Ileana who want to confront Danny about the whole nightmare thing. Danny noticed that Ileana who was leaving with the group was looking at her with a pissed off expression. She looks at Ronnie who immediately understands and explained to her what happened earlier. How she was attacked and how they found out Danny's the reason for it. The two cried and embraced each other as they sis cough. 23. The two cried and embraced each other with Danny explaining to Ronnie that she seems to have seen Dr. Rea's memories and all the cruel things she did to mutant children. 2. Chapter 8. Chapter 07. The Last Night 1. The night came with the full moon hanging majestically in the sky. Moonlight lit up the darkest corners of the world. The cold breeze of the night brings chill up to the spine of every humans as they hurried off to their homes. Game room. Andrew sat at the couch with his eyes closed as he watched Dr. Reyes stares at her screen with his TK domain in her office. He had been watching her for a while since he wants to know the passcode for the computer. 1. He wants to know what she and the Essex Corporation have about him. 2. He removes his focus on her after seeing she was done and then tried to do the thing that he was interrupted to do because of the Ronnie incident. He first cleared his mind of any distraction and sat cross legs. He delved deep in his mind and tried to mold something like a gray sphere inside his mind realm. This sphere would act as a shield that would protect his mind from psychics like Xavier and Jean Grey. 5. The process was slow and steady and after 10 minutes, the sphere was formed. The sphere was simple in looking since he believes in simplicity. 1. After the sphere was formed he then immediately tried to fortify this by making it more thick but yet condensed so that it would be stable and wouldn't just break easily. 12. This mind sphere of his wouldn't just be an ordinary psychic shield that Shanix can conjure at any moment as this one is more tough, complex, and in a league above others. 11. The young mutants at the side who was playing some games would look at him from time to time seeing him just sitting there with his eyes closed and thought to themselves, I really swear that he's so weird sometimes. Andrew who was oblivious to what they are thinking continued on as after doing his first experiment, he felt himself not really that tired and tried to proceed with his second move. He tried focus on his newly created mental sphere as he gathered a small portion of telekinetic energy and slowly, he tried to spread it evenly across the entire sphere. After a while, he saw the mental sphere gain something like a thin film that covers it entirely. He checked if there's any problem on the film and after confirming he then did to it what he did to the mental sphere. Finally, after seeing the glistening mental sphere in his mental realm all stable and completely, he willed the sphere to suck the whole mind realm making the it the mind realm itself, where his thoughts and memories reside. The realm of the sphere was divided into three sections, the core, inner, and outer. His past life memories are in the core with the present memories residing in the inner section as his continuous thoughts that turns into his present memories flows through the outer into the inner. 3. After seeing his successful project he then relaxed his muscles and lied in the couch with a comfortable groan. Half an hour later, Dr. Reyes came to the game room as she requested for Danny who was flirting with Ronnie to come to her to do some tests. Ronnie tried to accompany her but Dr. Reyes said that she can just wait. Ronnie looked at Danny with worry as she remembers what she said to her about Dr. Reyes. Danny comforts her that she'll be okay and left. Ronnie who is filled with worry approached the others as she tells them to gather at the attic where she has an important thing to say about Dr. Reyes. The young mutants followed her after seeing her serious with Ileana also doing the same seeing that this was about the woman. Attic. The young mutants gathered as they sat in their chairs. They looked at Ronnie with curiosity as they waited for what she has to say. Ronnie seeing them all curious immediately retold to them what Danny said to her and how she thinks that this test that Dr. Reyes is conducting right now will may or may not endanger Donnie's life. I knew it. That woman can't be trusted. Ileana immediately stands up after hearing this. The other young mutants was also stunned at this revelation. Andrew also acts as if he was shocked while his parallel thinking does its job as he also looks at what is happening in the inner room where Danny and Dr. Reyes are currently in. The former is strapped to the bed as panic slowly began to fill her realizing what Dr. Reyes is gonna do to her. 1. What should we do? Should we go and save Danny? Sam said in worry. We shouldn't act immediately, we're still not sure if she's going to do something at Danny right now, and we're just gonna get trapped by her barriers if we just barged in without plan. Roberto said. The young mutants agreed as they talked about what they should do. Ronnie who was talking suddenly stopped as her ears twitched and then she entered her hybrid state out of nowhere. Her nails turned sharper and longer as fangs grows from teeth. Brown fur quickly grows out of her arms all the way to her wrist, same with her lower body and neck to the nape. Her face, torso, and hands are the only thing without furs. Her ears continue to twitch as she turns to the ground, specifically to the direction of the room where Danny is. She's screaming. Guys, Donnie's in danger. She mumbled a bit before shouting. 2. She immediately dashed towards the door and ran. The other mutants looked at each for a moment before also running after her. The other mutants ran after Ronnie who was leaving them in the dust with her speed except for Ileana. Just as they turned left in a corridor, Ronnie who was speedily running suddenly stopped in her feet as she stared at the white hallway and saw three figures that are standing still in their place. The first figure was familiar to her, too familiar. It was the priest from earlier this morning who tried to attack her. Fear slowly crept up her eyes as the fur from her hand slowly starts to recede. Ileana on the other hand, is shaking. She looks at the two tall slender figure wearing black silky thin clothes and a weird eerie smiley masks with white eyes as she starts to back away. It was the smiley man. 9. Sam and Berto looks at this creatures with wariness, they immediately recognized the priest by the description that Andrew gave them earlier. But the smiley mask wearing thin man was unfamiliar to them. The three creatures began to twitch as if they sensed the young mutants, their fingers twitched at first followed by their hand and then their whole body. The two smiley men began twisting and turning and with a quick move, their head turned to the young mutants as they ripped the masks on their face, revealing a featureless face except for a mouth that has rows of sharp teeth. 
3. The priest, Craig Sinclair, also turned his scarred face to them and smiled wickedly while holding his burning hot rod that has the letter W on its tip as he said, We meet again witch. Ronnie was about to turn away to run in the direction they came from but a hand suddenly stopped her in her tracks. It was Andrew. Andrew smiled to her while holding her shoulders and said, Don't be afraid. They are just an illusion. Well technically, but still, they are not real. And even if the real ones come, I'm sure you two will be able to handle them easily. As he also looks at Ilyana. Ronnie and Ilyana stopped trying to flee and just looks at the creatures who was screeching and laughing maniacally. They repeated the words they are not real to their minds and firmed their resolve but Ilyana has other plans. She suddenly disappears in her place in a blue hue leaving them. The three starts to move towards their direction as they roared and laughed. Oh come on, really? Sam said as looks at the place where Ilyana disappears. Don't worry about her, she'll come around. Andrew said as crossed his arms in a relaxed manner as he looks at Ronnie who came back to their hybrid form and awaits her move. He heard the surface thoughts of Ronnie as he used his minor telepathy. 5. Ronnie dashed in high speed towards the priest as she unleashed her claws. As she reached close to him, she raised her claws and made a swipe downward from his fat face to his chest. The priest falls on the ground as Ronnie immediately mounts on him and began slashing and ripping his face. No blood came out of the wounds, only bluish purple mist. This confirms to Ronnie that the priest under her isn't real and using all her strength. She points her right claws at his face and pierced his face all the way down to the insides. She feels nothing inside his head as the head slowly dissipates in smokes followed by its whole body. The smiley men weren't able to move even an inch except for their head while this was happening as Andrew held them in their place using his telekinesis. Whistles. That was brutal. Fortunately that wasn't real, if not, that would have made a bloody mess laughs Berto whistles as he said this while promising to himself not to provoke Ronnie every time. How come this creepy things are not moving? Sam asked as he looks at the faceless beings. It's because of me. Andrew said as he raised his hand. Oh so, what do we do? Berto said, we move. Andrew said as the two smiley men suddenly lifted in the air and slammed into the other side of the wall of the corridor respectively. They struggled to get out of the telekinetic grasp but a sudden thud sounded through the hallway and a hole suddenly appeared on both forehands of the two as if pierced by something invisible. They fell silent and unmoving as they hang in the wall and began disintegrating in bluish purple smokes. Sam, Berto, and Ronnie looks at this scene in shock and couldn't help but admire Andrew since from the looks of it, he seems to have full control of his ability and was very familiar with it, unlike some of them. 2. Dash. They continued on their way to the long corridors and after a while they arrived on the ground floor. What greeted them in there is a bunch of smiley men, about a dozen, accompanied by what seems to be humans wearing mining outfits. There are seven men who seems to be normal but that was denied by how pale their faces. They have deathly pale complexion, creepy white eyes and numerous wounds all over their whole body. All of them was motionless at first but immediately began to twitch and move as if they are being awakened just like what happened to the earlier bunch. After waking up completely they twist their heads in near impossible way towards their direction and roared and groaned. Wa what is this? Sam who saw the dudes in mining uniform began to stammer in fear as he tried to make sense of what's happening. Sam, you know what they are. Andrew said as he crossed his arms and waited for Sam to recover his sense. 2. Ah oh yeah yes of course, Donnie's ability is bring out our greatest fears and that just means that this, are just illusions. Sam slowly recovered from his fear and began to think logically. He looks at the illusion of his father who was just staring at him blankly and couldn't help but shed a tear. This tear slowly transformed into sobs as he cries his heart out. Dad, I know you are just an illusion right now but, I just want you to know that I miss you, and I I, sobs. Sam said between his cries. 1. Berto tapped Sam's shoulder and smartly said nothing. After a while Sam slowly recovered and composed himself as he turns to Andrew who was the one stopping the entire fear manifestation gang from interfering in his little drama. You can. He inhales deep breath destroy them now. Sam said as he looks at Andrew gratefully. Andrew smiled at Sam and was about to start finishing this illusions one by one but a sudden whooshing sounds echoes through the entire ground floor as a mystical blue portal suddenly opened from the wall and Ilyana came out of it guns blazing while holding her soul sword in her armored right arm and quickly dashed towards the smiley men and the ones wearing mining uniforms and began cutting them like vegetables displaying great agility as she weaves left and right effortlessly. After a few moments, she was finished. She turns to the group and said while smiling, Did you all miss me? 16. Creator's thoughts. Moshe L. Like the story? Add it to library. Have an idea for the story? Comment it down. We are now on the way to the end of this arc. Stay tuned. Chapter 9. Chapter 08. The last night too. Did you all miss me? Where did you go? Sam said as he looks at the dissipating illusions. To our special place. Dash dash. Ilyana didn't talk any more about it and as the young mutants are once more reunited, they continued on their way towards where Danny is. They arrived at the medical room but there is no one there. Ronnie stops for a moment and then points at the metal door at the back. She is there. She then goes in front of the door and tries to open the door with all her strength to no avail. They looked at Ilyana, believing that she's the only one who can slash it open. Ilyana rolls her eyes as she prepares to summon her soul sword when the thick metal door suddenly starts to shake and creak. The metal door was then removed from its place as it floated in the air and moved and then dropped at the side. They all gaped at this scene and turns to look at Andrew who was just there standing with his arms crossed. Let's go. Andrew said as goes in front and starts moving forward. The inside was another long corridor stretching till the end where a thick metal door greeted them once again. The group slowly moves forward following what Andrew said. They face once again the thick metal door as Ronnie quietly said, Danny is behind that door. Andrew nodded at that and looks at the whole group and signaled for them to be ready. Like earlier, the metal door shake and was removed from its place but much faster this time. The metal door dropped to the side as they turned their heads to look inside. Inside, they saw Danny strapped to a bed unconscious, alone. Ronnie who was supposed to have enhanced senses, decided to not use her brain anymore as she immediately dashed inside towards Danny, followed by the others. Andrew shook his head at this but didn't say anything and just let the hiding doctor do her thing. The moment they stepped inside the room, they were immediately blocked by an orange barrier that quickly surrounds each of them in a dome shape. B-A-A-M. Bitch. Dot. Ilyana growled as she punched and tried to get out of the energy bubble to no avail. Dr. Cecilia Reyes slowly walked out of the corner with her arms raised at them as she controls the barriers. She said what are you all doing here? Me and Danny are just conducting some tests. Drop the act woman. We already know that you are trying to kill Danny. Why? Dot. Sam said as he gives up trying to get out of the force field. 
Why? Oh come on, we all know how dangerous her ability is. And don't tell me that you all don't want her gone with all the things that she did to all of you. Dr. Reyes replied with a raised eyebrow. No, she don't have control over her ability just like us. She doesn't mean to hurt anyone and you know that. Ronnie shouted as she tries to slash the barrier with her claws. That still doesn't change the fact that she is dangerous and she is hopeless. My superiors doesn't see any benefits on letting her live anymore since she is useless. Dr. Reyes said as she began approaching Danny with her arms still raised and looks down at her face. And who are these superiors if I may ask? Andrew said suddenly. Dr. Reyes looks at him for a few moments and then said, The Essex Corporation. The other mutants didn't give it any thought since they don't know any corporation like that but Andrew on the other hand just rubs his temples out of frustration after hearing that phrase. It's that fucker he couldn't help but curse. Our corporation make profit by creating mutant super soldiers out of you lot and selling them but we only have one true goal, and that is to prove that we, the mutants, are the next step of mankind. Dr. Reyes said as she began to smile from ear to ear. We will do anything to make the mutant kind stand at the top. She said and then looks at unconscious Danny and continued, but she, she is useless, her ability is useless in achieving these goals, and there is only one end to someone useless. Hey, what are you planning? Hey hey, stop, stop. Ronnie shouted as she banged at the barrier as she saw the doctor reaching for a scalpel. I actually intended for her to die peacefully, but since you need to see the truth of what we do to something useless, then. Dr. Reyes said as looks at them with a smile while holding the scalpel. No, 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 don't do this. Ronnie said desperately. The other mutants also tries their best to get out of the barrier to save their friend including Ileana. Andrew at the side just stands inside the force field as he waited for the nightmare of Danny. Dr. Reyes lifted the scalpel and was about to directly kill Danny when she felt the room slightly get colder. Huh. She looks at the window and saw the strong winds blowing outside accompanied by snow. It shouldn't be snowing at this season right? She then stops as she remembers the words that Danny said to her, it brings the snow, the monster. Dr. Reyes's eyes widened as she then holds the scalpel tightly with both hands in the air and prepares to bring it down to Donnie's chest. But then, wah what is this? Dr. Reyes said as she, froze. She tried to struggle and bring down the scalpel but to no avail, she couldn't move. She then stops as she felt surrounding became quiet, too quiet. Crunch. The solid concrete wall of the room was then suddenly shattered. Debris of earth flew and dusts rise as a creature of what they can only assume as a monster revealed itself. A bear. A big bear. They can only see its head but that head is already big enough to occupy the whole wall of the room. Razor sharp teeth, brown fur, and crimson eyes that seems to emit some sort of special effect as crimson hue of light leaves at every movement of the eyes. Wah, what the fuck, dot. Birdo shouted as he looks at this creature. The others also gaped at this. They couldn't say anything more as the bear starts to make its move as opposed to its big size. Its speed wasn't slow at all as a paw as big as a table quickly moved towards the slowly backing away doctor, who intends to flee. The paw that houses five black sharp claws quickly caught up to the doctor and slashed her. Splurt, splash, ah, dot. Blood splattered as Dr. Reyes screamed in agony as her left hand WSS severed from her body and large gash of wounds appeared at her. She immediately began to lose a lot of blood from this and was on the verge of collapse. The barriers that used to stand strong around the young mutants disappeared without a sound. Birdo fell to his knees as he began to vomit his dinner. Sam was a bit better but he was still pale as he shakes from head to toe. Ronnie was wide, eyed as she looks at this but nothing more. Ileana didn't care about the doctor and just looks at the bear who was preparing another move. Andrew on the other hand just watched while he was thinking that he can finally test how strong his ability had become. Danny was still unconscious as her body bounced to the left corner because of all the ensuing chaos. The demon bear wouldn't let the doctor get off easy as it raised its paw again and slammed it down in a forceful manner towards her. The doctor who can't recognize anything anymore was then reduced to bones and blood as her body couldn't handle the force and immediately died. The demon bear snorted a thin smoke out of its nostrils as it then moved its snout to the body and sniffed confirming if it's dead. We need to get out of here fast. Sam shouted quickly as he helped Berto to stand. Ronnie snapped back and immediately ran towards the unconscious Danny and carried her body to her shoulders carefully. Asterisk clash, asterisk. Ruor, the young mutants tried to pass through door they came from but the sound of metal hitting metal stopped them. They looked behind and saw Ileana holding her soul sword against the claws of the bear as it roared wildly. Bring Danny to a safe place. I got this. Ileana turned her head and looked at them with her eyes glowing mystically in blue, but it's obvious that she is struggling seeing how knees is shaking from the weight of the paw. The group nodded at her and immediately ran towards the corridor except Andrew. What are you playing still doing here? Ileana talked without looking at him as she backed away from the bear. What else? Helping a friend of course. Andrew said with a slight smile as he slowly put his arms at his other side and the whole room then started to shake as the solid concrete wall itself behind him was then removed without crumbling and then with a swift motion, it moved horizontally to his left 90 degrees and slammed at the face of the creature vertically. Row AR, the bear seems to take almost no damage as it just shook its head from the dizziness and roared more loudly than before. Clearly enraged. Andrew looks at Ileana at his side who opened a portal for herself as she goes inside it and came out on the backyard in the same portal, now with a baby dragon on her shoulder. Andrew smiled as he looks at the dragon and thought that it was cute and thought about getting his own in the future. He then slowly floated from the ground and then blasts to the ceiling exiting at the top of the building taking no damage as he had his own force field on. Andrew then looks at the demon bear at the ground who took no damage from a wall and just keeps growling and destroying the surroundings after not finding them. He then said, shall we test how durable you are? Creator's thoughts. Moshe L. Like the story? Add to your library? Have an idea for the story? Comment it down. Chapter 10, Chapter 09, The Last Night 3. We're on 2K Collection, would you look at that? Thank y'all for reading this lame-ass story. I'll try to constantly improve. Much love to y'all, Moshe L. Equals 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 equals. Thick clouds littered the sky as they tried to hide the majestic beauty of the moon while fierce winds and snow whipped through the air and a gigantic mystical bear emitting black smoke from its body began to destroy the surroundings. Andrew floated high in the air stably as he gazes upon this creature. He looks behind the bear, the backyard, there. He looks at a beautiful young woman with flowing blonde hair who is holding a sword burning in blue light. A baby dragon sits upon her right shoulder and spits blue fire from time to time. 
Hey, Yogi. Ilyana shouted to the demon bear as she tries to gain its attention. Snort. The demon's bear's ears twitched a bit as it heard a voice behind it. It then snorts and then turns around with its paws landing making the ground shake as it issued a loud roar to the two creature in front of it. Asterisk row AR? Asterisk. Wind blows fiercely just from its roar as Ilyana's hair ruffled from this. Tisk. Ilyana tsked in annoyance as she lifts her left hand and combs her hair and tries to fix her ruined bangs. Make that roar again and I'm gonna lose it. Ilyana shouted to the bear. Asterisk row R? Asterisk. The bear roared again in defiance, blowing Ilyana's hair out of its place again. You. Ilyana eyes widened in anger as she quickly fixed her hair again and looks at the bear again and made stance. A blue after image was left as Ilyana disappeared from her place and appeared a few meters running within human speed speed towards the bear with the baby dragon following behind her issuing cute sounds. Whoosh. Ilyana quickly arrived near the bear as she then jumped high avoiding a swipe from the left claw of the bear and quickly slashes her sword in midair towards the forehead of the bear. Asterisk slosh. Asterisk. A blue slash was quickly left by the burning blue sword as it made contact with the skin of the bear. The baby dragon at the air also followed this attack by breathing blue fire energy at the face of the bear and quickly backing away. Ray AR, the demon bear issued a pain howl after receiving that wound and immediately turned to the side and slashed its right claw to Ilyana who just landed on the ground after slashing it. Ilyana turned her head around just to find out a big paw the size of her reaching for her in high speed. She was ready to teleport to the limbo to avoid this lethal attack when brown steel roof suddenly made its entrance in the air and slammed at the head of the bear with such force that it fell to the ground from the impact. Asterisk whine, asterisk. The bear issued a pitiful noise after slamming to the ground as Ilyana moves her eyes towards where that roof came from. There. She saw Andrew floating in the air with his hands behind his back with a curious look on his face. The baby dragon quickly flapped its small wings as it approached and landed on her shoulders and spits blue energy at the air as it also looks at Andrew. Andrew turns to looks at them and waved his hand at her and slowly floated down near her. Andrew was about to talk to her when the bear who was just motionless for about 5 seconds starts to move again and stands quickly using its paws as it issued its trademark. Asterisk row AR? Asterisk. Is that all you know? Huh. Ilyana shouted in frustration as her eardrums is getting annoyed by this creature. She immediately dashed at the bear again in high speed with her baby dragon leaving behind a blue mirage. Andrew looks at this and shooks his head at the behavior of Ilyana. Just like any other girl, Ilyana is difficult to deal with, but in her case she, she is twofold more difficult. She is very unpredictable as you don't know what kinds of things are running in that head of her. Hey hey hey. Ilyana shouted as she sliced her sword to the side of the bear after avoiding its sharp claws again with her flexibility. Andrew smiles at this and slowly lifts off the ground again. Boulders upon boulders that turned into spheres of earth followed him as it also lifted from the ground and floated behind him. Asterisk whoosh, asterisk asterisk bayom, asterisk. The spheres quickly sped through the air with a wave of Andrew's hand as it all pierced and smashed at the bear continuously. Whimper, the bear once again fell to the ground and making debris of rocks and smoke to rise. Andrew lands beside Ilyana and Lockheed as they look at the creature. Dash, sczzz, oh come on, dot. Ilyana shouted in annoyance as she looks at the scene unfolding in front of her. This bear is tough for a shinnik construct. Andrew sighs as he looks at the blue burning wounds left behind by Ilyana's soul sword and his spears healing and leaving nothing as if it wasn't there a moment ago as the bear began twitching again, indicating it was about to wake up again and wreak havoc. Footsteps. A sound of footsteps sounded as Andrew, Ilyana, and the Lockheed turns their head to the side and saw Sam running towards them. Ha, ha, what's up guys? Sam said breathless as he approached them and then turns to look at the bear and his eyes managed to catch how the wound is healing. Oh shit. How will we defeat that thing if it can heal like that? He said. What are you doing here and where are they? Andrew said looking at Sam. I want to help. And oh they are in the chapel, hiding inside. Sam said, he was about to talk more when the bear fully woke up again and starts moving again. It stands up again and looks at its assailants and roared again. This time it didn't attack them as its nose twitched and it began turning and moving away from them. Its destination? The chapel. It's coming for Danny. Quick. Distract it. Andrew said as he lifted in the air immediately and flew towards the direction of the chapel leaving behind the two. Ilyana clenched her sword tightly as she immediately dashed towards the big yet fast bear. Wait, what do I do? Sam said as he looks at the two leaving him. He looks at the big bear and the destruction it left behind. The concrete structures are toppled. Trees are down and deep footmark on the ground. Looking at this, he couldn't help but swallow what can I even do. Andrew flew and immediately reached the doors of the chapel and began to think what he should do. He, with his ability, clearly knows that he can definitely finish that bear if he wanted to, even with that healing bullshit. But that would ruin the whole point of why did he even chose to stay at this facility the moment he woke up. The whole point of this event is to make the protagonists overcome their fears and dark pasts, and that is what he have been doing this whole time. Helping them overcome it. And now, the only ones remaining are Berto and Danny. He then thought about what he should do to make them overcome this by themselves, they have clearly seen his ability and how strong it was, so they will inevitably lean on him and Ilyana and not do anything. So he thought about a little mischievous plan. Underscore underscore underscore. H-A-A-A. Ilyana shouted as she jumped in the air and tried to slash the bear again on its face but the bear, seemingly seeing through her redundant attack was able to react as it managed to raise its paw at the exact time she jumped and made a slapping motion towards her from the ground. Slap. The paw that was as big as Ilyana hits her. Ilyana grunts in pain from the impact as her body flew away in the air without her control. Frightened cute noise. Lockheed in the air immediately flew towards her flying body, concerned. Ilyana. Sam who was in the back shouted as he saw Ilyana being slapped away and immediately ran after her. Sam tried to catch up to her but her flying body which was now falling because of gravity was far from him. Sam gritted his teeth as his body began to emit red energy and then, boom, he disappeared from his place and tried to rush to the place where Ilyana is supposed to slam down, unfortunately he is too late. Ilyana who was about to slam at the ground suddenly twisted in the air as she flexibly turned to land on the ground on her feet. Crack. R. Ilyana screamed in pain as a sickening crunch sounded. Her feet feet was fractured from the impact. Ilyana. Sam said as he arrived near her after rolling a bit on the ground after he forcefully stopped his speed. He walked two steps towards her and tried to help her stand. Don't mind me, go help them. Ilyana said stubbornly. No, you got a fractured bone, I'll not leave you here. Sam said as helped her stand with her left hand on his shoulders. The baby dragon lands on her shoulders and began rubbing its head at her face asking if she's hurt. This is nothing, Lockheed, you know that I'm strong. 
Ileana said to the baby dragon as she smiles and pets its head and then unsummoned her soul sword as she tries to stand with the help of Sam. Sam, Ileana, and Lockheed raised their head to turn to the bear and saw it already on the chapel tearing away its roof. Then at the side they saw a pale Andrew floating with a big boulder also floating above him with his hands raised. He shakily points his hand to the bear as the boulder immediately smashed at the bear. They were about to smile at this when they saw Andrew who was floating suddenly fall down in the air with a thud. Andrew. Creator's thoughts. Moshe L. Like the story? Add it to library. Have an idea for the story? Comment it down. Maybe give me about to 200 plus stones then I'll upload one more chapter. Chapter 11, Chapter 10, Overcoming 1, Degree Milbury Chapel Degree, Andrew, the young mutants shouts in worry as they saw Andrew fell down on the ground, snort, the demon bear angrily snorts as shook off the debris from its body that came from the boulder, the bear looks at the perpetrator on the ground and began moving towards it, as the bear neared Andrew who was unconscious on the ground, it raised its enormous paw high in the air and brought it down in high speed, bang rock debris flew in the air and smoke rise as the bear's paw slammed at Andrew without mercy, Andrew, the young mutants screamed in shock and their eyes began to get red as they saw this and remembered what happened to Dr. Reyes earlier was just like this. The bear snorts in victory as it slowly lifted its paw under the cover of the thick dust. But the next thing they saw made the young mutants and the bear stop for a moment. Andrew who was supposed to be in bones and blood state just like the Dr. Reyes earlier was surprisingly fine and just lay soundly there while embedded on the ground. G-R-R-R-R-H-H. Grayoth the bear was confused for a moment but this was immediately replaced by anger, angered by the fact that a mere ant wouldn't die from its paw. It roared in anger as it lifted its paws again, but this time, it lifted its two paws in the air in a clasped manner as it brought it down with immense speed. 1. Just before the paws made contact to the seemingly fragile body of the unconscious Andrew, a light of red flashed as the paw slammed down. Bang, bang, bang. The same flash of red uncontrollably slammed at the benches inside the chapel and continued to roll and stopped outside the confessional where Ronnie and Danny are and beside Berto who was hiding behind a bench cowardly. Oh shit, that was so close. Heavy breathing Sam breathes heavily as he leans his back on the bench while the red energy surrounding him slowly dissipated. 1. Sam looks around and spots Berto at the side crouching. What are you doing? Berto looks at Sam and said as if it's the most normal thing in the world what? I'm hiding? Sam rolls his eyes and looks down at the unconscious Andrew beside him and shook him as he tries to wake him up. Andrew wake up. Andrew. He shook him repeatedly to no avail. Sam sighs and looks behind him and Sorani and Danny from the gaps of the confessional. He stands up and tries to carry Andrew inside. A-H-H. A-H-H. Ileana repeatedly tries to stand up using her soul sword as a cane while enduring the pain in her foot. Lockheed sats in her shoulder. The bear continued to wreak havoc as it turned its crimson eyes towards the chapel. Roar. The bear destroyed all the surrounding foundation of the chapel and roared. Demons can't come in churches. Demons can't come in churches. Demons can't come in churches. Ronnie repeatedly chanted in closed eyes with Danny in her lap. 3. Hey, stop that. It's already here. Sam interrupted her as he dragged the body of Andrew inside the confessional. 1. Heavy breathing. We need to do something or else we will all die here. He said and sat beside the two with Andrew and tries to catch his breath. Ronnie stopped and then looked at him and the unconscious Andrew. Are you okay? What about Andrew? I don't know. He seems okay. He's just unconscious. Sam said and looked outside as his eyes widened. Quick, wake her up. It's coming. He shouted and tried to wake Andrew up again. 2. Ronnie also did the same to Danny as she shook her and said some cringy lines to her which was definitely heard by Danny but still can't wake up. Bang the bear continued as it moved towards them while leaving deep imprints on the ground as it walked. It came near the confessional and sniffed it for a bit before biting off its roof away and neared its eye to take a look inside. Ah. Ronnie and Sam screamed in fright as they saw the crimson eye staring at them. The bear roared again and raised both of its paws, ready to end his creator and her friends when a bench suddenly hit its head. The bear shook its head and looked behind it. There. It saw a human-shaped figure burning in flames making the surrounding temperature rise up. R. Roberto da Costa a .k. a sunspot roared at the bear as he lifted another broken bench. He looked at the bear with determination burning in his eyes as he tightly holds the bench. Sam, Ronnie, and Ileana at the back was shocked seeing him like this, while Andrew on the ground opened his eyes and smirked. 5. The bear also roared feeling that it was being challenged as it lifted some broken statue at the ground with its mouth and hurled it at Berto. 1. The sun is about to rise as the battle between the demon bear and Berto continues. The fight between the two surprisingly lasted for some minutes as Berto was able to hurt the bear after blasting it with some streams of thick flames that burned its fur. But after a while, Berto was losing the fight as the amount of flames he was able to release decreases while the bear just continues to heal its wounds. Bang! The bear won the fight as it slammed Berto who have already exhausted all his stamina in the ground. Berto. Ileana at the back scream seeing this as she tries to stand up again to no avail while Lockheed have already reverted back to a toy in her hand. Dust rise and rubbles rolled as the bear lifted its paws and looks at the human-shaped charcoal at the ground who issued some grunting sounds. It then turned its head around back to the confessional. Error a figure jumped suddenly jumped from the ground with unnatural speed and landed on its head. Ronnie roared as she unleashed her sharp claws and began slashing and slashing at the face of the bear hysterically. The bear shooks its head repeatedly attempting to remove the small wolf at its face. The wounds left behind by her claws glowed in blue and it quickly disappeared as the wounds heal. Ronnie was quickly removed from its head as it reached with its paw and swatted her away. She smashed at the woods and rubbles at the ground and couldn't help but groan in pain although she has no wounds except for some bruises courtesy of her enhanced durability. Row AAR. The bear roared at her and turned around to find the group who suddenly disappeared from the confessional. It looked around and sniffed for a bit and then snapped its head towards the far side where it saw the Sam, Danny, and Andrew in the corner huddled together as Sam holds them. The bear seemingly lost its patience from all this struggle decided to end it all at once as it lowered its head to the ground with its legs slightly bent in a crouching position. It looked at them silently as it then starts to run towards them. Danny, wake up. Ronnie who saw this immediately screamed. 1. Shit, 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 shit. Sam repeatedly cursed as he looks at this and then hold the two tightly in his arms as his body began to emit red energy. 1. He was about to blast away with the two when he felt movement from his hand. He looked and saw Danny slowly opening her eyes who slowly stands from the ground while looking at the incoming bear and then said calmly. Stop. 
too. Andrew who was sitting motionless on the ground also opened his eyes as he tapped the shoulder of Sam beside him and then leaned at the wall behind him while looking at the scene. 1. The running bear suddenly stopped running while leaving deep imprints at the ground because of its momentum. It stopped at the front of Danny as it looked her and then roared at her face. The wind carried by its roar made Danny close her eyes instinctively but after then she looks at the bear, straight in its eyes as she said. Stop. I'm in charge now. 3. The bear roared again but weakly as if weirded out by her as it tilted its head to the side. Tap. 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 Danny slowly walked towards the bear with her hands stretched in front. Control. She said with gentle voice trying to calm the bear. 1. The bear looks around in confusion at first but then began to settle down as it slowly rests its enormous face at the ground. Good. Danny said as she approached and slowly touched the snout of the bear, rubbing its fur as she smiles. You don't have to worry about anything anymore. It's gonna be okay. 1. The sunlight illuminates the chapel as Berto who have already reverted back to human form raised his naked body from the ground while holding a wood to cover his lower body and looks at what's happening. Ileana who was still at the back smiles as she looks at this, the same with Ronnie, Sam, and Andrew at the side. Danny looks down at her bear necklace and removes it from her neck as she rubs it as she remembers her father. The bear issued its last snort as it began disintegrating from its lower body to upper into black smoke. Danny lifts her head and looks at the disappearing bear while holding the necklace and nodded with a smile. Andrew who was sitting at the ground slowly stands up as he looks at the sky and muttered. Finally. 2. Creator's Thoughts. Moshe L. The New Mutants Arc Ends. Like the story? Add it to library. Have an idea for the story? Comment it down. Chapter 12, Chapter 11, Realization. A slash N. I was randomly scrolling for some fanfiction just earlier in the power rankings and accidentally tapped the popular ranking and surprise surprise, this novel is the number one, lol. I even doubted it for a bit, lol. It was also the number one for the collections. Anyway, for that surprise, here's a bonus chapter for ya. Yeah. 1. Appreciate you all. 3. Equals 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 equals. Degree Milbury Chapel Degree. After looking at the sky for a bit, Andrew fixed himself as he pats the dust and sands away from his shoulder and asked, are you okay? The other mutants also looks at her with concern. Danny smiles as she nodded and replies that she is okay and they don't have to worry. Andrew nods at that and was about to go help Berto find some clothes for him when he felt something rubbing at his mind sphere. He furrows his eyebrow a bit but relaxed when he felt it slipping out and leaving after not getting its expected result. He looks around as he spotted Sam's head perking up as if something caught his attention with his face a hint of confusion. Degree X Mansion, Westchester, New York Degree. 1. In the sub-basement of the X Mansion, a long silver-colored corridor extends all the way from the entrance of the basement while at the end of the corridor lies a thick circular metal door that has the letter of X at it. Behind the seemingly indestructible door lies a globe-shaped space. A relatively long platform that extends from the metal door through the middle of the room hangs stably to air. At the end of the silver-plated platform reveals two people. One is a relatively handsome white man that seems to be in his twenties with an eyeglasses and neat slicked back brown hair. He just stands there behind the other guy while looking at him with trust and alertness, seemingly ready for any harm that will come to the other man. 8. While the other party is much more older, with his looks that seems to be around 60, he seems to radiate an aura of wisdom and goodness as he sits at a wheelchair that has a futuristic touch on it. The most notable thing you will notice about the older man is helmet-like silver machine that is currently placed at his head while his eyes are shut closed, focusing on something. 10. Slowly. The older man opened his eyes as he lifts his right hand and rubs his temple as if he has a headache. After a moment he reached for the helmet attached in his head but the man behind him was alert as he quickly moved and helped him remove the silver helmet at his head carefully. Once the helmet was removed, the older man revealed his head to be shining bald as the bright light above them seems to be reflecting off of it. The older man rubs his head to get a good feel. After he was satisfied, the wheelchair he is sitting on seems to have a mind of its own as it slowly moved and turned around without any external force guiding it. 8. The wheelchair moved slowly onwards as the older man lifts his bald head to the other man and spoke with a face seriousness Hank, prepare the team and quickly aboard the blackbird. I have discovered a group composed of teenage mutants. We need to hurry before other parties that has no good intentions senses them too. 13. The glasses-wearing man now known as Hank McCoy also became serious upon hearing this and immediately hurried off after saying on it, Professor. Guys, it's the X-Men. Sam shouted to the group after staying still for a moment with his face performing different emotions earlier some guy spoke in my head just now calling himself Professor Xavier. The group immediately perked up at this and decided to continue this talk inside the still intact building instead of this destroyed dust and rubble filled place. Berto gives his all in holding the wood covering him as he walked with careful steps and eyed them, looking if any of them can see his little Berto. Andrew shook his at this guy and looks around as he spotted a curtain that is used in the window of the now destroyed chapel under the rubble. He controlled the curtain to move to Berto as he himself starts to move inside the building while helping the limping Ileana. The new mutants plopped their butts at the couch inside Dr. Rea's office tiredly as they stretched their aching body except for Andrew. 2. Sam sat at the chair of the doctor as he tiredly explained all that transpired earlier in his head the reason why he just spaced out earlier. So you're telling us that some guy calling himself Professor X talked to you earlier and introduced himself as some kind of founder for an institution dedicated to teaching and protecting mutants like us and now they are coming to fetch us here so we just have to wait. Berto immediately said while rubbing the bridge of his nose after Sam finished explaining. Don't forget the part that that professor was also the founder of X-Men from what he said. Ronnie commented at the side. Oh great. Ileana rolls her eyes at this. 1. Sam looks at them and then said guys, come on, this ain't a bad thing. Remember, we don't have anywhere to go right now so maybe this will be a new start. Don't include me on that. I have a home. Berto said at the side. Andrew who was quiet suddenly stood up as he made his was to the drawer beside the table of the doctor and began shuffling through the stacks of paper inside. What are you looking for? Sam asked curiously. Andrew didn't answer as he just looked at the papers one by one and then pulled six brown folders with their names on it then telekinetically floated it to the small circular table at the front of the where the mutants are currently are and then made his way to the couch and sat again. 
What is this? Ileana looks at Andrew with a curious face as she reached for the folder with her name at the cover and took a look to read what's inside. She took a moment to read the paper and then stopped after as she puts it to the table again killer her. The other mutants also took a look at their respective folders and came to the realization that Dr. Reyes was really just taking care of them to mold and nurture them to become her and her superior's killing machine. The atmosphere slowly became heavy at this while Andrew nibbles on some candy he found at the table of Dr. Reyes. He eats for a while and then also reached for his folder. He opened the folder and immediately saw his face at the top right corner of the paper inside. He then looks at the information regarding him. Andrew Detmer. Mutant ability, main mutation, force field, submutation, telekinesis. 3. Personality, the subject was a nerd and loner at first but then became a psychopath after awakening his ability. After recovering from his wounds and waking up at the facility, the subject seems to have changed for the better and began an interaction with the other subjects. 6. Potential, an efficient killer. 2. Hmm, not bad, so they actually even searched my background at Seattle huh Andrew thought as he looks at the information regarding where he lives and stuff speaking of Seattle. Should I come back and end that pathetic piece of filth's life? Hmm, food for thought. 11. Andrew removes his thoughts about the filth after he realized something about the information regarding his power. He furrows his brows as he looks at the words that says that his supposed main ability is actually the force field and his telekinesis was actually just a subpower. 5. He looks at the other silent mutants as he thought about why that was like that. He pondered a bit before he gathered his senses and then took a look within him, to his supposed main ability. His senses erupted within him as he tries to activate his force field at the same time without actually activating but to just take a look at its energy. But just like the first time that he activated this force field, all he got was that the ability was just pure shinnik energy. 1. Andrew didn't gave up and began pondering at different possibilities using his parallel thinking all at the same time. After a few moments, he got his most feasible answer. It was definitely true that his telekinesis came from the alien crystalline, but one thing happened after he was supposed dead when he was speared through. That was his own latent X gene activating. His mutant ability activated just as after the original Andrew died and this was the force field. 8. After looking thinking of different possibilities and analyzing why this force field seems to be constructed by his telekinetic energy and doesn't have its own energy was because that is its ability. His mutant ability, force field creation would be activated by using the most prominent energy within his body, and if there's none, then it would use energy from the outside. Andrew rubs his chin at this like an elder and smirked. This was a good a thing for him because he can take enemies by surprise if by chance someone manages to use an X-gene suppressors at him then they would definitely in for a ride because they would only be deactivating his mutant ability but never his telekinesis. Now the only thing he should think for the near future is on how to prevent others stealing, suppressing, or sealing his telekinesis, and the answer lies on his telekinesis again. 9. Andrew nods his at this thought and then lies at the couch for a more comfortable position as he prepares to take a nap. He wouldn't wait for the X-Men with opened eyes since he's very much tired just like the rest of the mutants. Guys come on cheer up, everything is fine now. By the way, wake me up when they are here already, I'll just take a quick nap. 1. The young mutants looks at his nonchalant attitude and then also relaxed after realizing that Dr. Reyes was now gone and they don't have to worry anymore since they would be going with the X-Men. Though Roberto was still dejected after seeing his folder which clearly says that his parents willingly gave him away to this facility after the incident with Mariella, they basically abandoned him since they also said that he should stay here indefinitely. Half an hour later, a black dot from the blue sky slowly became larger and larger as the thing approached the facility at an amazing speed bringing fierce gust of winds at its wake. The Blackbird. 5. 1. Creator's Thoughts. Moshe L. For those who will not like the idea of Andrew going to the X-Mansion, don't worry since. Little bit of spoiler. He will not stay there for long. That's all I can say. Anyway, stay tuned for more and thank you all. Like the story? Add it to the library. Have an idea for the story? Comment it down. Chapter 13, Chapter 12, On the Way to the X-Mansion. Degree Blackbird Degree. Inside the iconic jet black colored aircraft of the X-Men, five people sat in their respective seats. At pilot's seat is the glasses wearing man that is known as Hank, concentrating on piloting the aircraft. At the seat next to him is a handsome man at around the same age as Hank with a long brown hair that reaches his shoulders as he sat there. Though silent, he radiates an aura of pride and cockiness. Behind Hank is a beautiful black American woman with glossy shoulder length silver straight hair, full lips, and healthy bosom. Beside the woman is a unique young man as he has a blue rough skin, pointed ears, yellow eyes, and a thin sharp tail that sways from time to time. The last one that seats beside the blue skinned one is of course Professor X whom Hank talked to earlier. All of them are wearing a skin tight black flight suit except for the professor who wears a neat three piece expensive looking brown suit. We are here professor. Hank said as he controls the craft to slowly land in the vast green fields the young mutants are currently waiting for us. Finally, the long haired man said as he removes his seatbelt followed by the others. Dash. The new mutants gathered at the vast clearing of the facility, all wearing clean clothes, looking at the sleek looking aircraft slowly land in front of them. The back of the blackbird's retractable back slowly opened as several people revealed themselves. Andrew squints his eyes to look at the incoming people. He immediately recognized all of them since most of them looks like their movie counterparts. At the forefront is Hank McCoy a.k. a beast. At his left is Alex Summers a.k. a havoc, brother of Scott Summer a .k. a cyclops. At the left of Alex is Kurt Wagner a .k. a nightcrawler. At the right of Hank is Aurora Monroe a .k. a storm, while the one in a wheelchair is none other than the professor, Charles Xavier. The young mutants looks at them expectantly except for Andrew, Berto, and Ileana. Dash. The X-Men quickly came in front of the young mutants as Professor Xavier inched forward ahead of his company and was the one to speak first. Hello, blessed ones. I am Professor Charles Xavier, nice to meet you. He then turns to Sam and continued with, I believe you are the one I talked to earlier. Sam nodded immediately and said, yes, sir. The other young mutant's attention was on Kurt who just scratches his head and waves to them to say hi. You can just call me professor. Charles said with a smile and then turned his bald head towards the destroyed place and then said, why don't we continue this talk inside the blackbird? Ronnie, Danny, and Sam nodded while Andrew was silent as he was analyzing all of them subtly. Charles then turned to his group and said, Hank, would you guide them inside? They seem to be tired. 
Yes, Professor. Charles wants to leave this place immediately after seeing the destruction that happened since this incident no matter how small will definitely attract unwanted attention. We would like that. Ronnie said after turning to the others who just agreed. Great, let's go. Dash. The young mutants was then guided inside the Blackbird as they sat in the spare seats. Andrew sat silently on his seat while holding the stacks of folders containing their profiles as he observes the professor who is seating on his wheelchair. The Blackbird slowly lifted from the ground as it quickly whistled through the air and after a while it entered sonic speed disappearing from the place. Dash. Ten minutes later. Several black SUVs with a logo of an eagle that has its wings spread on its door quickly drove inside the facility's grounds and pulled up in front of the partially destroyed hospital building and the destroyed chapel. The black SUV's doors opened and numerous agents wearing three-piece black suits quickly poured out. The black SUV in the middle was the last to open its doors as a balding middle-aged guy wearing sunglasses came out. He looked around the place surveying it and then turns to a man near him and ordered, search the place. Yes, sir the agent quickly said and then spurred off with other agents. Dash. After a while the balding middle-aged guy pulls a phone from his pocket and answered a call. Director, we didn't see any more people aside from a mangled beyond recognition body of who we assumes to be a woman while indications of a big fight is all over the place. Search the place more. Carlson, I need to know more about what happened there. An annoyed voice came out of the phone as it barked an order and finished the phone call. Beep beep beep. The balding guy now known as Phil Carlson smiled wryly and shook his head as he then turns to the agents and then shouted, Okay, guys, faster. The director is getting angry we don't want that, so find anything that can help us here. Dash. Degree Blackbird Degree. As they sat there silently, Kurt being himself removes his seatbelt and suddenly disappears from his place in a blue smoke and appeared in front of Sam. Kurt reached out his blue hand and said while smiling revealing his sharp teeth, I'm Kurt, my ability is teleportation. I'm Sam. I can release energy from my body to do variety of things. Sam, who was amazed and startled at the same time, also smiled as he reached his hand and shook it. Kurt then turned to Ronnie and smiled to her and introduced himself with Ronnie also doing the same. Kurt introduced himself to Berto, Danny, and Andrew but when it came to Ileana was the problem. Why do you look like that? Is that part of your mutation or you're a demon? She asked a bit genuinely. Kurt was a bit dumbfounded but wasn't discouraged as he's already used to this kinds of things and was about to answer when Sam beat him to it. Ileana, what are you doing? Dot. Sam interjected as he looked reprimandingly at the sword-wielding mutant. What? It's genuine quest. Dot. Ileana was about to protest when Professor Xavier suddenly talked at the side. Ileana. Rasputin, you're the missing sister of Peter. She ying. Ileana who heard that immediately stood from the chair as her soul sword quickly manifested at her hand as she dashed to the professor and points the sword at him and asked with a dangerous voice, Who are you? How did you know that? Answer me. Alex immediately stood from his seat and points his palm at the Russian girl as it slowly glowed with red energy. The other X-Men was also alerted at this as they prepared themselves. Alex. Let me. Professor lift his hand to stop Alex and while maintaining a calm face in front of the glowing sword, Ileana, calm down. I know your brother because he's part of the school. You will meet your brother when we get there. Ileana's anger suddenly waned down at that as her eyes slowly regained the hope that she lost when she was kidnapped by the human traffickers who mentally and physically violated her. She slowly put down her sword as it demanifest as she asked with a rare soft voice, Really? Yes, one of the reason why he joined the school is to search for you after he awakened his mutant ability. Charles replied with a smile as he started telling Ileana things about Piotr, his brother. Andrew at the side couldn't help but narrow his eyes at why Ileana didn't seem to insist the question of how did you know that, knowing Ileana, she would have cut this chat in half if she didn't get her answer but instead she just calmed down which is a bit out of her character. Andrew thought of two possibilities, that maybe she just really missed her brother or the professor messed with her head to calm her down. He believes it to be the latter but whatever, he doesn't care. And so at that thought, he closed his eyes to take a nap again while coating himself with telekinetic aura better safe than sorry. Dash. So, what happened there, Dot? Alex asked after the whole drama was over as he was curious what happened to the destroyed place. Well, Sam smiled wryly as he turns to Danny who also just hung her head down. Ronnie seeing her girlfriend like this immediately interjected and said, Well, what actually happened was, Ronnie then proceeded to tell the adult mutants what actually transpired in the Milbury Hospital detail by detail without omitting anything since she feels that she can trust them. When it came to the part of why they were there and what the doctor and her corporation was planning for them, Ororo couldn't help but clench her fist. Those animals. Alex who saw this reached out his hand and held hers and said, Don't worry, Ororo. We will get to the bottom of this. The other X-Men also couldn't help but narrow their eyes after hearing this organization who brainwashes and sells mutants for their own gain. Charles closed his eyes to control his unstable emotions and then turned to Hank, Hank. Know everything about this Essex Corporation. We need to know where are these facilities that Danny saw in the head of that doctor. Those kids need us. Creator's thoughts. Moshe L. Give me all your stones. Creation is hard. So motivate me by giving me your goddamn stonies. Like the story? Add it to the library. Have an idea for the story? Comment it down. Chapter 14. Chapter 13. Arriving. The Blackbird blitzed through the air quickly as they arrived at the X Mansion which is really beautiful the aircraft floated above the backyard of the grounds of the place as some mutant kids that was playing below lifted their head to look at it. The green grounds of the backyard suddenly starts separating in half as it make way for the aircraft to land inside. The Blackbird slowly landed inside the mansion stably. The door of the vehicle lifted up as the X-Men exited one by one followed by the new mutants. Andrew looks around the vast space with some curiosity and noticed that almost all was colored in silver this guy really likes them silver. As he starts walking with the new mutants as they followed the X-Men when a gasp was heard within his group. He turned his head curiously to Ileana who has a stunned look on her face while tears slowly began to glisten on her eyes. Andrew followed her line of sight and saw an enormous metal man standing at the far end of the large room. The metal man has silver metal for a skin coupled with his big shredded muscle that seems to, to burst out of his tight black shirt any moment. It's the older brother of Ileana, Piotr Rasputin A.K. Colossus. 
Colossus, who is also looking right back at Ileana, began to move as he lifted his feet and took a step forward. His slow walking then starts to take pace as he began to run toward Ileana as a smile slowly made its way on his face while tears began to form on his eyes that looks like Mercury when on his face. His every step leaves mark on the ground as he run with speed inappropriate for his size. Andrew was amazed by looking at this metal man and then looks at Ileana who also smiles as she also starts running towards her brother while her soul sword starts manifesting on her hand. Whoa whoa wait wait what is happening? Roberto da Costa hurriedly asked seeing Ileana taking her sword out. Don't worry. They just miss each other. Let's go. Charles Xavier said with a smile as his wheelchair starts strolling forward followed by the rest of his group who just shook their head as they look at Colossus who have started running away from his sister in fright feeling the danger that the sword carries. Dash. This place is the school for the gifted youngsters like yourselves. This is where we help young mutants like you hone and control their abilities in hopes of being able to get back on your normal lives along with normal humans. Charles Xavier said to the new mutants in front of him while the rest of the X-Men have already gone on their separate ways along the ways with Ileana still busy slashing her brother back in the hangar. The main goal of our institution is to promote equality between humans and the mutants while forging a peaceful coexistence between the two. That is such a wonderful endeavor professor. I hope the X-Men accomplishes that. Danny said as she looks on the window of the room they were all in where saw mutants kids like herself playing happily. Not just us but along with you all. We will accomplish this goal together. Charles Xavier smiled as he said this conviction while looking at the young mutants in front of him one by one. His face twitched a bit after he looks at a young man on the side of the group. He tried reading the mind of the kid to no avail as his psychic energy just wandered inside the teenager's mind without getting anything it's empty. Don't smile Andrew. Don't smile Andrew. Andrew held himself from laughing after he saw the comical face of the professor that tried to pry his mind. Dash. After a while of trying to instill some things that will make the young mutants loyal to the institution. Xavier let them go after he summoned Aurora to guide them to their respective rooms. The professor couldn't help but rub his temple in slight exhaustion after trying to read the mind of Andrew the whole time to no avail, as all he got was emptiness with his ability just swimming through the seemingly infinite realm of his mind. Knock. Knock. A knock sounded from the door and after Xavier's permission, Hank opened it and strode inside the room. Get me any information you can get about this new kid Andrew Detmer. I can't get anything from him. We need to make sure he isn't a danger to all of us. Xavier said while sighing and explaining a bit. Hank was stunned after hearing that there's actually someone who can resist the ability of the most powerful telepath in the world but just nodded as he also realized the danger this may bring them. Dash. That old fucker actually tried to mind rape me the whole time I was inside that room. Andrew couldn't help but curse inwardly after remembering Xavier poking around his mind earlier. Okay we are here. This will be your room from now on. Good luck with your roommate. Aurora said at the side as they stopped in front of a door as she smiled to Andrew. Andrew looks at her beautiful face for a while but just nodded in reply afterwards. Great. Bye. Aurora looks at him with a teasing narrowed eyes after she saw him staring at her for long and then began walking away with her waist naturally swaying left and right as she disappeared in the intersecting corridor. Andrew looks at this spectacle for a while and then looks at the door after she disappeared. He opened the door and then saw two beds inside the relatively big room. The other bed is occupied by another guy who lays on it while holding a book in one hand while on the other is a lighter which he constantly opened and closed. The guy has a slicked back smooth hair and a relatively good look coupled with a slight cocky smirk that never seems to disappear from his face. Andrew took a step inside the room as the young man lifted his head to look at him while closing the book, who the heck are you? I am your father. Andrew said with a deep voice and face full of seriousness. Are you fucking with me? The guy immediately stood up after hearing that as the fire in the opened lighter suddenly became bigger. Andrew sighed inwardly and was disappointed that the guy didn't get the reference. What a shame. Never mind. I'm Andrew. Andrew Detmer. Nice to meet you. Andrew lifts his head after and reaches out his hand for a handshake. Ah, the guy was at a loss for words at Andrew's attitude but seeing that he was not picking a fight with him, he also reaches out his hand to shook the other party's hand. I'm, John. John Allardyce. Andrew thought for a moment and tried to recall who he was and nodded his head after with a smile. So, can you introduce this place to me? Me and my friends just got here so, ah, uh, I'm actually busy, maybe Bob, dot. John Allardyce A.K. Pyro wasn't able to finish his words when the door opened again and a head peeked in. Hey John let's go pract. Oh, speaking of the devil. Pyro spoke as he shrugged his shoulders and then responded to the newly arrived guy. Bobby, this guy, and his friends just arrived here and wants to have someone to accompany and tour them around. Would you mind? Robert Bobby Drake A.K. Iceman immediately responded with no, I don't mind. And then walked towards Andrew and shook his hands and also introduced himself with a smile. I'm Robert Drake but you just call me Bobby just like everyone. Andrew responded the kind gesture and also smile. He then turned around to Pyro and said see you later. Which he just receives a nod. Andrew and Bobby then got out of the room as the former quickly find the new mutants using his ability. Dash. Within a big expensive looking room that has a floor to ceiling glass window, a black man wearing an all black trench clothes and black eye patch sat at his seat while writing something at the paper on the table in front of him. Nicholas Fury, director of the S.H.I.E.L.D.E. couldn't help but curse under his breath as he checked all the complaints of those higher than him sent him. Knock. Knock. Come in. The man spoke with a voice tinged with annoyance and tiredness. The door opened and revealed the one known as Phil Cowlson. Phil strode to the front of Fury and put some stack of paper on the desk of the annoyed man and spoke, Good morning director, from what we have gathered from the site and some evidence we saw around the place, it seems that the place was owned by some secret organization that experiments on mutants and trains them to become a killing machine. We assumed that the unrecognizable woman from the site is also a mutant whom the organization ordered to train young mutants and speaking of the young mutants, it seems that they have already escaped the place after defeating the woman with some unknown means, we think that one of the young mutants has the ability to summon an abnormally large animal and that animal was the one who killed the woman and after killing the woman, the animal seems to not follow its master as it also attacked them and then disappeared afterwards in thin air based on the marks from the place. Nick Fury listened attentively to the other party and pondered about the things he said. He thought about something and then asked, Do we have the location of those young mutants? They shouldn't have got away that far, right? That's the last thing, Director. We also found that after the battle with the woman and the animal, the young mutant seems to have been rescued by the X-Men as their Rs-150 Blackbird was seen flying through the sky coming from the direction of the site. 
Carlson said seriously like the best agent that he is. Nice work, Carlson. Let's leave those young mutants at the care of the professor since he have already done us quite the help in the past but if you somehow get the chance, know the identity of those young mutants he rescued. Fury nodded his head as he remembered how the professor have been a great help to them by finding criminals that they can't find on their own nice work again. You're dismissed. Phil Carlson nodded and made his way out of the room as he fiddled with his limited edition Captain America vintage cards while smiling like a kid. Dash. In the deepest level of a building in New York hides a secret laboratory. A handsome man with unnaturally pale skin and slicked back black hair holds a medical tool as he checked the insides of the body laid in a table in front of him. He was about to continue with his little working when the phone in his pocket started to vibrate. The man's face twitches in annoyance as removes his gloves and then he turns around and sat on his seat on the far end of the laboratory as he then took his phone out. What is it? Mr. Milbury, one of our facilities was destroyed and the young mutants being trained in it escaped while our people assigned to it died and was now taken away by s.h.i.i.l.d who have now had the place under their control. A voice that obviously carries fear sounded on the phone. The man now known as Mr. Milbury took a deep breath while his face was emotionless and then said with eerie calmness, make sure that that blind organization doesn't trace anything back to us and also find more mutant to make up for the escapees. Speaking of them, send me the information regarding those young mutants. Yes sir. Right away. The voice immediately replied and the call ended. The unnaturally pale man calmly stood up and then took the gloves and then came back to his project as he whistles a tune. Important questions. Romance? Heck yes. Heck no. Underscore underscore. Harem? Yes? No? Underscore underscore. I'll ask questions again in the next upload. I'll upload tomorrow if this reaches 500 plus stones so do your best. Creator's thoughts. Moshe L. Make this book reach 500 stones and I'll post tomorrow. Deal? Deal? Like the story? Add it to the library. Have an idea for the story? Comment it down. Creation is hard, so cheer me up. Chapter 15, Chapter 14, Tour. Seems like no harem one. So it is what it is. BTW help us reach 600 plus stones and I'm posting tomorrow. Deal? Deal? Degree X Mansion Degree. Third person P.O.V. Andrew and Bobby walked the corridor as the former quickly brought the ladder out of the mansion where they found the new mutants admiring the view of the place. Sam was looking around curiously at the place while Roberto was laying at the grass, relaxed. Ronnie and Danny, the two lovebirds had their hand held together as they also looked around with a smile on their face. The two managed to quickly get the attention of the group as they walked towards them. Sam quickly smiled and then said, Hey, man, this place is so beautiful and seems really peaceful. I can't believe that we will stay here. Andrew just smirked inside at the word peaceful but replied with yeah. By the way, I'd like you all to meet out fellow schoolmate, Bobby. Bobby smiled to the group as he shook their hands one by one while the new mutants introduced themselves respectively with the exception of Ileana who was still at the hangar trying to beat her brother with her soul sword. Dash. The group quickly got comfortable with Bobby, seeing his easygoing but a bit shy personality, and talked along the way as the latter toured the group in the mansion. Bobby introduced the group to the other students who also replied enthusiastically which made the group a bit happy seeing that they are welcome here. Along the way, they encountered two teenage girls. One was young beautiful woman who had a brown hair and good body considering that she looks around 14 to 15 years old. The other girl accompanying the former is also a beautiful young woman slightly older than the other. She also has brown hair but the unique thing was the white streaks at the forefront of her hair and the fact that she is wearing gloves and long sleeve shirt in the face of the glaring sun. And, Kitty, Bobby Drake called out enthusiastically to the two girls after seeing them. Rogue and Shadowcat, huh? Andrew thought seeing the two young mutant. Hey Bobby. Kitty replied as she waves her hands and dragged the other by her gloved hands to them. She reached the group quickly and said after seeing the group with Bobby so, you're the group who came with the X-Men earlier right? Oh where's my manner? I am Catherine Pride but you just call me Kitty just like the others. Yes, we are, nice to meet you. The new mutants also introduced themselves once again. Rogue on the other hand was silent but seeing that Kitty was already finished and the others were already looking at her. She stammered and said I, I am Anne-Marie, nice to meet you all. Ronnie and Danny who saw her acting like this already knows what's up with her and immediately began talking with her more to make her more comfortable with them along the way. Rogue was relieved inwardly that they were friendly but couldn't help but feel insecure that they would eventually also avoid her after they found out her power so she gathered up her courage and confessed to the group the reason why she seems to avoid having contact with them which puzzles the group. The group was once again puzzled after they found out that the other mutants here actually avoids their fellow mutant just because of a power she can't control. But in then end they couldn't do anything about it so they just comforted Anne and told her that they are not like the others which brought a genuine smile on the face of the insecure girl. Dash. Minutes turned to hours as they converse and laughed along the tour trying to know more about each other. Andrew was already getting bored with the constant talk and touring as he already explored most of the big mansion's corners using his TK domain and was already getting sleepy. Fighting a gigantic nigh immortal bear is taxing if you don't know. Bobby, Kitty, and Rogue was saddened and angry after finding out that the new mutants was actually kidnapped and some organization was trying to take advantage of it and was trying to turn them into killing machines. But the negative atmosphere was quickly dispelled after they found out that group actually fought against a gigantic bear and survived and was excited for when they would also get that kind of adventure as they also remembered watching the X-Men save the day from the evil mutants in the TV. Andrew's ears perked up at the mention of the X-Men's adventures and rescue missions and tried digging up more information regarding them to find out what events have already happened in this earth. With a little more talk he found out that no big X-Men events really happened not even the plot of the X-Men. First class. The X-Men of this reality have just been established about three years ago, but the mansion was already accepting mutants long before. After Charles Xavier decided to actively do more and all they have done from that span of time was save confused newly awakened mutants and fight mutants who abuse their own power. And digging a bit about who the enemies of X-Men, he found the enemies in the form of Magneto and his brotherhood of mutants. While it seems they don't know anything about any Hellfire Club, Andrew was pretty sure that they also exist. Dash. Hours passed and when they all have had their lunch, they continued touring and by the end of the day, the last place they visit was the east wing of the sub-basement where the danger room was located. This is the danger room. This is where we train and practice our abilities to better control them to not only help ourselves but also to help other mutants out there. 
Kitty explained to the group as they walked around the place. The trainings consists of traps, projectiles, and other mechanical dangers that is intended to challenge the limits of the trainee. Oh and it also have robots, cool right? She continued explaining enthusiastically to them. The new mutants was continued to be amazed by the wonders of this place as they looked around curiously. Dash. After touring the whole day, the group was finally finished and was already a bit tired so they all called it a day and began returning back to their assigned rooms to rest. Andrew opened the door to his room and closed it after and saw John Allardyce still in his bed but was now sleeping soundly. He stretches his body a bit to loosen up some muscles and bones as it produced some pops. After that he lay slowly on his bed comfortably and sighed contentedly ahh. Nothing beats a good bed after a long day. He then began to think about the informations he got and began pondering about all of it with closed eyes. The Brotherhood won't really be that much of a problem for him in the future if somehow he got in conflict with them. But the Hellfire Club is. From what he remembers, the Hellfire Club mostly always consists of influential people, mostly politicians, and people like that are always a headache. But he got one solution to all that problems. Power. While fighting and shit was not in his live the best list which was just him relaxing lavishly and eating good food. Power was needed if he wants to achieve all that shit and power is also needed to achieve his top of the world plan. So even if he want or not, he will need to fight his way here to obtain true power and if he don't want to have some ants constantly trying to annoy him every day when the inevitable day come where his identity being still alive and shit comes to light. So for now, he will lie low in this peaceful place while constantly trying to improve his ability to be ready if some shit suddenly show up at the gates of this mansion. He will also try to blend more around here starting from now on and begin socializing with the students if he wants to make the Baldi believe that he had really changed when the time comes that the telepath managed to inevitably unravel his past. And finally when the Battle of New York comes, that will be the time he finally moves. That mind gem isn't going to be on the head of that robot. He has a good feeling that the Mind Stone will help him enhance, hasten actually, all his shinnik abilities and his overall power to the point that he may actually achieve his dream of atomic level control to subatomic or even cosmic level, though, he doubted the latter. Even so, even if some unkillable organizations like the Hydra or the S.H.I.E.L.E. itself gets in his way, the Mind Stone isn't getting anywhere near a robot's head. Creator's thoughts. Moshe L. Creation is hard? Cheer me up? Like the story? Add it to the library. Have an idea for the story? Comment it down. Chapter 16, Chapter 15, Daily Life in the X Mansion. Last chapter for the week. See you in Monday. Happy reading, equals 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 equals, degree X Mansion degree, 30th of June, 2011, third person P.O.V, a day passed in the X Mansion as Andrew sat beneath a tree while he observes the kids playing on the big front space of the mansion, he saw the new mutants interacting with the other mutants their ages as they laughed happily and without worry, as he was about to stand up and go inside the mansion, he saw the professor, Hank, Alex, and another guy who seems to be also a teenager wearing a white blindfold as Alex Summers carefully guides him to walk along with them as they came out of the mansion, Cyclops, Andrew immediately thought as he slowly stands up and continues to look at them, dash, why don't you show us what you can do, Charles Xavier said to the blindfolded teenager don't be afraid Scott, you're safe here, come on bud, don't be afraid, you can do it, Alex said to his brother while encouraging him, okay, Scott Summers reluctantly said as he slowly removes the white cloth blindfolding him, he furrows his brows as he positions himself according to what Hank guides him to with his eyes still closed, unknowingly, a floating child's clothes and eyeglass ran into the range where Scott would open his eyes, wait, Hank and Charles was late to notice the kid as Scott already opened his eyes and a beam of concussive energy came out of his eyes and rapidly approached the kid. Swoosh. The concussive heat was a meter away from reducing the invisible kid into chunks of meat when it collided with an invisible wall that redirected the beam towards the sky. Andrew who is standing from his position has his left hand in a reaching motion as he spends some effort to keep the wall of force field sturdy. That beam was quite powerful. Scott seeing this immediately closed his eyes in fright and began to panic w what? What happened to the kid? I I. Andrew then flew close to the invisible kid and deduced that the kid seems to be frightened seeing that it wasn't making a noise hey, kid. Are you okay? He tapped the shoulder of the shirt. Why off? The invisible boy who recovered from his shock immediately wailed like a pig being butchered and cried pitifully. The nearby students immediately scrambled away in fear after the seeing the incident while the other professors came out of the mansion to see what has just transpired. What happened? Storm along with Colossus and Kurt immediately asked seeing the situation. While Sam along with Roberto at the side who saw the whole thing explained it to them. Charles with the others also came over to Andrew to check on the kid and after confirming that the kid was fine and just experienced some mild shock gratefully thanked him thank you, young Andrew if it wasn't for. Andrew cut him off as he said no worries professor, just like you said, we are all family here, who else will help us other than family? Xavier smiled and then looks at the invisible kid while Hank also thanked him. While Alex also expressed his gratitude to Andrew by giving him a thumbs up. Scott on the other hand is still in shock and was looking blankly at the ground. Based on what we see, I can manufacture the leftover ruby quartz I have in my lab that will keep Scott's optic beams contained within their own vector field. Hank talked after a moment as he immediately come to the most feasible solution to the problem of Scott. Storm, Colossus, and the other professors checked upon the kid and also consoles the sulking Scott while Andrew who was about to go back inside saw a young woman looking at them at the side holding books and papers. The woman has a beautiful red hair and an overall amazing features. Jean Grey. Andrew thought as he looks at the woman while Jean Grey also looks at him as he felt the same feeling when Charles tried to read his mind. Andrew then began walking towards her direction and stopped beside her and said stop snooping inside my mind. And then continued walking towards the mansion while wondering where the phoenix have been when they were touring this place since he didn't see her. Jean was stunned and tried to explain that it was not her intention but Andrew was already far away from her, not giving her the chance to get close to him. Dash. Andrew P.O.V. I sits in the sofa at the living room of the mansion comfortably as I look at the television curiously while munching on some nuts. This is some good stuff. Catch our exclusive interview with Tony Stark and his thoughts after revealing his true identity to the public, tonight at 10. 
WHIH World News. That guy is always starving for attention. Aurora Monroe spoke while leaning in the frame of the door and then walked and sat beside me. What do you think of him? I stared at her for a moment and then replied well, I think he's already on his redemption arc seeing that he already took down the weapons manufacturing of his own company. Definitely sacrificing a sizable sum that dealing weapons make. Yeah, but he still got a long way if he want the approval and forgiveness of the people he directly and indirectly hurt. She replied while crossing her hands as she looks at the narcissistic man waving his hand to the press in the TV. Well she's not wrong. Yeah, I agreed on her opinion and then changed the channel of the TV. The mutants are the devil's spawns. They're an abomination, a wrongness that should indefinitely needed to be right. They're the devil's spawn. Devil's spawn. Dot. A relatively big group of people are gathering in front of the White House while carrying some placards and shouting with a determined but crazy look in them. I was about to continue watching but then stopped as sensed the mood of Aurora going down the drain with my empathy. I changed the channel as I turned to look at her. I then brought my hand to her shoulder to comfort her and then said they just don't know anything. Don't listen to them. I know. We are already trying our best. But it's like they are not seeing the good things we do and only the bad things. She replied after sighing with a tired look on her face. That's just human nature. Even if you do hundreds upon hundreds of good things for them, the only thing they will immediately remember from you is the single mistake that you did. So don't mind them. I responded to her as I leaned my back to the couch with my palms on the back of my head. So why bother? Sigh. You got some deep words there, huh, kid. Dash. We managed to talk for a while and this made her more comfortable and open to me and our conversation lasted longer than expected. The black hottie then stood up and made her way to the door but then stopped, turned around and smiled to and said, thanks, and continued. I just smiled at her in return and after seeing her disappearing from the door, I removed my smile as I shifted my focus back to the TV. I then changed the channel back as I thought about the main reason for mutant hate in this world, Sublime. If some you all don't know, Sublime is the name of a sentient bacterial life form. Yep that's right. A sentient bacteria, I'm pretty sure some germophobic people out there with themselves if they learned about this shit. Back to the bacteria. Sublime arose during the beginnings of life on Earth, and with the rise of humanity and other life forms, he or it rather, found endless hosts to infect. However, for some reason, the mutant kind is immune to his infection and this sparked his hate for mutants as he assumes that they are a threat to his domination and should be controlled or exterminated. So in the end, he's actually just a sore loser whom after not getting his way, would resort to underhanded means to take revenge. Basically a bitter megalomaniac sentient bacteria. Dash. Third person P.O.B. Degree danger room degree. Andrew stands inside the danger room alone as he looks at the big robots currently facing him. The red robots was about 13 meters tall and exudes a pressure that will make any normal person buckle but Andrew just looks at it with a calm calculating gaze. The first robot began to rapidly run to him as it bring its fist to punch him. Andrew floats away from its range quickly and then made a punching motion. The robot was if punched by something invisible stumbles a bit. The second robot took this chance to make a move as its right robot arm detaches from its shoulder and rapidly approached Andrew in the air. Andrew seeing this made a clasping motion with his hands as the arm was then crushed in the air and produced some sparks. Andrew continued his attack with his right hand slowly clenching as the two robot also began to produce some sparks and knelt on the ground. He finished the attack with a swatting motion to the ground as the two robot was then slammed to the ground motionless. Though, the training seems to be still not finished as the metallic wall behind Andrew silently opened as numerous projectiles shot out of it with a swift speed and stealthily. Andrew just scoffs as he activated his force field and just watched as the projectiles slam at his force field uselessly and fell to the ground with a useless sound. LOL useless. A green light replaced the red light that was on the top of the door indicating that the training was finished. Clang, clap, clap. A clapping sound resounded in the danger room as the metallic door automatically opened and revealed Colossus, Charles, and Hank. Well done, Andrew, well done. Charles praised him with a smile on his face while rolling, towards him. I can see from how you fight that you prioritize a long-range combat, from that we can structure some more tests and curriculum for the students who also think the same as you to efficiently enhance and improve their capabilities to defend themselves in case of emergency. The beast, Hank McCoy at the side immediately tinkered after analyzing his fight and began writing at his mini pad. You fight well, my friend. Do you want me to be the one to test you myself? Dot. Peter A.K. A Colossus asked with a genuine look at Andrew while rubbing his metallic head. Andrew looks at the honest Colossus and thought about how vastly different the personality of the two siblings sure, why not? Wait, are you not tired Andrew? You should rest for now and do this far next time. Yes, Professor. Colossus agreed after hearing him. Sure thing. Andrew replied and then began making his way out of the room with Colossus accompanying him after saying goodbye with the two professors. Charles Xavier smiled seeing the interaction between the two and then turned to Hank it's better to give him the benefit of the doubt. He has definitely changed, even if I can't see his mind, I can feel it. I can feel that he's now different from the him that made a scene in Seattle. And that's a good thing. Everyone deserves a second chance. Hank also agreed and his hesitation to accept Andrew as a true student after seeing his researching about his past began to wane down. Dash. Walking on the long silver corridor with Colossus talking with him about how Ileana interacted with them in the past and whatsoever. Andrew patiently answered his questions since he know that Peter is trying his best to know what Ileana likes. While he doesn't even know why the metal man would think he would know what that crazy blonde likes but he just answered him based on the things he learned from the interaction they had in the facility. They came out of the corridor and walked the long staircase that guides them up towards the surface area. They came in the living room as Andrew was greeted by a redhead. Piotr seeing this tactfully shuts up and thanked Andrew and then made his way to find his sister. Ugh. This girl again Andrew thought tiredly. Jean waits for a bit and seeing Colossus was now gone. She spoke with I'm here to explain myself that it was actually not my intention to spy in your mind Anne. I know. You don't have to explain yourself. Now bye. 
Andrew smiled seeing her struggling to come up with her explanation. Oh, Jean replies with an oh. Hey, she's cute, but not, I'm not looking to be cosmically incinerated into nothingness. The protagonist thought seeing her blank and confused expression and lists her to his to avoid for now list. Andrew then taps her shoulder since he doesn't want the conversation to get long as he felt Blair tangibly poking his back and he doesn't really want to deal with a brain damaged lovesick blind without his glasses right now and he also currently also don't want to be near the host of a comic entity without assurance that he can survive if it suddenly began rampaging. Andrew made his way outside the mansion rather quickly after smiling at the frowning Scott at the side. Dash. Andrew P. O. B. Night. 30th of July, 2011. One month later. I lay on my bed comfortably while Pyro lays on his bed at the other side of the room. This month was bit boring but also fruitful since I managed to meet most of the students here and all I can say to them is they're useless. I watched the other students also train themselves in the danger room and I'm disappointed with them. Especially Bobby Drake. He is supposed to be an Omega level mutant be here he is throwing streams of ice and breathing snows, like what the fuck. If I have been reincarnated as him I'd already be throwing mountains of ice and reforming the melted glaciers in Antarctic at his age, but it is what it is as I'm already thankful and sure that I can do much more than that in the future. But forget about him, let's talk about myself. My ability have also progressed nicely even though I don't have the freedom here to use my ability here in a large scale anywhere and anytime I want. The good thing is I can now do hydrokinesis and geokinesis, the lifting strength of my TK has also now quadrupled. I can now probably throw trucks upon trucks at my enemy without quickly tiring and squeeze them to suffocation and maybe even lift some small establishment. Maybe. While I have my plans on how will I increase my physical strength effectively, I am still choosing what ways, since I am definitely not choosing the way of the Hulk or even getting his gamma radiated blood to merge with my own. It's too much of a risk since there's the threat of the freaking one below all, which is the dark aspect of the one above all, and his below place, which is the lowest point of reality, even below the deepest layers of the hells, and I am never gonna be ready to be possessed by something like that. The idea of the golden sentry serum also came to me but I am not pretty sure if sentry exists in this reality considering that this universe inclined more to the plot of the M.C.U even with all the different kinds of things mixed up here together but it'd be nice to get my hands on that super soldier serum that is on a million steroids. But as always, there's still of course the threat of the void. Sigh. Why can't anything just be normal for once? Like the original super soldier serum. At the same time, I also thought about just manually increasing my physical strength considering that I now have a limited form of body manipulation, a slash n, not to be confused with biokinesis a.k. a biological manipulation. I am also excited in my approaching journey to Seattle soon. I can't wait to see the look on the face of that father of mine will make after he sees me all alive and kicking. But for now, let me sleep. This monologue of mine has already gone too far. Equals 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 equals. I have already decided on who's for romance. Not Wanda. Not Jean. It's. Stay tuned to find out. LOL. Also give me your stones. Just give it to me and no one's going to get hurt. Creator's thoughts. Moshe L. Creation is hard? Cheer me up. Like the story? Add it to the library. Have an idea for the story? Comment it down. Chapter 17, Chapter 16, Spar. 15th of August, 2011. Danger Room. Third person P.O.V. Half a month later. Andrew stands in front of Colossus about 5 meters away while taking a serious stance. In this mock fight, he intends to use his ability minimally to test how far he has improved in terms of his physical aspects after experimenting a bit using his body manipulation for the past 15 days. Numerous mutants stands outside the room as they looks at the impending battle excitedly. Scott stares at this battle with a smug look as he can already imagine the would-be wasted form of Andrew. Jean just looks at this with curious eyes waiting for the battle to happen. While the other younger mutants, especially the invisible kid, cheered for Andrew, they like him since he always interacted and plays with them by making them fly with his telekinesis and stuff, while some also cheers for Peter. At the same time, Catherine and Kitty Pride A.K. A Shadowcat and Anna Marie A.K. A Rogue cheered for Colossus since they know how strong he is and doesn't really know that much about the strength of Andrew aside from the fact that he can lift heavy things with his mind just like Jean Grey. The new mutants at the side also cheered on for their friend who have fought alongside them in a life and death situation. The adult mutants like the Charles, Hank, Alex, and Aurora stood on the circular viewing deck attached to the ceiling, which also held all the controls that powered the room, with serious look on their face with the exception of Kurt who is just smiling. Who do you think will win? Alex turns to the smartest guy in their group for his idea. Well it'd obviously be Andrew knowing that he can actually throw boulders and walls of houses, it would be easy for him to play around with Peter from afar. But since he said earlier that he would try to not use his main ability, maybe Peter since he got his extraordinary strength. This is really interesting, since I don't know why Andrew would choose to not use his ability. Maybe he got some kind of trump card? I don't know, but let's just see. Hank answered with his two fingers on his chin as he tries to deduce how the battle will go. Of course it would be Andrew, he's pretty confident but maybe he's just being arrogant which is unlike him. Kurt interjected after Hank finished and gave his honest opinion. Hmm. I also feel that Andrew is hiding something and will reveal it in this battle. We'll see. Charles Xavier also voiced out his opinion. I think that what Andrew is gonna reveal is his strength. Aurora gave his opinion but after seeing the three looking at her for more she continued with what I mean is his physical strength. I once saw him last week crushing a chalice with his bare hands, so that is definitely saying something. Wait really? I thought he was a shinnik like Jean and Professor? Where did that enhanced strength came from? Is he like Emma who has double mutation? Alex was astonished by what Aurora said and asked curiously. Well technically he seems to have two mutations seeing the results of the tests. But, that two ability are entirely shinnik based and have no relation to physicality whatsoever. Hank McCoy answered with a curios and puzzles look on his face. He's really an enigma since he can even block away a telepathy as powerful as me. Charles spoke with seriousness at this as this has been a sore spot for him. Dash. Are you ready, young Andrew? Pyotr Nikolaevich Peter Rasputin spoke with his thick Russian accent as he stretched his hand to crack his knuckles as it produced some metallic popping sounds. I was born ready. Andrew answered with confidence as he also began stretching his body. Haha, <laughs> that is the spirit. Peter laughed boisterously as he began running towards Andrew while producing heavy thuds of sounds. Andrew immediately took a proper stance seeing this and clenches his fist. He brought down his left hand towards the level of his belly while his right hand is brought up to the face level. 
Peter defied common sense and arrived rather quickly, contrary to his size, and tried to probe his opponent with a right jab to the head. Andrew without even using his parallel processing to enhance his reaction and calculating speed was able to react as he swerved his head to the side and crouched a bit and punched Peter's stomach quickly with a half his strength. Clang. The punch produced a loud sound, Peter took a step back from the force of the punch but the surrounding mutants was stunned by this feat. It was worth to be mentioned that when Peter was in his organic metal form, he unknowingly exchanges his carbon atom to osmium atom, an extremely dense metal and this form of his can even withstand ballistic penetration, including that of a 110mm howitzer shell. So Andrew making Colossus take a step back was a feat to be amazed with. Colossus was also stunned but immediately recovered and brought his right feet to make a hook kick to Andrew's side. Andrew reacted by bringing his hand to the ground and made a backflip to get away of the metal man's range. Andrew landed perfectly on his feet but didn't give Peter any chance and dashed to him quickly. He then punches the other party's face and then proceeded to rain down punches while showing an amazing flexibility as he dodges the metal man's punches, which was was now beginning to increase his strength. H-A-A-A. Peter who for all his kindness was also now getting annoyed so after enduring one more punch from Andrew, he lifted his right foot in the air and then smashed it down forcefully. Hume. Their immediate surroundings shook as Andrew lost his footing while Peter immediately took this chance to inch closer to him and then gave Andrew a solid punch in the gut while still holding back some strength. Andrew who was caught off guard was thrown in the air and began rolling on the ground. Andrew stops at approximately 7 meters away and lied there for a while. Peter's supporters cheered on seeing this especially Ileana who wasn't able to hide her excitement at the fight and also began shouting to her brother words you're dead if you lost this fight, which Peter just smiles wryly while Andrew's supporter liked Sam Guthrie and the rest began shouting some encouragement. Andrew smiled wryly as he looks at his supporters and thought that he seems to be fighting like a gladiator right now. That is one good punch, Peter. Heavy breathing Andrew said as he tries to catch his lost breath and then stood up straight after seems like I need to up my game here. Andrew took on a serious countenance as he began gathering a bit of his TK energy and then began filling his whole body with it slowly. Andrew grits his teeth a bit as he felt his muscles began expanding a bit and veins ballooning up as if would burst any moment. His whole aura began changing into a more dangerous one as Colossus also took a more serious stance as he felt this. Andrew took a deep breath and felt his already considerable strength forcefully increasing I wouldn't even try this if don't got my own healing factor, heh. He then dashed forward with speed that leaves his earlier speed in dust and jumped high and brought his right foot for a chopping motion towards Colossus. Colossus felt the threat that Andrew now brings and immediately brought his hands in X motion above his head to block the attack. Clung bong. The kick connected while Colossus was stunned as he was then quickly brought to his knees from the force. Andrew seeing this followed his kick with another kick to Peter's stomach after doing a 360 rotation in the air. Colossus' eyes widened from the force as he then flew away because of the kick and slammed at the wall of the danger room. Dash. Andrew's P.O.B. I looked at Peter who immediately tried to stand up but it is rather shakily and then looked at my arms as I clenched it to feel my strength. My strength have considerably gone up a notch after filling my whole body, from my muscles to my bones full of TK energy. While it is addicting to feel this kind of strength coursing through my veins. I know that this is only temporary and the moment I remove my TK energy in me I will feel pain since I am literally forcefully pumping my muscles and bones full of energy and that is dangerous. My inner monologue was broken as Peter have already recovered and was now standing while rubbing the area where I kicked him hardly. You've become strong, young Andrew. How did you do that, Dot? Colossus asked curiously as he rubs his aching arms and belly that receives the full force of my attack. The other mutants ears watching also perked up after hearing this since they are also curious where Andrew got this strength. What should I say? Lie? Isn't lying bad? Okay let's lie. I don't really know. It's just like when I woke up one day, I felt some sort of extraordinary strength in me that came out nowhere. I shamelessly lied to his face, while I don't really know if Charles Xavier could know if I'm lying based on my mannerisms and facial expressions since he was said to have a doctorate in psychology, I don't really care since he still can't read my mind. I looked up at the viewing deck and saw him having a serious face. Heh, suck that up baldy, hee <laughs> hee. While I know that him not being able to read my mind has been frustrating him so much since he have grown up being able to read anyone's mind with just snap, it is still a good thing that he is not doing any drastic measures against it and is just going with the flow unlike his comic counterpart from the comic where he just, ugh, I don't even want to think about it, but still, I can't trust him, and anyone in this mansion, since Charles can just go fuck it with me and the new and all the mutants in this mansion and outside will rush to me heeding Charles' commands. Fucking telepaths. My thoughts were once again broken by Peter who after flexing arms a bit to feel it began running at me again at full speed. Truly unbefitting of his size and weight. He quickly reached me and gave a fast punch while still holding back of course to my head. I brought my left hand to the incoming punch and deflected it by the wrist to the side and countered with my own. My punching speed was definitely faster than before as my punch quickly connected to his face. Colossus seems to be disoriented by the force as I immediately took this chance to jump high in the air and clasped both my hands and brought it down to his head. The smash also connected as he was then brought to the ground from the impact. I wanted to follow the attack punch to his unmoving form on the ground but he managed to dodge as he rolled away from the range. My punch connected to the silver metallic floor as I my fist sinks, proving my now extraordinary strength. I removed my hand from the ground as I saw a deep fist imprint on it. I was about to continue admiring the result of my strength when I heard footsteps rapidly approaching me. I was late to react as the moment I lift my face, I was met with metal punch to the face. Deja vu. I was once again thrown away as I rolled to the ground. It was definitely me to blame for getting my own guard down since I don't have my TK domain active which I purposely deactivated to test myself since that skill was a bit of a cheat. I immediately stood up flexibly and it instinctively brought my hand to my lips as I felt something. Looking down at my hand, I was met with my own blood on my hand. He managed to make me bleed. Hehe. <laughs> Dash. P.O. Peter Rasputin P.O.B. Looking at young Andrew who is staring at the deep imprint his fist left on the ground, I immediately took the chance. Running forward to him with my quick speed I reached him immediately as I punched him in the face with my full strength. I was a bit worried that wouldn't be able to endure my strength but seeing him quickly standing flexibly brought me relief. I was stunned by what he did next as after he wiped the blood on his lips, which also brought me another shock since all he got from my punch was just a popped lips. He looked at his blood curiously and then a grin began forming on his face. He smiled. 
Worry began to surface again in me as the thought that maybe Andrew's brain was damaged from my punch and he is now going crazy. The other mutants who are watching also share the same concern as me as they murmured and talked. My thoughts were broken as I saw Andrew began running again towards me while still sporting the same grin at his face. Dash. Third person P. .o .v. Andrew dashed at Peter with unnatural speed and quickly reached his range as he began assaulting him with numerous punches left and right without even holding back the speed of him leaving Peter not being able to react. Bang bang. Thump thump. The fast pace of Andrew left Peter not being able to react at all as Andrew made him an efficient punching bag as he gave the metal man a beating that he will definitely remember in his entire life. Left hook, right hook, kick to ribs. 190 degree midair kick, Andrew whom after beating the now disoriented and dizzy Peter gave his finishing blow. He began floating from the ground high up and positioned both his feet forward and began speeding down towards the dizzy head of Peter Rasputin. Colossus was late to react as the moment he managed to gather his senses, Andrew's double force kick already connected to his chest. A -ok. The force of the kick brought all the air out of Peter's lungs as he drew an arc to the air blasting away and some spits of saliva came out of his mouth with his eyes widened. Peter slammed once again to the silver metal wall of the danger room but this time, the wall wasn't able to endure the force as it also crumbled leaving the metal mutant deep within the clutches of the wall. Peter tried to stand up again but wasn't able to because of the pain so he just leans there at the wall and rapidly took deep breaths to recover his lost oxygen as he immediately reverts back to his flesh and bones form signifying his surrender. Andrew on the other hand lands to the ground and then sits exhausted on the ground as he deactivated his TK enhancement afterwards quickly. Immediately after doing that he was then assaulted by intense pain that seems to reverberate throughout his whole muscular system. He grits his teeth at this and thoughts about the idea of turning off his pain receptors in the future if he got the chance. The other spectating mutants was shocked silent but the silence was immediately broken as the younger mutants began cheering for Andrew's victory. Charles couldn't help but shook his head seeing the cheering mutants while also feeling shock inside as he himself also couldn't believe that Andrew would actually be the victor. He then signaled to Hank who after receiving the order quickly pressed a button at the metal wall beside the glass wall. The gates of the danger room opened as the cheering mutants began pouring in after it opened. Ileana immediately ran to her brother to check on her brother but after seeing that he doesn't even have a single scratch, she slapped his head rather roughly and then turned to the direction of the now laying Andrew and stared at him with a look that promised pain. The other mutants like Sam, Ronnie, and Danny also immediately ran up to checks upon Andrew but after seeing his exhausted look and bruises, turned to the incoming Charles and requested for Andrew to be brought to the medical room to be treated which the latter immediately refused. Andrew casually just refused as he can already feel his healing factor kicking in and beginning to heal his bruises and inner injuries. Feeling the pain slowly diminishing, Andrew carefully stood up but surprisingly Roberto A.K. The sunspot seems to have a cold as he actually tried to help Andrew stand up by holding Andrew's hands over his shoulder. The other new mutants looks at this scene with a stunned look, Roberto who saw their unbelieving gazes just said what? He deserves to be helped by this handsome me seeing how hard he fought and actually attained victory against one of the leading members of X-Men, right? The other mutants just laughed at him but also agreed to this and then they turned to Peter who was being helped by his sister. That was a good fight, Andrew. You continue to surprise me. You really did a number on me. Ugh. Colossus shook Andrew's hands and immediately praised him for his victory while rubbing the aching area on his body. Don't overestimate me, Peter. If you actually gave your all and used your full strength then I wouldn't be standing here right now conscious. Andrew said as he knows that the metal man still held back, a lot in, their fight. You two, now to the medical room. I have to check upon you two seeing how intense that battle was. Hank McCoy said seriously as he then signals to the other mutants surrounding them to help him bring the two to the medical room. Andrew was about to refute and say that he was now okay but seeing the glare he got from Storm, he just shuts up since there's no way out of it. Along the way out the danger room, Jean, Rogue, and Kitty also walked along with them while praising Andrew how well he fought while Scott just said not bad and then ignored Andrew and then proceeded to try and get Jean's attention like a dog. Bobby Drake and John Allardyce was together as they also walked with them and also congratulates Andrew along the way. The other mutants laughed and talked to each other as they walked along with them. Equals 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 equals. No words should be said at this point as you already know what to do. Give me your stones or else. Creator's thoughts. Moshe L. Like the story? Add it to the library. Have an idea for the story? Comment it down. Creation is hard. Give me all your damn stones. Chapter 18, Chapter 17, Shopping. This chapter is supposed to be for tomorrow but since we have reached a million views, here you go. Equals 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 equals. 13th of September, 2011. Degree X Mansion Degree. Afternoon. Andrews P. O. V. Almost a month has passed since my mock battle with Peter and in that span of time, we have also sparred again and again, but not as intense as the first battle. And in that numerous bout, my combat sense and ability have increased considerably. The X-Men also did some saving confused mutants here and there in that span of time while the new mutants also tried if they can join but Charles just said that they're not yet ready. Though back to Peter, I have to admit that that metal mutant was a good teacher in terms of these things. But when I asked him about where did he learn this martial arts, he said that he learned it from Logan. This news made me realize that it's not that James Howlett A.K. Logan A.K. Wolverine still isn't part of the X-Men or he doesn't exist in this universe just like what I initially thought which was a bit absurd if you think about it. It's just that he just went on for some vacation to ease his mind after he found out that his mortal enemy Victor Creed A.K. Sabretooth is actually his brother and this revelation brought about some unpleasant memories from the past that he doesn't want to talk about. I tried to find out more about if there's any more mutants part of the school that had gone on some vacation or something just like Logan but Peter just joked if Magneto and Mystique can be considered as one since they were also part of the Institute long ago. I stopped as I found nothing else anymore and continued our spars. I've also trained along with the other mutants and the new mutants in the span of this time. Returning back to my improvements. Along with my improved combat abilities, my main ability have also increased while not as drastic as before. Though my sub-abilities have taken a good progress starting with my minor telepathy that has improved its usage to normal levels where I can read complete thoughts of a person and also their memories coupled with hypnosis. Though, I'm still far from being able to freely alter them in any way I want. My body manipulation have also improved much more than before, using it, my already superhuman physique took a jump. If before, at my battle with Peter, I can lift about 5 to 7 tons, 10 if I enhanced my body forcefully, then now, I think it's about 15 to 17. 
Though that's just my estimate, since I don't want to be seen lifting 15 tons at the gymnasium and have the teachers asking me about how I can do that. Though, I also inquired Charles Xavier and Hank McCoy if they managed to get anything out of the information regarding the Essex Corporation but all they got was something called Essex House for Mutant Rehabilitation, a foster home that takes care of mutant children. Foster home? Huh? As if. I was about to continue my monologue when the door to my and Pyro's room opened and my roommate goes in. Pyro looks pissed off about something so my curiosity got ahead of me as I used my telepathy. Reading him a bit, he seems to be pissed off about him being vested once again by Iceman, while Iceman isn't really the best at realizing his own power, Pyro still wouldn't be able to win against an Omega-level mutant coupled with the fact that he can't even produce his own fire. He then sat and lied on his bed and pulled out the book he's always reading from his drawer and began reading while ignoring me. Seeing him like this reminds me that this seems to be the spark that starts the fire that will burn him and Bobby's friendship and then after this he will join Magneto's Brotherhood of Mutants and began fighting against the X-Men. My attention was once again pulled as the door was opened once again and Storm revealed herself. She immediately looked at me and then said, Do you want to come? Where? Where are we going? She then replied quickly shopping. I thought a bit and agreed as I remembered that the current set of clothes given by this school isn't really to my tastes. MNN sure, let me dress for a bit. Storm nodded and closed the door behind her. Do you want to come? I asked the brooding guy as I pulled my drawer open and donned out a gray hoodie and kept my black pants and combat black boots. Not really, take care. Pyro replied lazily but didn't forget to remind me to take care kindly. Ah, would you look at that. This guy isn't so bad. MHNN. I nodded and opened the door and saw Aurora, Roberto, and Kitty waiting for me. Oh you guys are coming. Why of course. I'm gonna buy some clothes since I can't look too shabby even if this is also where I sleep. Why? You don't want us interrupting your time with the professor? Huh? I knew it. Roberto narrowed his eyes and laughed as if he found a big news. I just rolled my eyes at him while Kitty greeted me enthusiastically like always while smiling sweetly hi, Andrew. Hi Kitty. I replied with a smile. This girl is always so happy that it's almost contagious. Let's go. Aurora said while rubbing her temple and sighing. We then walked the corridor of the mansion as the young mutant kids greeted us ever so happily while some stubborn kids insisted to come which was of course turned down by Aurora while Roberto and I promised the kids that we will bring back some treats for them which was responded with a loud yes. After getting outside and boarding the car that Aurora borrowed from Hank McCoy, who was a bit unwilling seeing that he followed us and deeply reminded to us to take care of his precious car, we then drove off immediately. Dash. Third person P. O. V. As they traveled the long road exiting the Xavier properties, Andrew habitually extended his TK domain gradually. But as he do it, he picked up two flying objects a block distance away from their moving car. It was drones. Someone's watching us. Andrew who was currently at the passenger seat sitting beside the driving Aurora couldn't help but furrow his brows a little as he found this things. He thought about all the possible answers about why two drones are following them and whose is it but couldn't come up with something substantial. After a few minutes, the drones flew away after following them and disappeared in the horizon. Andrew seeing this, wasn't relieved at all as he increased his vigilance and readied himself thoroughly. Dash. 45 minutes later. After a long ride filled with Kitty's laugh and Roberto's narcissistic remarks, the car parked in the parking lot of a mall in Times Square. Ha. Huh. It's been a while since I've been here. Kitty mutters at the side as she look around. Andrew climbs down the car as he out took in the sight of numerous skyscrapers, some with big screens in them displaying some models and some products they're trying to advertise, while the others displays news and etc. Let's first go in that. Aurora said as she points at a random establishment that looks to be selling some high-end clothes and other stuffs. Andrew and others nodded as they began their shopping spree. Dash. Andrew was quick to decide to what clothes he wants and immediately bought them but Kitty decided to be the tag and suggested that she's gonna pay for all their expenses for today using the allowance her family sends her every month. Unlike the families of almost all the students at the institute, Kitty's parents are alive and also doesn't hate her for being a mutant and supports her in every way they could. Roberto was grinning from ear to ear and immediately thanked the intangible girl, while Andrew also did the same along with Aurora who tried to refuse at first but then gave up after some persuasion. After the two was finished picking their clothes quickly, Andrew and Roberto sat with a tired look on their faces as they looked at the two women coming in and out of the fitting room as they can't decide which they really want. Women. Roberto said as he turned to Andrew beside him for confirmation. Women. Andrew rolled his eyes as he replied with a nod and smiled. Aurora and Kitty spends about an hour before they decided which clothes they really liked and then they left after. Dash. After buying all the things they want, the four descended the escalator from the second floor of the establishment and went to find something for the children. They move around the first floor for some time and just decided for some ice cream. How many gallons do you think? Kitty asked Aurora. Well, maybe about five or something is enough. Aurora responded and Kitty nodded. After buying gallons of different kinds of flavor, they then exited the establishment and tried going to the parking lot but a sudden commotion of people resounded which stops them on their tracks. The four's head immediately whipped to the direction of the talking people and saw them with their phones out flashing as they tried to take shots of picture at a kid that seems to be around eight years old wearing shabby clothes. The kid had a scared face with bull-like horns and ears on his head as he tried to reach for a scarf at the ground. Dash. Tom P. O. V. Carefully squeezing through the large amount of people that walks the road, some silent, some loud, I held the cloth in my head to hide my budding horns and ears to not attract their attention. After leaving the smelly crowd, I was amazed to see so many large houses that seems to pierce through the clouds itself. They're so tall, I started walking again and felt some of the scars left by the objects with needles on them that they used to extract my blood ache as winced in pain. Rumble. My stomach made a funny sound as I also started feeling the hunger coming back to me. Looking around on the big space in front of me where some kids my age and their parents play happily, ignoring them, I tried looking for more and saw a man in a stand, selling something that smells so good. Holding the cloth on head with my other hand, my feet started moving on their own as I couldn't control myself anymore. Reaching the near the guy as the smell intensified, I couldn't help but swallow silently. I waited a bit for the people buying to eventually leave, and when they do and the owner turned around to get something, I moved. I slowly approached the stands and tiptoed and saw numerous long, red tasty looking food that sizzles and emits smoke and delicious smell at his stand. Seeing the owner standing up from his crouching position as he finished what he was doing, I immediately reached out and grabbed the stick that is piercing the food. Grabbing two of it, I was about to run away when something grabbed my reached out hand. Lifting my head up, I saw the owner looking at me with a narrowed eyes as he said, put it back. 
I began to feel a little panic but I steeled myself and said, no. The owner began increasing his strength on his hand as it began tightening. I said, put it back. Feeling the pain in forearm increasing, anger surged in me as I forcefully yanked my hand away from him. I said no. The owner was pulled back by me because he didn't let go and slammed at the ground after. Though because of my anger, I lost control and my other hand that's holding the cloth in my head loosened as the cloth fell off my head down to the ground. Panic immediately replaced my anger as I saw the people that that was watching us place their attention to my face. Gasp. A mutant. Dot. One of the women holding a small kid screamed as she points at me as if I'm a monster and began backing away. Half the people around then imitated her and also began screaming while the other half took out something they called phones as it flashed and they pointed at me. I immediately tried to reach for the cloth on the ground as panic was now surging in me as I know that this commotion will attract their attention and then they will find me eventually and then will bring me back. And then they will hurt me again every day and then. And then. Equals 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 equals. Do your jobs and give me your power stones already. Creator's thoughts. Moshe L. Creation is hard. Cheer me up. Like the story? Add it to the library. Have an idea for the story? Comment down. Chapter 19, Chapter 18, The Battle at the Streets 1, 13th of September, 2011, The Streets of NYC, Andrews P. O. B. Ah shit. When did all this even happen? I just wanted new clothes, for God's sake. Asterisk bang, bang, asterisk. I evaded the bullets coming out of the guns of this people as I telekinetically lifted a car at the side of the road and throws it at the damn pathetic bastards who interrupted my shopping. 5. Hurry, these guys are persistent. I shouted at Roberto who was driving the car while Kitty tend the bleeding storm at the back seat. I know, I know. Roberto shouts back. Asterisk bang, bang, asterisk. Looking at the ants still trying to catch up on us, I looked around while our car was blitzing through and my eyes just settled at the ground. A smile surfaced on my face as I peeked my bare head at the window to look at the fuckers at the back who immediately tried aiming at my exposed head. Eat this. Ha ha ha. I laughed as I focused my senses at the concrete road and using most of my strength. I pulled it up. 10. Dash dash. Flashback. 4. Looking at the scared kid with a furrowed brows, my three companions who couldn't stop control their emotions and heroic impulses immediately ran to the kid. Sigh. Are you okay, kid? Aurora immediately reached the kid while Kitty and Roberto tried shooing away the onlookers and racist fuckers. 10. Hey, hey, the onlookers tried resisting and argued but some who was knowledgeable enough was quick to recognize who Aurora was and shouted with wide eyes whoa, isn't that woman an X-man? What was her name? Storm. The other's attention was also grabbed as they focused on Aurora and us as their phones began flashing immediately. Whoa, I clenched my hand and their phones was immediately crushed into pieces as they began backing away in apprehension. 7. Roberto who saw them trying to approach them stood up and stepped forward and made his voice clear to them this is a matter of the mutant kind. So we would really appreciate it if you let us handle this and we will have no problem. Oh, wrong choice of words Berto. And as expected, the guy who seems to be the owner of the fast food stand began standing up while clutching his hand and glared at Roberto and the kid at Aurora's arms. What no problem? That muni just slammed me on the ground and now you're saying we just let that thing off? Are you out of your goddamned mind? He shouted back at us. The owner looks around and settled his gaze at those group of people that has contempt and disgusts in their eyes as they looked at us and spoke to them with raised voice. Guys, you just saw what this muni kid did to me weren't you? So what should we do? He's riling them up. This ant is starting to get on my nerves. Yes, they can't just hurt us and walk away like that. This children of the devil should be burned. One onlookers immediately replied with a smile on their face. Two. The fuck? What is this? Middle Ages? It was definitely different seeing this scene in real life than reading it in a comic panel as these guys are definitely borderline crazy. Damn sublime. Ten. Yeah, we should burn them for crushing my phone. Twelve. The others was beginning to get riled up as they now raising their voices and this in turn was starting to get more attention as the people from afar who seeing the commotion began approaching them. 1. Roberto who saw them like this, just gave up and turned to Aurora who has the kid at her arms and said, Now's the time to leave. This is getting out of hand. 2. Let's go. Kitty said, she seems flustered. We began backing away towards our car but the ants wasn't letting us go as they're following us while shouting and pumping their hands up in the air. Trying to get more people. This guy's. 1. I was ready to use my ability and stop them from following us when a bang resounded and an object moving at extreme speed appeared in my senses. My eyes widened, but wasn't concerned for myself, as I turned to my group to give them protection but I was too late. 1. Aurora was already falling with a gunshot at her abdomen while the kid was hugging her neck, scared. Ah shit. Ms. Monroe. Roberto and Kitty immediately catched her falling form, panicking. 1. My head immediately whipped to the front where the bullet came from and saw a group of people carrying guns and wearing brown battle suit coming out of black armored SUVs approaching us with cautious steps. All the stand owner and his colleagues was even faster than their relative species, dogs, as they began running in different directions while screaming, terrified. 3. Pathetic. The fuckers who I assumed as soldiers wasn't finished as they pressed something under their guns and aimed it again at us. Bang, bang, asterisk. Oakman. With a wave of my hand, I immediately conjured a force field around all of us as the bullets fell to the ground. 2. Quick. Place her on the back of the car and let's get out of here. The two was quick to respond seeing that the situation was escalating and then carried Storm who seems to be on the verge of losing consciousness with the kid. 3. The kid, though was scared, never let go of Aurora's hands as they were placed in the back of the car. Turning my attention to the soldiers, I heard one of them talking to his comms the escaped subject, 011, is saved by four mutants, one of them is Storm of the X-Men, the other is a telekinetic with the two having unknown ability, we need back. I repeat, we need back up. 2. This guy's ain't soldiers. 1. Their target seems to be the kid as they called him 011. 3. I narrowed my eyes at them and took down my invisible force field. A walkie-talkie-like object on their waist emitted a sound, probably detecting me taking down the force field. The soldiers was fast to react and was about to pull the trigger, but I was faster. I points my hands at them and muttered with an expressionless face. Push. 4. The fakes was blasted away and slammed at the different objects on their way, definitely breaking bones, and lied there. Unconscious, maybe some died. But meh. 2. I immediately climbed the car and Roberto snapped his eyes out of what I did and stomped his foot at the gas. Screech. End of flashback. Dash dash. 
Third person P.O.B. The part of the road that Andrew's group just passed, lifted off the ground, and like a mini tsunami, it blocked the sun and brought a shadow to the street. 1. The fake soldier's eyes widened and tried getting out of their cars, but was too late for some. The cement tsunami slammed down and crushed them with their cars. What the fuck? The bystanders that was just minding their day was disturbed as they saw this and immediately tried scrambling away from the huge debris that is still rolling on the streets. 1. What the fuck Andrew? Robito's exasperated shout was heard in the speeding car followed by Andrew's laughter. Ha 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 ha. 5. Dash. Ha ha ha. Andrew's laughter was interrupted as he and the group saw three cars just like what the former squished behind pulling up a few blocks away at their front. 1. Kitty began to panic as she tightly holds the kid at her side but continued putting pressure at Aurora's wound to prevent any more bleeding. WH what do we do? Ski it. Roberto immediately pressed the brake as their wheels stopped while the car slowly stopped with the wheel imprint on the ground. He looked seriously at the cars waiting for them and whipped his sweaty, nervous face to the back to check upon Aurora and settled his gaze back to Andrew who was at his side and talked, don't worry, we got this guy here. Andrew just rolled his eyes at his obvious cowardice and said no, why don't you be the one to fight them and save the day while I drive us to the mansion? Deal. Oh fuck you, come on, the teacher is bleeding out, do something. Roberto replied with a look on his face that is begging for help. Okay okay, let's go, hit that gas and leave the rest to me. Andrew replied with a confident look on his then cracked his knuckles as if he was even gonna use them. 2. Roberto da Costa nodded firmly with his eyes full of trust that just brought laugh inside Andrew as he hits the gas and went full speed. The wannabe soldiers inside two of the cars that saw their targets coming at them seemingly without an ounce of fear climbed down their cars while one soldier carried down with him a freaking missile launcher. Andrew and Robert's eyes who saw that soldier carrying that thing widened but the latter narrowed his eyes and began concentrating his ability. 1. The fake soldier carrying the missile launcher focused his aim accurately and pulled the trigger. 2. The missile left its launcher with a burst of flames and speed and sped through the trajectory of the mutant's car. Andrew who was looking at this people trying so hard just to stop him even if it's futile couldn't help but feel something awakening inside him. 2. Something that he lost. Something, sleeping. Something like, a predator. 24. A small smile once again surfaced Andrew's face seeing their futile efforts, the smile elevates and became a full-blown grin as he points his hands towards the incoming missile. 5. Roberto, Kitty, and Tom couldn't help but close their eyes in instinct and waited for the inevitable. 1. 1. 2. 3. Seconds passed but the three didn't receive their expected outcome as they opened their eyes and looked at the front. There, they found the missile hovering about three meters away from their car, still emitting flames for propulsion at its butt. They slowly turned their, their eyes to Andrew who is sporting a smile on his face with a hand in the air, then they saw him waves the said hand to the front and the missile that was about blow them to pieces began turning around. Its tip points to where it came from. All the eyes of the fake soldiers outside their cars and the ones inside the one car widened as they began scrambling to get out of the way but they found their bodies not responding, as if something is preventing them. Andrew's hand that is in a horizontal position fell down as the missile moved towards the soldiers. Hey, hey, Andrew, you can't do that. That is against what we are fighting for. Kitty immediately said seeing this but she was ignored. Tom, the kid's eyes glinted in amazement at this scene and tried hard not to blink lest he missed it. Roberto didn't talk and just looked at the inevitable with unblinking eyes. The missile finally reached the three cars and the fake soldiers and exploded. 7. Asterisk boom, asterisk. Crash, dash. Phil Carlson slammed the door open as he immediately proceeded to stand at front of the director who almost shitted his pants in shock. What the fuck, Carlson? He shouted with eyes that promised pain. Sir, I am very sorry, but this is important. Nick Fury took a deep breath to calm his fury and said this better worth it. Proceed. Carlson puts the tablet he is holding to the Fury to show something and said a battle between mutants with an X-Man or Oro Monroe also known as Storm vs an unknown group just happened at the NYC with the end result of the unknown group being sandwiched between the road. 1. He then slides the pictures and showed the director the state of the street. Fury's brows furrowed as he looked at the state and said inquiringly this. What is this? The whole street was overturned. What the fuck is this? Was that old magnetic also involved? 1. No, director, apparently this started with a mutant kid who tried stealing and was caught, and when the bystanders saw that the kid was mutant, X-Man Storm, and what we assume to be students of Xavier appeared and saved the kid. And that's when this unknown group of people carrying high-level artillery appeared and began shooting at them. What do you mean unknown? You can't find anything out of them. Fury, who is a control freak and always wants to know anyone, smiled scarily what prompted Carlson to gulp. 1. W well, as of now, the team is currently trying their best to find out anything about them. You better be. E.E.R., one more thing director. Fury glared at him but then nodded. Carlson took this opportunity to slide the picture once more and in it, Andrew's face was as clear the sun. Who the fuck is that? Fury inquired, starting to lose his patience with all this shit. This, director is Andrew Detmer, the kid who destroyed Seattle and died. At that Fury immediately stood up from his chair at the realization and said continue. This was the kid whose body was missing after his battle with his cousin and we couldn't find, it turns out, he's still alive and kicking and was now under the care of Xavier's institute. Carlson continued with a serious expression on his face and he was also along with Storm when this battle ensued. What do we do sir? 5. Fury took a deep breath to compose himself and said seriously they should be at the mansion now. Prepare the team. Why sir? We're going to steal a lollipop away from that psychic baldy. 18. Equals 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 equals. Yesterday, someone insulted this poor me. And I made him pay me stones for compensation for emotional damage but he dares not give it so I chopped his body and dumped him in the garbage. 6. So, ladies and gentlemen and me and all those who identify as a water jug and microwave. Would you be so kind to give me stones? Pretty please. 29. Help us reach 1000 power stones today and I'll post tomorrow okay? Okay. 6. Chapter 20, Chapter 19, Argument. A slash N, I'm so sorry for the late upload. Just got caught up with something. Bonus chapter as promised. Equals 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 equals. 13th of September, 2011. Degree unknown place degree. Third person P.O.B. In a room filled with chairs aligned in an organized manner, numerous kids sat on it, their feet and hands strapped so tightly with cables that it's wounding them, drops of blood dripping sadly. Arc the girl about 7 to 8 years old screamed her lungs out out of pain as tears and snot painted her face. P please. And no M more. Hick. 
Pee please. The girl pleaded to the woman in front of her in despair as the pain she's feeling was unimaginable for a kid her age. The woman in front of the despairing kid was bald and was wearing a sleeveless gray shirt exposing her tanned arms filled with old scars and a white mask that sported a hole for all her facial orifices. The woman is currently holding a clippers as she locked it to the remaining nails of the kid in front of her. And no. Pee please. And no more. The kid who saw that the woman aren't stopping pleaded again, but just like before, her cry for help was unanswered. The other kids that is about the same age as the little girl had tears in their eyes as it flowed to the tape covering their mouth. Despair and hopelessness was also present in their eyes. Some of them have families that accepted them but that was taken away from them when this woman took them. While some of them lived on the streets, being a mutant is hard as they were disowned by their own family, living by the dead rats and trash their hands could find every day. Muffled screaming. They closed their eyes for how many times as the accursed woman pulled the clippers attached to the nail of the little girl. Scream more. Hee <laughs> hee. Scream. The woman spoke, her voice carrying a tinge of craziness and unwavering hate for the creatures in front of her. Scream. 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 Ha ha ha. Her normal muttering turned to full-blown crazy laugh as she pulled a machete on her waist and sliced the head of the little girl off of its body. Asterisk muffled screaming. Asterisk. The other kids struggled fiercely on their chair, bound, but all struggle was futile as this only tightened the cable's hold on them which in turn dig deeper and deeper upon their flesh. The woman was about to continue her favorite hobby when the door to the room opened and a tall fat man appeared, wearing red priest clothes. If Ronnie Sinclair was here, she would recognize the man as the priest and man who she admired for all her life but betrayed her and gave her the W scar, Craig Sinclair. Leper Queen, we had a problem. He spoke with a calm voice not minding the scene he has faced. There is even glint of pleasure in his eyes as he relished in the despairs and cries of the kids. What? Eyes. It. The woman now known as Leper Queen punctuated his sentence in suppressed anger for his holy work was interrupted. Some muty kids managed to escape their cages and one was saved by none other than the group of devil spawns, X-Men. Craig Sinclair spoke while gritting his teeth, not liking that he was even uttering the accursed title of those children of the devil. What did you say? The Leper Queen took a deep breath and then continued we can't do anything about that anymore. We need to change face. And find out who's responsible for letting those cancer go. I'll deal with them. She thought for a moment and then looked back to the kids behind her. Her eyes narrowed as she saw some of the chairs not having owners and TCH'd as if annoyed and turned to the wannabe priest again after doing that. Go instruct some of our men who are looking for this dogs to double up their efforts and fill up all these sets. We can't let this cancers continue polluting our precious world and constantly infecting our fellow kin. We will not let them, we will hunt them, and we will exterminate them down their last blood. For we are the friends of humanity. After finishing that sentence with a smile, the leper queen lost her mood to continue and left the room along with Craig Sinclair who was also smiling as the light inside the room was turned off, bringing no light at all inside the room aside from the ones that squeezed through the gaps of the door. Dash dash. Degree X mansion degree. Andrews P.O.B. We managed to reach the mansion unimpeded and without anyone following us anymore. Kitty didn't talk the whole ride. She seems affected seeing so many people die. Or maybe she does not like that fact that I just killed so many people and ignored her trying to recite their moral codes to me. I don't know that I don't care. Roberto though, on the other hand, was chill and was actually asking me if he can do what I just did while the kid who I learned the name was Tom seems to have been awestruck by what I did and also began asking me questions. We arrived 20 minutes later, faster than before as Roberto was breaking speed limit after limit on the road. Exiting out of the car, I opened the door at the back seat and lifted Aurora from Kitty's arms while applying pressure at her wound using telekinesis to stop the bleeding as we made our way inside the mansion. The new mutants gathering outside first saw us and immediately rushed to us. All of their faces paled seeing Aurora's condition as Danny inquired worriedly what happened? Why is Ms. Monroe bleeding? She was shot. Roberto replied. Let's talk later, we need to bring her to Mr. McCoy. Kitty said as we continued running inside. A-H-H, teacher. The kids playing at the yard immediately screamed seeing one of their favorite teacher bleeding and began following us from behind. Along the way, we passed Scott and Jean as they also followed us. We made our way to the basement where the medical room resides and spotted Hank there tinkering at his tools. Hank's lifted his head and was shocked seeing us but got on professional mode immediately and moved. Put her here. And points at the bed at the side. I turned to Roberto to signal him. He turned around and saw the kids who followed us and immediately said okay, buddies, teacher Aurora is going to be okay, so give us a space here. After the kids left, Charles and the rest came in immediately and began inquiring. We were attacked by what seems to be soldiers and persistently followed us along the way, but we managed to leave them behind. I answered Colossus who asked, do you know why they did that? Kurt asked, his usual jolly attitude nowhere to be seen. Kitty shook her head as an answer and the rest fell in a deafening silence. Charles's brows furrowed and seems to be confused and after a while, he turned his attention to me. You killed them all. He asked with a shocked look on his face. The rest focused their attention to me and Charles after hearing this. What do you want me to do? Let them follow us till we get here. I asked him with a bra expression on my face. That's not what I meant. With your ability you could have stopped them right there without unnecessary bloodshed. Do you know how can this affect our always hanging by the edge reputation he tried to reason? Can this guy hear himself right now? They were shooting missiles at us heavy breathing. I can't deal with this right now. I gave up as this conversation will not go anywhere. I'll just change clothes. While Hank was focused as he immediately cut Aurora's clothes on the part of her abdomen and began tending the unconscious storm. Seeing this, I walked out of the room but I heard some of them inquiring to Kitty and Roberto what really happened, about why there was missile, that conversation wasn't my problem as I strolled through the long corridor, going towards my room. It's really hard living with hypocrite people thinking themselves to be righteous and clean when that Baldy himself did some things that will bring chills on a normal person. Heck, there even seems to have been a comic issue where he killed his own sister because of her potential power. Like what the fuck? Opening the door to my room, I saw Pyro, who as usual was lying on his bed, reading. His eyes drifted to my clothes as he immediately shot up. What the heck happened to you? This guy actually don't know anything that happened. How shut in is this guy? Aurora was shot. I casually replied. What? And then, we were pursued by those who shot her. I trailed off. And then, he asked again. We were cornered. And then, they shot a. Bro what happened? Complete what you're saying. Pyro had an annoyed face as he shouts at me. Then I killed them. The end. I opened the drawer and took a new pair of hoodie, collar black. Oh my new clothes still in the car. Should I go get it? Nah I'll just fetch it later. 
removing the gray bloodied hoodie on me, I stood up and looked at the body-sized mirror hanging at the wall and couldn't help but flex a bit. My body has definitely improved, going from my pre-Captain America type body to this lean but still packed with muscle cut body. I love you body manipulation. Pyro scrunched his face seeing me flexing in front of the mirror. Yeah jealous. I asked smugly. Fuck no. He replied, but I know he's jealous. Ha ha ha. Dash. Ten minutes later. Sitting at the couch at the living room along with Pyro, Ileana appeared at the corridor. She seems to have just woken up, evident of the morning glory by her eyes. She approached us while removing it with her fingers and sat at the chair beside the couch. What did you do? She asked casually. This girl's always so direct. What? I feigned innocence. I heard Scott talking something about you being ruthless and shit. What is this about? She asked again. Just like what I already told Johnny here, I just killed the guys who was pursuing. Not a big deal. I yawned. This day is so long, can it get any longer? Ileana seems interested as she puts her legs right on top of the other and crossed her arms under her bust. How? Tell me the details. Damn. She looks hot in that position not gonna lie. Pyro chuckled at her seeing her like this while I also did the same, but I entertained her not so bad interest well. After hearing my great adventure, I swear I saw her eyes twinkling as if enthralled as she stood up from her seat and shooed Pyro who was beside me and sat at his previous position. Pyro shook his head at this and sat at the chair where Ileana once sat at while muttering something about him being a third wheel. My face couldn't help but back away a little as Ileana's face inches away from it, staring at me intensely with her blue eyes. Damn girl, chill up. Don't forget to bring me along to this great adventures next time. The crazy girl spoke with unwavering determination. What do you think of yourself? Some sort of viking? I looked at her eyes and my eyes wandered at her full lips. I stared for full five seconds but I managed to snap out of it as I replied to her. Are you sure? She nodded without hesitation. She's really determined, huh? Okay, how about this? We will let things cool down and when the incident is all forgotten and shit, we will find the rest of those who attacked us and haunt them. I replied to her with a smile. She immediately nodded and smiled contentedly but then asked promise? Is she a kid? Ah, uh, okay, I promise. I replied to her. Cringe. Pyro at the side decided to be a bitch and said with a disgusted face. I gave him the middle finger as he laughed while Ileana also smiled. I then nudged the kid at my other side who has some kind of technopathy to change the channel himself to lighten the mood. The kid issued a TCH but complied and then blinked as the TV began shifting through different channels. I stopped him at the news channel and saw a reporter, at the scene where he overturned the road, reporting. We are now at the streets of New York and we can see the road overturned. According to some this was a work of group of mutants and an unknown group of people carrying high caliber weapons the female reporter reported and then approached a bystander at the side and began asking him if he witnessed the event. Staring for a while, a click resounded in my mind as I realized something and couldn't help but facepalm. Fuck. My face was definitely captured by some camera there at the streets, and knowing those secret organizations power over technology, they may already know who I am. Oh fuck. This is troublesome. Equals 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 equals. I would assume you already know the drill, right? I'm not gonna make this long. Give me your stones. Equals 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 equals. Chapter 20, Chapter 19, Argument. A slash N, I'm so sorry for the late upload. Just got caught up with something. Bonus chapter as promised. Equals 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 equals. 13th of September, 2011. Degree unknown place degree. 1. Third person P.O.B. In a room filled with chairs aligned in an organized manner, numerous kids sat on it, their feet and hands strapped so tightly with cables that it's wounding them, drops of blood dripping sadly. Arc a girl about seven to eight years old screamed her lungs out out of pain as tears and snot painted her face. P please. And no M more. Pick. P please. The girl pleaded to the woman in front of her in despair as the pain she's feeling was unimaginable for a kid her age. The woman in front of the despairing kid was bald and was wearing a sleeveless gray shirt exposing her tanned arms filled with old scars and a white mask that sported a hole for all her facial orifices. The woman is currently holding a clippers as she locked it to the remaining nails of the kid in front of her. And no. P please. And no more. The kid who saw that the woman aren't stopping pleaded again, but just like before, her cry for help was unanswered. The other kids that is about the same age as the little girl had tears in their eyes as it flowed to the tape covering their mouth. Despair and hopelessness was also present in their eyes. Some of them have families that accepted them but that was taken away from them when this woman took them. While some of them lived on the streets, being a mutant is hard as they were disowned by their own family, living by the dead rats and trash their hands could find every day. Muffled screaming. They closed their eyes for how many times as the accursed woman pulled the clippers attached to the nail of the little girl. Scream more. Hee <laughs> hee. Scream. The woman spoke, her voice carrying a tinge of craziness and unwavering hate for the creatures in front of her. Two. Scream. 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 Ha ha ha. Her normal muttering turned to full-blown crazy laugh as she pulled a machete on her waist and sliced the head of the little girl off of its body. Thirteen. Asterisk muffled screaming. Asterisk. The other kids struggles fiercely on their chair, bound, but all struggle was futile as this only tightened the cable's hold on them which in turn dig deeper and deeper upon their flesh. The woman was about to continue her favorite hobby when the door to the room opened and a tall fat man appeared, wearing red priest clothes. If Ronnie Sinclair was here, she would recognize the man as the priest and man who she admired for all her life but betrayed her and gave her the W scar, Craig Sinclair. Leper Queen, we had a problem. He spoke with a calm voice not minding the scene he is faced. There is even glint of pleasure in his eyes as he relished in the despairs and cries of the kids. What? Eyes. It. The woman now known as Leper Queen punctuated his sentence in suppressed anger for his holy work was interrupted. 1. Some muty kids managed to escape their cages and one was saved by none other than the group of devil spawns, X-Men. Craig Sinclair spoke while gritting his teeth, not liking that he was even uttering the accursed title of those children of the devil. What did you say? The Leper Queen took a deep breath and then continued we can't do anything about that anymore, we need to change base. And find out who's responsible for letting those cancer go, I'll deal with them. She thought for a moment and then looked back to the kids behind her. Her eyes narrowed as she saw some of the chairs not having owners and TCH'd as if annoyed and turned to the wannabe priest again after doing that. Go instruct some of our men who are looking for this dogs to double up their efforts and fill up all these sets. We can't let this cancers continue polluting our precious world and constantly infecting our fellow kin. We will not let them, we will hunt them, and we will exterminate them down their last blood. For we are the friends of humanity. 16. 
After finishing that sentence with a smile, the Leper Queen lost her mood to continue and left the room along with Craig Sinclair who was also smiling as the light inside the room was turned off, bringing no light at all inside the room aside from the ones that squeezed through the gaps of the door. Dash dash. Degree X Mansion Degree. Andrews P.O.V. We managed to reach the mansion unimpeded and without anyone following us anymore. Kitty didn't talk the whole ride. She seems affected seeing so many people die. Or maybe she does not like that fact that I just killed so many people and ignored her trying to recite their moral codes to me. I don't know that I don't care. Roberto though, on the other hand, was chill and was actually asking me if he can do what I just did while the kid who I learned the name was Tom seems to have been awestruck by what I did and also began asking me questions. We arrived 20 minutes later, faster than before as Roberto was breaking speed limit after limit on the road. Exiting out of the car, I opened the door at the back seat and lifted Aurora from Kitty's arms while applying pressure at her wound using telekinesis to stop the bleeding as we made our way inside the mansion. The new mutants gathering outside first saw us and immediately rushed to us. All of their faces paled seeing Aurora's condition as Danny inquired worriedly what happened? Why is Ms. Monroe bleeding? She was shot. Roberto replied. Let's talk later, we need to bring her to Mr. McCoy. Kitty said as we continued running inside. A-H-H, teacher. The kids playing at the yard immediately screamed seeing one of their favorite teacher bleeding and began following us from behind. Along the way, we passed Scott and Jean as they also followed us. We made our way to the basement where the medical room resides and spotted Hank there tinkering at his tools. Hank's lifted his head and was shocked seeing us but got on professional mode immediately and moved. Put her here. And points at the bed at the side. I turned to Roberto to signal him. He turned around and saw the kids who followed us and immediately said okay, buddies, teacher Aurora is going to be okay, so give us a space here. After the kids left, Charles and the rest came in immediately and began inquiring. We were attacked by what seems to be soldiers and persistently followed us along the way, but we managed to leave them behind. I answered Colossus who asked, do you know why they did that? Kurt asked, his usual jolly attitude nowhere to be seen. Kitty shook her head as an answer and the rest fell in a deafening silence. Charles's brows furrowed and seems to be confused and after a while, he turned his attention to me. You killed them all. He asked with a shocked look on his face. The rest focused their attention to me and Charles after hearing this. What do you want me to do? Let them follow us till we get here. I asked him with a bra expression on my face. 7. That's not what I meant. With your ability you could have stopped them right there without unnecessary bloodshed. Do you know how can this affect our always hanging by the edge reputation he tried to reason? 5. Can this guy hear himself right now? They were shooting missiles at us heavy breathing. I can't deal with this right now. I gave up as this conversation will not go anywhere. I'll just change clothes. 4. While Hank was focused as he immediately cut Aurora's clothes on the part of her abdomen and began tending the unconscious storm. Seeing this, I walked out of the room but I heard some of them inquiring to Kitty and Roberto what really happened, about why there was missile, that conversation wasn't my problem as I strolled through the long corridor, going towards my room. It's really hard living with hypocrite people thinking themselves to be righteous and clean when that baldy himself did some things that will bring chills on a normal person. Heck, there even seems to have been a comic issue where he killed his own sister because of her potential power. 30. Like what the fuck? Opening the door to my room, I saw Pyro, who as usual was lying on his bed, reading. His eyes drifted to my clothes as he immediately shot up. What the heck happened to you? This guy actually don't know anything that happened. How shut in is this guy? Aurora was shot. I casually replied. What? And then, we were pursued by those who shot her. I trailed off. And then, he asked again. We were cornered. And then, they shot a. Bro what happened? Complete what you're saying. Pyro had an annoyed face as he shouts at me. Then I killed them. The end. I opened the drawer and took a new pair of hoodie, color black. Oh my new clothes still in the car. Should I go get it? Nah I'll just fetch it later. Removing the grey bloodied hoodie on me, I stood up and looked at the body sized mirror hanging at the wall and couldn't help but flex a bit. My body has definitely improved, going from my pre-Captain America type body to this lean but still packed with muscle cut body. I love you body manipulation. Pyro scrunched his face seeing me flexing in front of the mirror. Yeah jealous. I asked smugly. Five. Fuck no. He replied, but I know he's jealous. Ha ha ha. Dash. Ten minutes later. Sitting at the couch at the living room along with Pyro, Ileana appeared at the corridor, she seems to have just woken up, evident of the morning glory by her eyes. She approached us while removing it with her fingers and sat at the chair beside the couch. What did you do? She asked casually. This girl's always so direct. What? I feigned innocence. I heard Scott talking something about you being ruthless and shit, what is this about? She asked again. Just like what I already told Johnny here, I just killed the guys who was pursuing, not a big deal. I yawned. This day is so long, can it get any longer? Ileana seems interested as she puts her legs right on top of the other and crossed her arms under her bust. How? Tell me the details. Damn. She looks hot in that position not gonna lie. 6. Pyro chuckled at her seeing her like this while I also did the same, but I entertained her not so bad interest well. 1. After hearing my great adventure, I swear I saw her eyes twinkling as if enthralled as she stood up from her seat and shooed Pyro who was beside me and sat at his previous position. Pyro shook his head at this and sat at the chair where Ileana once sat at while muttering something about him being a third wheel. My face couldn't help but back away a little as Ileana's face inches away from it, staring at me intensely with her blue eyes. Damn girl, chill up. Don't forget to bring me along to this great adventures next time. The crazy girl spoke with unwavering determination. 4. What do you think of yourself? Some sort of viking? 1. I looked at her eyes and my eyes wandered at her full lips, I stared for full 5 seconds but I managed to snap out of it as I replied to her. Are you sure? She nodded without hesitation. She's really determined, huh? Okay, how about this, we will let things cool down and when the incident is all forgotten and shit, we will find the rest of those who attacked us and haunt them. I replied to her with a smile. She immediately nodded and smiled contentedly but then asked promise? Is she a kid? Uh, okay, I promise. I replied to her. Cringe. Pyro at the side decided to be a bitch and said with a disgusted face. 5. I gave him the middle finger as he laughed while Ileana also smiled. I then nudged the kid at my other side who has some kind of technopathy to change the channel himself to lighten the mood. 
5. The kid issued a TCH but complied and then blinked as the TV began shifting through different channels. I stopped him at the news channel and saw a reporter, at the scene where he overturned the road, reporting. We are now at the streets of New York and we can see the road overturned. According to some this was a work of group of mutants and an unknown group of people carrying high caliber weapons the female reporter reported and then approached a bystander at the side and began asking him if he witnessed the event. Staring for a while, a click resounded in my mind as I realized something and couldn't help but facepalm. Fuck. My face was definitely captured by some camera there at the streets, and knowing those secret organizations power over technology, they may already know who I am. 1. Oh fuck. This is troublesome. 11. Equals 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 equals. I would assume you already know the drill, right? I'm not gonna make this long. Give me your stones. 15. Equals 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 equals. Chapter 21. Chapter 20. Visitors. Last chapter for the week. Enjoy. Equals 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 equals. 13th of September, 2011. Degree X Mansion Degree. Andrews P.O.V. Looking at the report on the TV, I realized that all sorts of organizations, ranging from the undying Hydra to the global spy S.H.I.E.L.D. must have already seen me from the scene me and realized that I was that dude that killed lots of people in that city. Shit, 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 they're coming aren't they? Damn, there goes my plan to stay hidden till I'm strong enough. 6. I just wanted to relax for God's sake. HSSSS, take a deep breath, Andrew. Think a plan. While I am confident in my current abilities right now, I am still not sure what trump cards does the government holds. For all I know they may be hiding the golden freaking sentry or worse. Blue Marvel. Fuck. 9. Okay calm down. Dash dash. Charles Xavier P. O. B. Looking at Aurora lying on the bed with a gunshot wound on her abdomen, I felt anger rising within me but I quickly suppressed this negative thought since they're not gonna help me in this situation. Though according to Mr. Detmer, the ones who attacked them seems to be soldiers, but I can't believe it. I have been in good terms with some high officials of the government and even the president himself so there's no way they would just attack us out of nowhere. I couldn't stop my curiosity as I found myself activating my ability and shuffling through the memories of the kid named Tom that they brought with them and watching what they really faced. I couldn't help but frown as I watched Mr. Detmer telekinetically lifting the whole road that they just passed and smashing that said road to their pursuers. Some of those managed to escape that man-made disaster but most was squashed and smashed inside their cars ruthlessly. Mr. Detmer is merciless. 5. And then at the end I saw how he returned the missile to their enemies without through the memories of Mr. DaCosta. Mr. Detmer was smiling pulling back my telepathy from their minds. I got into an argument with Mr. Detmer regarding what he just did but he was adamant in his opinion and seems won't want to listen to others. For him, it was kill or to be killed. 4. This line of thought of his is dangerous and I have only encountered this kind of mindset in those who have rejected and discarded their own morality. 7. And one question bugged me seeing him like that, was the Andrew that he have shown us for the past two months only a front to hide his true nature? Or is he brewing a deeper and sinister plot in that empty mind of his? 1. But in the end, saying I was disappointed to what he had done was truly an understatement as I have never seen someone with that kind of smile plastered on their face while they take a life out of someone. It was like, he was enjoying it. 3. I had mistakenly thought that he had changed, but no, with him like this, he's not just a danger to those who attack them, but also to us, and I have to do something about that. 14. Dash dash. Third person P. O. B. 1. All the students of the institute was now gathering at the living as Charles Xavier, their beloved professor, called for them. He reached out to all their minds that he has an announcement to make regarding the state of condition of their female teacher, Ororo. 2. All the students, from kids to teenagers murmured and whispered to each other with a concerned look on their faces. Hank and Alex revealed themselves from the corridor, walking, along with Peter Rasputin and the beloved principal of their school. Alex Summers sported a solemn look on his face as he faced the gathering students, who now was feeling their hearts sinking from worry after seeing his serious look. Huh? Kitty who arrived with Hank rolled her eyes and clapped her hands to take the students' attention. Seeing them looking at her, she spoke, Don't worry guys, Ms. Ororo is safe and that will continue since she's now here. Don't believe this guy, he's just messing with you all. TCH Alex clicked his town view in mock annoyance but smiled after seeing the relief wash over the faces of the kids. Thank God. The students all expressed their relief in their own ways as the worry all left their faces. You will also be able to meet the new student but later, because as of now, he's taking a rest along with Ms. Ororo. Be sure to be nice with him okay. Hank McCoy spoke as the kids all nodded with a smile on their faces, clearly excited at meeting and having a new friend. Now now, since it has been a long day for all of us, I have decided to give you all the rest of the day to rest and calm your exhausted minds. No classes for today. You can all go now Charles Xavier who felt the fatigued minds of his precious students decided to double their happiness with a smile. Yay. The students, specifically the younger ones, immediately stood up and shouted in ecstasy as they all began scramble away, about to do their own things. The older students like Scott, Bobby, Jean, and the others also smiled seeing them like this, feeling their exhausted minds rejuvenate just seeing the little gremlins' genuine smiles. But their smiles didn't stay long on their faces as one of the kids who happened to look at the window exclaimed as he pointed at the window wow, look, we have visitors. Andrew who was sitting peacefully on the couch perked up after hearing the kid as a wry smile made its way on his face as he sighed. All the attention of the people in the room was grabbed as they collectively made their way to the windows to take a look. In the green grounds of the properties of the Xavier family, numerous black SUVs drove in a straight line entering the gates of the mansion as it opened automatically. Whoosh. Screech. The SUVs quickly reached the forefront of the majestic mansion as they all spread all over the big space. All its doors opened in a rhythmic manner as numerous people in a three-piece suit climbed down as they all quickly moved and formed an organized formation. The last car that still hasn't opened its door, opened, as a black man in a thick black trench coat, wearing a black eye patch, climbed down and revealed all his balding glory. He is accompanied by another man who also climbed down and stood by his side. Charles Xavier who also took a look at the windows furrowed his brow seeing Nick Fury and his trusted agent Phil Cowlson. 1. He controlled his wheelchair to turn around and move towards the exit as the rest also followed him curiously, but also cautious towards the gate crashers. Andrew yawned after seeing the director of the top global spy organization and began cracking his knuckles as he also followed them to the outside while grabbing a bowl of nuts along the way. 10. Dash. Outside. Old friend, what brings you to our humble abode? 
Charles Xavier smiled as he got outside and immediately greets his longtime friend. Oh please, Charles, this place is no humble, it still amazes every time I go here and see this place. Fury began a greeting while also responding with a smile. One, ho ho, that I am really proud of. Charles stroked his chin as if he's a great sage but then his face serious as he continued with but I'm pretty sure you didn't come here bringing a whole battalion of your agents just to admire our home, right? Well, I am not gonna beat around the bush anymore. Ahem. Fury also got serious as he coughed and spoke with high voice for everyone to hear him we're the Strategic Homeland Intervention, Enforcement, and Logistics Division or S.H.I.E.L.D for short and for context, we deal with global safety, and the reason for our visit here is related to global safety once again. We are here for one of your students, named Andrew Detmer. We believe that he has contacted something that will endanger not only our country, but this whole planet, too. So if you would be so kind to hand him peacefully, then we will have no further problem. We will just take him, cuff him and we will immediately go away. But if you resist to hand him over, then you will leave us no choice. At that sentence, Fury's look took on an edge as he signals his men subtly. He knows how dangerous Charles Xavier can be and the mutants themselves. He also knows that the professor is always sensitive when it comes to his students so before coming here, he brought with him his own version of the mutant containment unit who blended within his normal agents. They brought with them shotguns that releases high voltage that induces paralysis to a mutant and human alike and the mutant inhibitor collar that the Trask Industries just recently produced for the government. All the students like Scott, Bobby, Rogue and the new mutants' face was full of confusion hearing what the guy, wearing such thick clothes in middle of the hot day, just said, as they all, began turning their heads to look at Andrew who was nonchalantly munching on some peanuts inside the small container he's holding. Munch munch. 2. Jean's eyebrows furrowed as she saw what this agents brought with them through their memories and was about to confront them regarding this when the next sentence of Xavier shocked not only her but the whole student body, teachers, and even Fury himself. Sigh. With all the things that has happened, Charles Xavier took on a defeated expression and looks as if he was about to make the biggest decision of his life you can get what you came for. All the students' eyes widened hearing his words as they turned to him with a face full of unbelief and shock. W8 professor? What are you saying? You can't just give Andrew to this guys like that. W what is this? Ronnie immediately voiced out her thoughts as she took a step towards the professor. Why yes, you can't just do that. Sam also said as the rest of the new mutants immediately also followed as all of them voiced their thoughts with the exception of Ileana who was just narrowing her eyes. What the fuck is happening now? Pyro himself muttered to himself as he also narrowed his eyes. Andrew on the other hand stops eating his favorite snack with one eyebrow raised in genuine surprise hearing what Charles just said. He was surprised by the fact that this man, Charles Xavier, who had almost spent his entire life just to protect his fellow mutants, would just give him to them like this, most probably knowing the fact what this man in his front will do to him. 1. He thought about different reasons and ideas in his head at the same time to come up with an answer but all he got was the fact that his morals contradicts and opposes the teachings of the Baldi. He also connected the fact that maybe his past history as the deranged murderer from Seattle was also the catalyst that made him give up on him. 1. Maybe my acting has dulled. Andrew thought curiously as he was pretty sure that he had been pretty good and was actively socializing with everyone for the past two months that he had actually even shown some genuine feelings here and there. 9. Andrew's thoughts were interrupted when something tugged slightly at his clothes. Looking down, he saw a little girl the age of eight. This girl was one of those mutants who was abandoned by their parents and became homeless but fortunately encountered the wandering kitty and was brought to the mansion. This girl was one of those kids that Andrew has chosen to actively interact with as will play with them in the yard and will make them fly with his telekinesis which was always their favorite as they would laugh and smile happily. The little girl looked up at Andrew with her big, bright eyes that was now dimmer as it held glimmer of sadness within them. She spoke are you leaving us? Are you not going to come back? But how will I be able to fly again? 2. The kids the same her age also walked near Andrew as they also looked up at him, the invisible kid that was saved by Andrew in the Scott incident was also among them as he also spoke yes, Sarah's right, how will we be able to fly around if you go away? Please don't leave us. Unknowingly, tears glistened on the kid's eyes, but since he's invisible permanently, they can't see it. Andrew can feel that the kid was about to cry along with the little girl named Sarah and the others so he immediately smiled, genuinely, as he ruffled and messed their hairs and crouched down their level and spoke with rare gentleness. Don't worry, even when I'm gone, you have Miss Jean here, she just always looks serious but if you ask her, she will also play with you and she can also do the things I can do, so cheer up. 1. Even though merging with Andrew Detmer has almost wiped away his morals and value for normal life forms, it didn't manage to remove his innate fondness for pure creatures such as children. Children are one of the purest and most innocent life you can find in all creation, so even though he's mostly always acting when interacting with the people here, his genuine feelings are always brought outside the moment he plays with his kids. Their laugh, their smiles, their cries when they accidentally tripped, all of that brings out his hidden emotion. 17. Charles Xavier sighed as a complicated look appeared in his eyes as he looks at the scene in front of him, but he steeled his useless balls as he spoke with a solemn look I don't really want to do this. But, you all need to know the truth. 6. At that sentence, amazingly vast shinnik energy surged out of him and spreads to the whole crowd of students and teachers alike. 11. Equals 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 equals. A slash n. I can't think of any threat for now. So, can you give me stones, please? 6. Equals 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 equals. Chapter 22. Chapter 21. Confrontation. 13th of September, 2011. Degree X Mansion Degree. Andrews P.O.V. My senses picked up Charles's vast amount of psychic energy as it ridiculously oozed out of him in an incredible amount and power. Truly an Omega level telepath. Unfortunately, the user was undeserving of such a magnificent power. My amazement and disappointment at the same time was cut short as I began to wonder what this Baldi is planning to do. Though, I got my answer a while later. Most of the students' facial expressions began changing and after a while, most of them settled with a frowning and some with betrayed expressions. With a simple use of my telepathy, I shuffled through what they just experienced and couldn't help but roll my eyes. I turned my gaze lazily to the bald dumbbells and asked with a slight smile what's with all this animosity. Charles. Scott who was frowning for a while now took a step forward and shouted in an accusatory tone you're actually a murderer. H how could you just kill that innocent people at Seattle like they're nothing? Why you? Dash dash. 
Third person P.O.V. Scott Summers' righteous speech was cut short as Danny also voiced out her opinion that surprised them I am sure that Andrew didn't mean to hurt those people. He was just confused and scared just like the rest of us when we awaken our powers. Andrew raised an eyebrow at her, a bit surprised that she would actually still defend him. Truly a hero in the making. The other new mutants also has understanding and trustful look on their faces, agreeing with Donnie's opinion while the rest of the students like Bobby, Kitty, and the rest has a complicated visage. Since they don't really know Andrew that much, they can't give their honest opinions, but what Charles made them watch through his telepathy are starting to affect their mindset and was beginning to lean to the possibility of Andrew really being dangerous. What Charles transferred to their minds are his memories when he watched the footage of Andrew fighting his cousin, Matt, in Seattle as the former destroyed uncountable public properties and reaped numerous lives in the process like it's nothing. Charles's plan was as simple as it can. He would give them the footage of the fight and after all the doubts that will begin breeding in their minds like a locusts. Charles will use these doubts and transmit suggestions to their minds to sway them more against Andrew. Though, what he is doing is technically wrong and was leaving a bad taste inside him for manipulating them like this. Charles still steeled through his plan as he knows that this is for the greater good of them and having Andrew any more further around them will only make him worry as he don't know what's running through his mind, literally, which is one of the reason for him antagonizing Andrew, not that he would admit that. Charles Xavier controlled his wheelchair to move forward for a bit as he still sported that defeated but determined look on his face Andrew. This is hard for me, for us, but for the safety of the students. Please go with them. For the sake of the kids, Charles tried to use the fact that Andrew genuinely likes the kids to sway his mind but he was wrong about one thing. While Andrew was fond of such pure and innocent creatures and appreciates them truly, one thing was sure that he wouldn't let this kinds of emotions intervene when it's necessary and would even butcher his kids if he somehow find himself fighting for his very life. So please, Andrew, surrender to them and I can assure you that they won't do anything harmful to you if you just cooperate. Charles continues with a soft tone and then telepathically communicates with Fury. Fury who heard Charles signaled his men to prepare for any situation that may unfold right now. Andrew brought his hands to his hair as he ruffles it and couldn't help as a smile appeared on his face you're so paranoid Charles, but... Surprise surprise, you're actually not wrong this time. At that Andrew began walking ahead of the group of students as he was three meters away. He turned back and said to the group it was nice meeting you all. He turned fury I don't want to go with you so. Bye I guess. Saying that, he began levitating from the ground and was about to fly away when a bang resounded. His reaction that has been surprisingly enhanced passively by his parallel processing, that has also been progressing nicely for the past two months, made him react quickly. He whipped his head to the direction of the agents and saw one of them with his gun pointed at him as an object came out of it. The object was definitely not a bullet as the thing was abnormally large and it was circle shaped and was emitting sparks of electricity. He looks at this calmly and didn't put up a force field whatsoever. The bullet slammed at his body and released high voltage of electricity that would have paralyzed him but all it did was brought him a strangely good feeling as a memory surfaced from his mind. Fury, Carlson, and the agents was startled at this as no known mutants or superhumans was able resist their control discs. Fury signaled once again as all the agents pulled their guns in a fluid manner, showing their professionalism and trained selves, and all of them shoots it at Andrew. Andrew lets all of this hit him as he felt something inside him awakening and was on the verge of unleashing itself. Bang, bang, though, to his disappointment, the agents emptied out their guns and lost ammo and the awakening inside him was not fulfilled to his distaste. TCH. Andrew clicked his tongue in disappointment as he began lifting his hand to the direction of Fury and the agents. Fury's expression took on a solemn one as he barked behind him prepare yourselves. Andrew's outstretched hand began clenching as the agents' expressions began taking that of pain and agony as they began dropping their guns and falling to the ground at the same time as their bodies began producing sounds of creaking bones as if their limbs was about to point in different directions if it continues. Phil Carlson wasn't spared as he also fall to the ground and was experiencing pain that far outstripped his own pain tolerance that he honed through his life as an agent. Most of the students and teachers of the mansion's expression all took on a frightened one at the horrifying scene they are currently seeing. Whoosh. Andrew was calmly looking at all of this when a blast of red energy beam struck him square to the chest and was thrown away. Alex Summers A.K. Havoc attacked. The teachers didn't say anything to scold their fellow or anything as they also thought that they should interfere. Alex Summers who has an angry countenance began walking forward as red ominous energy swirls on his hand up to his wrists. Andrew who lied on the green grass of the yard has a smile once again surfacing on his face as he lifts his two feet to the air and took a jump and lands on his feet fluidly. His body having no trace of injury while his clothes also being in the same state just like before. The moment he stood was the signal for Alex as he pointed his right hand to Andrew and once again blasts a beam of destructive energy. The red energy traveled at an amazing speed and quickly reached Andrew but stopped at two meters away from him, Andrew's force field stopping it. Whoosh! Alex clicked his tongue and then brought his other hand and joined the two as the red swirling plasmid destructive energy he was emitting doubled in its intensity. Oh ho! Andrew was surprised at the power of Alex Summers' blasts but also countered with his own. He punched in a wave of shinnick wave passed through his force field and the destructive blast and then hit Alex. Alex who was hit felt himself getting dizzy as the energy he was emitting gets extinguished as he falls to the ground. Unconscious. Alex. Scott shouted and immediately ran to his brother worriedly. Seeing that he was still breathing, Scott was relieved but his anger didn't diminish as he removed his ruby quartz glasses and looks at Andrew. Oh, come on, don't even bother. Andrew scoffed and formed an invisible wall in front of him. While Scott's concussive blasts was powerful, it still can't compare to Havoc. You murderer. Scott's anger skyrocketed after seeing his beam getting ignored and the look on Andrew's gaze that ultimately looked down on him ticked his nerves as he unconsciously increases the output of his power. But all was futile in face of true might as his concussive blasts was still having no effect as Andrew using his telepathy, flicked his fingers, for aesthetic purposes, to his direction and he immediately felt himself getting dizzy as he also fell to the ground. Unconsciousness. Andrew seeing them like this smiled in triumph but was interrupted as deep footsteps rapidly approached him from behind but he was alert as he flew away from the ground as a silver figure smashed his previous location. Colossus punch caused a relatively large crater to form on the ground. He lifts his head to look at the floating Andrew but his vision was suddenly turned upside down as flew in the air and smashed through numerous trees, destroying them in the process, and disappeared from sight. 
That was close. Andrew chided himself for not activating his TK domain and was near getting smashed into the ground from Colossus at normal strength. I should get out of here before this flaming bird's anger skyrocketed and I get incinerated into nothingness. One look at Jean's expression was enough to bring fright to those knowledgeable that they shouldn't mess with her lest her true power is unleashed. He was ready to fly away when a voice interrupted him take me. Andrew turned around and looked down and saw Ilya Narasputin walking towards his direction from below. Huh. Andrew was confused by her and thought that maybe she was being controlled by the Baldi but one peek inside her mind revealed what she really want. Ilyana what are you doing? The teachers tried to stop her they found themselves being rooted to the ground as they saw her stopping just below Andrew. Andrew smirked as he lifts her from the ground and came face to face with her. Ilyana was silent as she looks at the location where Piotr was thrown with an expressionless face. Wait, wait don't leave me here. A voice once again interrupted Andrew who was about to go away. John Pyro Allardyce walks to his direction and lifts his hand comically like a baby as he also said take me. I can't stand being here anymore. Johnny, what are you doing? Bobby Iceman Drake who was also rooted to the ground shouted in worry at the prospect of losing one of his friends to what he thought of as a deranged killer. Andrew thought for a moment and then willed Pyro to his side and formed an invisible force field around the three of them and turned to the ground and said with annoyance okay, who else? All was silent as even the rest of the new mutants has a complicated look on their faces. They like it here. So why should they go to what they now assumed as a mess of a person? Andrew looks down at the mutants and Fury who was helping Carlson to stand up and was about to fly away when something entered his field of vision from afar. Charles Xavier and the rest of the teacher took on a serious countenance as they heard the former telling them that their mortal enemy has arrived at the scene. Fury who also heard Charles immediately helped Phil Carlson who was limping from the pain that has long since passed since Alex distracted Andrew to get on their cars. He kicked some agents, who fainted from the pain, to wake them up in the process. The something that entered Andrew's field of vision quickly managed to approach the mansion as it turns out to be a group composed of five people being led by an old man wearing a dark violet and black costume with matching cape and metallic helmet on his head. The old man the same age of Charles ignored the, the floating Andrew, Ileana, and Pyro and turned to the latter and talked with a slight smile hello old friend. Chapter 23, Chapter 22, Leaving the X Mansion. Bonus chapter cuz why not? Equals 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 equals. 13th of September, 2011. Degree X Mansion Degree. Nick Fury P.O.B. Looking at the state of my agents and Carlson who was sporting a forced calm look and failing to do so because of what just happened to them, I couldn't help but curse. Motherfucker. This is starting to get out of hand. We have come here not really ready for the unexpected Magneto and his brotherhood. All of this wouldn't have got to this point if this kid just cooperated and came with us peacefully instead of battling the students of Xavier. Looking at the kid who had two mutants on his side looking as if he owns the world with that passive arrogant expression just ticks me the wrong way. Aside from the fact that he doesn't want to come with us. This kid actually had the gal and courage to hurt my agents and Carlson while sporting a calm facade as if we are nothing in his eyes. Those types of gays can only be found in the likes of Magneto and others like him. They think that the world revolves around them and that we, the normal folks, should be honored that we're even their presence in the first place. These types of people are really a headache to deal with. While I don't really know why he spared me from the pain just like what he did to Carlson and the others, I am pretty sure that there's nothing good that is currently running through that twisted mind of his. Though, what does this old magnetic want by being here and even bringing with him some of his heavy hitter? Did he come here to recruit this troublesome kid? No no, that can't happen, if Magneto got his hand on the kid, nothing good will definitely happen. Dash dash. Third person P.O.B. Hello old friend. Magneto smiled slightly to Charles. Hello Eric. But I'm pretty you came to not just say hello right. Charles the Evercom professor spoke. Magneto then turned his gaze to the silent fury at the ground and spoke, his voice dangerous what are you doing here carrying those accursed products built by that dwarf? We are not here for you or any students of Xavier except for that kid, he's what we came here for. Fury wasn't one to back down as he calmly replied with a strong voice. Magneto turned his face to the floating Andrews group and spoke with a soft voice what do they want with you, my child? Ileana was sporting a serious look as she knows how dangerous Eric Lane's hair also known as Magneto can be, hearing how the teachers are always speaking with apprehension when talking about him. While Pyro was silent and was readying his Sippo lighter in case of something. I don't know and I don't care. Andrew sarcastically replied with an impassive look. Magneto was silent as he turns and observes the two unconscious Summer's brother and the look of some of the students as they look at Andrew, seeing this, he was able to connect the dots and a smile began appearing on his old face as turns back to Andrew join us and assist us in our cause that will let the mutant race truly have a place in this world. Though his expected answer didn't came true as Andrew just said nope. Now, if you would excuse us, we have somewhere to go. Saying that, Andrew and two flew away with speed approaching that of the sound as they quickly disappeared in the horizon. Magneto wasn't discouraged with this as he has a hunch that he would meet the young man sooner or later once again. At that, Magneto turned his gaze once again to the seething fury as a malicious smile appeared on his face. Nick Fury sweat dropped seeing that smile as he felt a foreboding feeling. That day Fury goes back to the S.H.I.E.L.D. headquarters with his agents all having useless limbs or would take months to surrender while the prototype of the mutant collars he brought with him was all destroyed by the master of magnetism. Dash. Andrews P. P.O.B. One hour later. We flew down in a random alley in Seattle as I turned off the invisible effect of my force field and the force field itself. While I'm not really focused on practicing my soul mutant ability, my natural talent still couldn't help but work as in the past two months, my mastery over my force field creation got better passively as evident of how it has an invisible mode. I can also conjure multiple force field that all has the same durability and effects but I can only do it for some time before I begin feeling tired. So what do we do? Pyro voiced out as he looks at me. Ileana was silent as she just looks at me with a look indicating the same question. Well we visit some old friend of mine and after that I'll tell you what we I really want to do. I replied while yawning and then signaled for Pyro to come closer first. We do this, so those s.h.i.e.l.d don't come after our asses at every chance they got. Pyro furrowed his brows in confusion but complied, though, still confused. I reached my hand out and placed it on his face as I concentrated in using my body manipulation. Pyro seems to be confused but didn't resist. Then, a few moments later, I saw his face beginning to squirm like worms but I continued. A minute later, I removed my hand and smiled seeing my success. He should thank me that he became handsome. 
Pyro was still confused but then he saw Ileana sporting a surprised look on her face and the guy immediately asked W what? What is it? What happened to my face? You. Changed. Ileana said cryptically which just confuses Pyro even more as he turns to me and shouted with his voice laced with frustration you bastard. What did you do to my face? Ha ha ha. I couldn't help but laugh seeing him like this but seeing him still glaring at me. I put up my hand, surrendering, and willed a broken mirror from the side and put it in front of his face. Oh shit. Pyro shouted involuntarily as he saw a reflection that was clearly not him. Of course it's not him, his new face is handsome after all. He touched his face a few times before turning back to me damn, didn't know you could do that. You will be surprised more in the future. I smirked as I turned to Ileana after your turn. Is it really necessary? Ileana asked as she put her palms on her cheeks protectively. Is she acting cute? Don't worry, I can turn you two back any moment and it was your decision to come with me so blame your wild and adventurous mind. I replied mockingly as I motioned her to come to me already. TCH. Ileana complied but seems to muttered some curse words along the way. This wench dare, just like Pyro, she changed looks and I even gone on my way to change her hair color to midnight black. Damn she looks like a comic book character in live action. She looks, strangely good. Removing this thoughts away, I then changed my appearance and took on an above average face with olive skin color and I even changed my hair as I made it longer down past my shoulders where I tied it to a man bun. After checking if all was okay and perfect, the three is us came out of the alley together as we took a look at the surroundings. I narrowed my eyes and then turned to the two you can go explore this place if you want and then meet me about 6pm right there at that McDonald's. Copy. No, what will I even do in this place, I'll come with you. Ileana voiced out. Pyro looks at me and Ileana for a moment and then said copy, I know some place here I can visit so no worry, dot. Wait no, since this girl is coming, you should also come. I thought for a bit if bringing this troublesome girl with me is good but I didn't see any problem so I agreed and eventually also took Pyro. Just before leaving, I remembered something and stops and waves my hand on Pyro's head randomly. Hmm. Just a simple mind shield that will hide their Shinnik signature and their minds from a telepath. Hmm. Okay this is enough. After doing that I stopped and turned to Ileana. What did you do? Pyro asked while running his head trying to find something. I've put up a simple mind shield in your mind so that bald head wouldn't be able to trace us. After few seconds, I finished constructing the one on Ileana and after that we went our separate ways. I'm coming father. Dash. Magics, Ileana, P.O.B. Seeing Andrew beating all those pathetic man in TV was such a good feeling. I mean, they dare attack him and whip out some external power like missile and not use their own strength and expect it work like magic? Huh? They are as pathetic as their weapons. I have always felt Andrew was more than he was letting out. I always felt that he was hiding his true nature. Call it woman's intuition but I instinctively know it inside me. Then I got my answer. Seeing this bald cripple suddenly intruding inside my mind and showing me some memories that was supposed to encourage me to hate Andrew was just plain pathetic. I felt anger at the fact that he just went inside my mind casually which brought out a great disgust inside me for the bald head. But I just kept to myself as I know that I'm the minority here as I'm pretty sure that this teachers and students wouldn't even listen to me if I voiced out my opinion. They trust the guy with all of them and I even have the feeling that some of them, like Hank, Alex and Colossus would even sacrifice their own life for him. It was strange. But seeing the ever arrogant teacher and his brother that was like his carbon copy, as pathetic as they can get, being manhandled by Andrew effortlessly brought a smirk to my face. Since the day I was kidnapped by those monsters in human skin, I had always had an innate disgust for men for what those monsters did to me. While I have slowly been recovering and was now able to socialize normally, I still disgust them, especially those who are so weak that they rely on others. Though I was happy to see my brother Piotr whom I haven't seen for about five years. It seemed that my feelings for my brother as his little sister have long since been wiped away from my being through the time I spend with those monsters. I can't love him the way I love him five years before. Seeing him being thrown away by Andrew as easily as that confirmed to me that I, who has always longed for thrilling adventures and being able to kill people just like those monsters that I wouldn't be able to achieve if I stayed here, want to go with him. Andrew was different to all those men that I have met. He always looks at me as if I'm so insignificant hiding behind the facade of a gaze of a friend, and that caught my attention. So having those thoughts and nervous at the prospect of being rejected, I steeled myself as I called out to him. Dash dash. Pyro's P.O.B. Seeing Bobby beating me, once again, with a power that he doesn't even want or deserved brought out the flames of hate that I have long since been trying to bury in my heart since I need a place I can call home. While I have come to like being here in the mansion, it still confuses me how the principal of our school, Charles Xavier, just forms a merry band of mutants to battle evil mutants and fight for equality when the normal humans have already shown us again and again and again that they hate us. They deeply fear us for the things that we can do, the things that we can reach. They're seeding in jealousy that we, the mutants, are the one that won the evolutionary race. So instead of being proud and amazed, they try to snuff us out in fear that we will inevitably take over them, which is what should be, for we are the worthy. It confuses me how Charles Xavier fight for a useless cause when he can just will it to be and all of us, mutants, will be at the top of this world. But seeing what Andrew Detmer did in the streets of New York awakened that sleeping hope inside me, the hope that one day, we will not be afraid to walk on the very earth that should have been already ours in the first place. I saw the state of the street, some unfortunate normal humans who was caught in the small cement tsunami-like disaster that Andrew made. I saw how some cars with people in it are trying to get out of it pathetically. And then I saw a footage that seems to have been taken by a brave man that stays behind as he captures the scene where Andrew throws back the missile that the enemies thrown at them. And then moments later, I saw with my very own eyes personally how he induced pain upon those agents without even lifting a sweat and beat one of the strongest teacher and the cocky new student named Scott effortlessly. It was a total beatdown. At that moment, I knew to myself that I can't take it anymore. I knew to myself that I can't hide and need to face my true calling. At that moment, I called to him. Creator's Thoughts. Moshe L. BTW Should I Make a Discord? Chapter 24, Chapter 23, Seattle, Heartfelt Meeting. 13th of September, 2011. Degree Seattle Degree. Third Person P.O.B. Strolling through the streets of Seattle, Andrew, John, and Ileana walk side by side silently as the latter and Pyro curiously looks around since this is their first time here while the former looks around with a calm but nostalgic look while. 
He looks up and saw the space needle as memories of that night flashed continuously in his mind. Though, as he remembered that memory, a sudden thought flashed in his mind. Matt. In the original plot of the movie, he was supposed to die after being speared through and Matt managed to fly away at the last second, escaping the police, so if that's the case, then Matt is. Arriving at that revelation, Andrew rubs his forehead slightly at the idea of that guy still roaming around the world. While he doesn't really hate Matt that much since he knows that he only did that to protect the people and his city from him, it still doesn't sit right in his mind that there is a person out there, freely wondering, having the same power as him, he couldn't help but thought that the universe might orchestrate some bullshit where Matt, who isn't really that much talented in using his power, become as powerful as him in the future and become the hindrance in his path to the top. Andrew sighed at that thought but shoved it at the back of his mind eventually as this line of thought will not go anywhere unless he sees Matt right now, calming his already calm mind. The three continued walking together silently as they passed numerous places that brought out memories out of Andrew from time to time. They eventually arrived at a street named as 200 South Jackson Street. He was busy reminiscing the place when the blonde, now black, haired woman beside him tapped his shoulder roughly. Andrew looks at her, waiting for what she wants to say. Ileana didn't voice out what she wants and just points her forefinger to an establishment that has a logo that says Fat Shack and said eventually I haven't eaten anything for lunch yet so my stomach's already protesting. Andrew raised an eyebrow at her and then said doubtfully so, if you want to eat, then eat. I'll just meet you here later after I'm done. Yeah, you should just eat. Pyro commented. Andrew and Pyro turned their back from her and was ready to walk away when the former felt her pulling his clothes. Andrew turned and visible annoyance was written on his face. What? I didn't manage to bring any money. Ileana replied without shame as if it's the most normal thing. Ha ha ha. Pyro laughed seeing her acting shamelessly. Andrew took a breath in as he already know where this is going without even using telepathy, but he still asked for confirmation so. Let's eat, is what I'm saying, your treat of course. The Russian girl says with a smile, that ticked Andrew, on her face. Sigh, fine let's go. Andrew eventually agreed as even though he can now go without food for weeks, he still likes the taste of food. Dash. 30 minutes later. To say that Ileana was hungry was an understatement, the girl was a glutton. Not only she ordered some of the ones that Andrew and John chose, she even points and ordered some of those she saw that the other customers was having. Andrew couldn't help but rub his temples as he looks at the girl that has spicy chicken wing sauce all over her chin. It was as if she forgot proper etiquette after leaving the mansion. Through all that, John was slacked jawed as this is the first he saw a girl that can eat that much food. After having their fill and paying the astounded cashier while Andrew and John divided the pay and leaving with the Ileana who has a face full of contentment while rubbing her belly that was surprisingly not even bulging from all the food she ate, the three of them continued their walk. As they strolled leisurely, the three eventually stops in front of the school that Andrew, Matt, and Steve used to attend. What are we doing here? Ileana asked looking at the school. While John was silent as he just looked at the school with an unknown look on his face. Have you been inside a high school? Andrew turned to her. No, and I don't need to. Ileana replied. You've never been in one? What are you? Tarzan. John asked in puzzlement but Ileana didn't reply. Well, I don't care so let's go inside and take a look. Andrew wasn't having any of her bullshit as he started walking towards the school followed by John, leaving her. TCH. Ileana scoffs and pouted as she immediately catched up. The gates of the grounds of the school doesn't have any security whatsoever so they just walked in. They strolled through the corridors as they passed some students, some ignored them as they have better things to do, while others looked at them as the males focused their gazes on Ileana. Ileana scrunched her face in disgust as she saw those looks on the faces of the hormonal teenagers. John just kept silent but his eyes narrowed at the teenagers. Though, Andrew who saw all of this looked at one of the students who was sitting and leaning using his hand on a concrete fence. One look from Andrew was enough as the hand that the teenager who was ogling Ileana slipped as he then fell to the thorny garden behind him eliciting a painful shout from him as numerous thorns pierced his skin and stuck on them. Pfft. John tried to stop himself from laughing but was unsuccessful as some of the students who seems to be the friend of the one who fell glared at him. Andrew also chuckled seeing that but could not help but think about why did he even did that. He was pretty sure that he wasn't that petty after all. Well he was petty but, removing those thoughts away from his mind, he noticed Ileana eyeing him with a suspicious look on her face. What? He feigned innocence. Ileana remained silent and then removed her gaze and then continued looking at the place curiously. Andrew chuckled inwardly as they continued walking and they eventually made it to the sports field. He then saw some students playing football, American one, and he immediately noticed and recognized his past classmates. Especially those that always bullied him. The three of them sat at the bench while Andrew casually used his telepathy on a student near them as he took the peanuts that the poor student was eating and couldn't help but be surprised by the toasted flavor of it. Ileana and John just looked at him silently with a scrutinizing look as Andrew just shrugged his shoulders while popping some of the delicious nuts on his mouth what? He's a friend from work. The two then ignored him and looked in their front but a few moments just after watching, the three of them were already bored since all they can see is a group of female students practicing their cheerleading dance steps and a group of hormonal male students just running and slamming at each other for a ball. Andrew yawned as the two also yawned as if it was contagious while the former thought of something as he looks at his former bully who was jumping from excitement after scoring. As the next round started and the his former bully started running after the ball with youthful vigor, Andrew looks at the ball that blitzing through the air and its destination was the bully. Andrew smirked and willed it. Immediately, the ball that flying to the bully with normal speed suddenly doubled in its velocity and was about to slam at the face of the startled bully. Though, performing a good reaction speed and reflexes, the bully managed to evade the ball that was supposed to smash his face. Hey Andrew, was that you? John immediately thought who can do that and whipped his head to the guy beside him. Andrew did not answer as a chuckle escaped from his lips, the bully who was about to pick up the ball, recoiled as his face was smashed by the unassuming ball at the ground. The force of the impact was so great that the ball even took out few of the students' teeth as his mouth bled profusely. All the students watching immediately stood up seeing the supernatural event but one of them who was knowledgeable enough quickly shouted there's a mutant here. Ha ha ha. The three laughed as they quickly left the stadium and the school altogether. Dash. Twenty minutes later. The three now stood in front of the used-to-be house of Andrew as he turned to the two beside him wait for me here, I'll just visit someone. Not waiting for any respond, Andrew walked and arrived at the door. He didn't announce his arrival whatsoever as he just opened it and stepped inside. 
He looked at the familiar design of the house that still haven't changed even a dime and saw some pictures hanging at the wall. He saw his mother, Karen Detmer and a young him on one frame. He was smiling in the photo while doing a peace sign while his mother is pinching his cheeks with a smile. In another, he saw the three of them all together, his mother, himself and his father, Richard Detmer. The three of them looks happy as they all had a big smile on their faces. His blood began boiling after seeing his father in the picture but he was quick to stabilize his emotions. The psyche of the original Andrew Detmer was so strong that even now, it affects him from time to time aside from the fact that he already had all his qualities and was more Andrew than him being Mikhail originally. He walked for a bit and came on the living room, though, it couldn't be called living room anymore as anywhere he looked, from the corner to the middle of the floor was full of trash and bottles of alcohol. He settled his gaze to the couch and he saw the lone man who have made him suffer through his adolescent years just because of a fucking injury from him being a firefighter. Through those years, this man always vents to him his frustration and anger at the fact that he was now useless. Andrew took a deep breath to calm his emotion that was beginning to spiral out of control again. Him inhaling soundly seems to attract the attention of the man who drinking alcohol while lying lazily at the couch watching TV. The man turned his weary and beard-filled face to him and asked with voice filled with anger who the fuck are you? What the fuck are you doing here? Andrew didn't reply as his facial features began morphing and twisting disgustingly and a few seconds later, he now sported his original look as he just stood there silently. Seeing a guy suddenly appearing in your house unannounced was already enough to bring anger to Richard, but seeing the face of the guy suddenly morphing into that of his son immediately removed his anger as shock filled him. Though, that shock was temporary as he registered the fact that the son of his, the son that was the reason for his Karen's death was back, all alive and kicking, immediately brought back his anger and it even doubled up as hate, utter hate for his son, flooded his mind. You bastard of a meaty, you're actually alive? This must be some work of the devil. Immediately after saying that, Richard moved with speed unnatural for that of a drunk man, as he grabbed under the couch and pulled out a shotgun. Where did this guy even got that? Andrew thought curiously, though, he didn't make any move to protect himself as he just stood still. Die? Ha ha ha. Richard Detmer laughed madly as he lifted the barrel and aimed to his own son who was silent and pulled the trigger. Bang, bang, bang. Richard emptied out all its ammo as he panted breathlessly from the excitement. Now, his mutant son that he was sure wasn't his son and also the reason for the death of his beloved is sure to be dead. He smiled with elation forgetting the fact that Andrew survived being speared through but this kind of things wasn't emerging on his mind right now as he was busy reeling at the fact of being able to kill his accursed son. Unfortunately, as Richard lifted his head to look at his son expecting him to be on the ground, dead, he found him still on his position, standing strongly while still looking at him with those emotionless eyes and expressionless face. Horror dawned on Richard as he began to remember that his son has some accursed ability and was probably using it to survive being shot at. That's it. Are you that dumb thinking I'll die from some bullets? No wonder you got injured from your work. Andrew talked sarcastically while Richard who heard the sentence was filled with anger at the prospect of the bastard who he used to beat to submission would mock him like this. Though, he wasn't able to utter any more words as Andrew lifted his hand and infused his shinnik energy to the ground and the very earth itself as he effectively gained geokinesis and opened a hole as big as a two human beside the seating Richard. Richard was then lifted from his position and hovered on the air as realization dawned on him. This muty is going to bury him. He immediately shouted wait wait, son, I was just joking earlier, I know how powerful you are so I was just testing my own son as I'm very proud of you. Andrew raised an eyebrow at his attempt to cling at life and couldn't help but chuckle at his pathetic state. The once mighty and strong man that he used to know from his memories are being erased from this spectacle. Richard who saw him just chuckling at him couldn't control himself as he shouted with his voice filled with disdain. You fucking bastard, I shouldn't have had you, no, I shouldn't even had fucked your mother as in that case, my legacy wouldn't be sullied by such an abomination like you. Andrew heard his full sentence but was only focusing on the part where this bastard was mocking and humiliating his mother that was the only one that was there when all seems to be lost. Andrew felt his blood boiling once again at the sight of this person as he willed it and his shinnik energy followed his will as they wrapped around Richard's arms and went into different direction. Snap, snap, a sickening crack resounded throughout the room as Richard who was still bullshitting immediately stopped as his brain registered what just happened. Erg. Richard immediately wailed in pain as he saw his arms bent in different directions. He tried moving them but that seems to worsen the pain as the nerves inside his arms twitched and he felt an ever greater pain. Andrew felt Ileana and John entering the house and coming into the living room but didn't make any movement whatsoever to acknowledge them as he just focused on the floating figure in front of him. Dash. John and Ileana who heard a male shout of pain followed inside Andrew inside the house, defying his words to stay outside. And as they arrived at the living room, they saw Andrew and an older guy floating in front of him and above a hole having his own arms bending in different direction. They watched as the guy's fingers began moving as they moved and with a blur, they snapped upwards, breaking them in the process, and eliciting another pain howls from the man. Arg. This continued as Andrew seems to have a grudge with the man as he went for the remaining fingers and also did the same to all of them. Next, Andrew went for the feet and at this point, tears and snot have already painted the face of the older guy that Ileana even scrunched her face in disgust while Pyro just stays silent, waiting for the next move of Andrew. Andrew first gone with the feet as he twisted them all the way to the back and twisted them again essentially coming back to its original look as he did a 360 degrees twist. After finishing with the feet, Andrew then went for the lower leg that was comprised of two bones, tibia and fibula. Seeping his shinnik energy to that two bones, Andrew covered the inside and outside with shinnik energy and seeing if it's enough, he twisted them to each other forming some sort of rope made of bones repeatedly while ensuring they wouldn't break in the process. At this point, Richard was already unconscious from all the unimaginable pain he was subjected to. This seems to irk Andrew as he finally sighed and decided to end it already. He twisted his neck telekinetically and after doing that he twisted all his limbs to stick them all to his torso as he placed the body on the man-made hole and restored the ground and the cemented floor flawlessly. Andrew turned around and looked at his two spectator who was silent throughout the whole show. John swallowed seeing his emotionless eyes looking at them and unconsciously tightened his fist, readying his sipo lighter. Ileana on the hand swallowed for another reason. She looks at Andrew intensely with a look of apprehension in her eyes, though, that emotion wasn't the only one present inside of her eyes as there is something more, something strange that Andrew immediately picked up with his empathy. Equals 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 equals. Give me your stones. 
No threats needed as you all already know your jobs. Equals 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 equals. I'll post a bonus tomorrow if we reach 1.5k stones, but if not, then we just wait for Friday, lol. Not me just trying to run from responsibilities, lol. Creator's thoughts. Moshe L. Creation is hard, cheer me up. Like the story? Add it to the library. Have an idea for the story? Comment it down. Chapter 25, Chapter 24, Goals. 13th of September, 2011. Degree Seattle Degree. Andrews P.O.V. Ignoring the intense gaze of Ileana and whatever I sensed from her using my empathy, I extended my TK domain and observed the houses near us and the residents within them. Seeing all of them acting normal was enough as it seems they didn't really heard the paint howls of father just now. Not bad, seems like the soundproof force field I placed around the house was effective. Placing back my attention to the two in front of me who was still silent, I sat at on the ancient couch that my father used to sat at and signaled them to also sit at the chairs at the side. Looking at them as they sat silently, I cleared my throat as I spoke I know you two have questions, so, ask away and I'll try to answer them. From the look of John who was looking at me with apprehension and the same with Ileana, I am pretty sure questions are definitely through their minds right now even without using telepathy. John seems to take a deep breath to prepare himself as he asked who, who is he, dot. Ileana was still silent and seems to also have the same question. Well, he's my father. I replied casually as took a look at my surroundings. This guy's really a mess, I mean who can bear to live in a house this dirty? Arriving at that thought and feeling myself developing some kind of germophobia, I waved my hand and the trash that littered the whole floor began moving and piling themselves in one corner as looked around trying to find a trash bag. Wait, really? If so, why would you do that to him? That seems cruel. Isn't it? John responded to my answer and asked with puzzled face. I have long since considered him as nothing but a stranger. The only reason I came back here was to fulfill my job that was interrupted before. I calmly replied but behind my seemingly unperturbed facade, my emotions was starting to burn again as I remembered how the bastard dared to sully my mother with that filthy mouth of his. Just like what I said before, even though I have merged perfectly with the original Andrew, his psyche seems to be so strong that I now considered myself as more Andrew than Mikhail. So my feelings for my mother in this life was as strong, coupled with the fact that I lost my parents when I was so young in my past life. Removing those thoughts and calming my emotions, I continued looking for a trash bag as I heard Pyro's reply. MNN, I will not say anything about the fact that you just tortured him as I'm pretty sure you have a reason for that. My next question is what is the plan? Saying that last sentence, John took on a serious look as he removes his leaning back at the chair and seems to want to concentrate for my reply. That's also my question. Ileana finally made her voice heard. Well my plan would depend on what are also your plans for coming with me despite the obvious risk of being around me. I gave up looking for a trash bag around and leaned forward as I say that while crossing my fingers as my elbows rests at my thighs. John took on a solemn expression as he prepared what he's going to say. He finally spoke my goal is for us, mutants, to truly have freedom and have a home where we can truly feel peace without those humans trying to take us down at every chances they get. I won't be able to achieve this goal if I stayed there at that mansion where the leader is such of a pacifist that even if his students get hurt by humans, he just constantly says that they're just afraid and don't know what to do. I am tired of hiding. I am tired. It also came to me to join Magneto's Brotherhood of Mutants but I don't really like his way as it's just as redundant as Charles's way, though I share his ideas of us being the superior one over the humans as it's the absolute truth. What I want is true freedom. And my instinct is telling me that the only way to achieve that is by following you. So will you help me? No. Will you help us in this goal? At the end of his speech, John was slightly breathless as he looks at me with eyes full of conviction while clenching his hand tightly. Ileana was silent throughout John's speech but she seems to have also been affected by it as she is also clenching her fist while looking at me. I looked at the two silently and began weighing what John just said and how can this affect my future plans. At the same time, I couldn't help but notice how different this pyro to his movie and comic counterpart. Sure, he's still the same jealous guy but his goals and his mindset is much more different. After a while, I responded as I turned to Ileana. Looking at your expression, is this also what you truly want? Ileana snapped out her mind and my word seems to just registered at that moment as she replied WL. I would also like John's goal to be achieved but still, my main reason for coming with you is to have adventure and to be able to fight strong beings while being able to kill men that doesn't really deserve to live. I registered what she said and looked at the two of them for a while as I also weighed her goals. I stood up from the couch as I walked to the small dirty window of this house and looked outside. What you two want isn't really part of what I want to achieve. I sensed the two behind me getting restless from my answer so I continued with a button that seems to calm them down. My true goal is to be able to walk on this very earth unhindered, unchallenged, and absolute. And to achieve that, I will use any methods, whether they may be morally wrong or outright evil in the eyes of people, to achieve it, and along the way, I know that I will eventually have the power to help you two achieve your own goal on your own. But the question is, I paused at the last sentence as I turned around and looked at them directly how far are you willing to go? John, who was a teenager and should have been impulsive to answer, fell silent as numerous thoughts seems to run inside his mind. While Ileana immediately answered with a cold look on her face and with a voice just as cold I'll do anything. I looked at her deeply as she didn't back down and stared back with the same determination as that of John. John, who was silent, seems to have finally decided as he lifted his head to also look at me with will burning in his eyes. My answer's the same as Ileana. I will do anything. I looked at them for a moment and even gone on my way to read their thoughts bypassing the mind shield I put on them using the back door that only I can access. Though, some would say I am being a hypocrite since I'm basically doing just what Xavier likes to do. I don't care, I mean, what can they do? I have the power after all, maybe this is also how Charles feels. Seeing that they are as determined as they appear to be, a smile surfaced on my face as I spoke welcome to the team. Dash dash. Degree S.H.I.E.L.D. Headquarters, New York Branch. As the three was busy conversing in Seattle, Nick Fury on the other hand was sitting in anger as he roared at the agents in front of him how in the flying fuck can a big ass crystal that was literally glowing just freaking disappear? Huh? Tell me. All the agents face couldn't help but twitch in helplessness as they can't really answer him since they also don't know. Sigh. Get out of my presence right now before my fist suddenly find its location in your faces. Fury rubbed his temples in headache. The agents was quick, displaying their skills and what they learned being an agents of shield as they scurried off the room, while some nearly tripped. Just take it easy on them sir. Some of them were just new after all. 
Phil Kislin currently sporting a cast on his hand who was the only left aside from Fury's folk. That's the problem, Cowlson. I shouldn't have let some newbies take over and look for an unidentified object that has high possibility of its origin being of extraterrestrial. Sigh. Fury continued rubbing his temple in frustration. Coupled with the fact that our only lead to what it really was is now on the loose and that we, a global organization that specializes in tracking, can't even fucking find him. Speaking of that kid, is there still no lead on where is the body of his cousin? That shit is also frustrating me? Why does it seem that some of our important evidence are always missing in this freaking organization? We're the s.h.i.d.e.l.d. for God's sake, we specialize in containing and knowing almost everything? So why? Suddenly remembering the missing body of the cousin of that psychopath once again made Fury's anger skyrocket. Phil Kislin ignored his director's rumbling and tantrum as he spoke we still has no lead for the kid named Matt Goretti but you can rest assured that we're doing our best 24-7 in finding his missing body, whether he's still alive just like his cousin or not, we will find them both. Hearing what Carlson said made Fury serious again as he spoke seriously you also think that the kid is also alive just like that Andrew? Is it possible that the two has some sort of healing ability just like Logan of X-Men aside from their telekinetic ability? Arriving at that possibility made Fury's threat evaluation to Andrew Detmer's change. If it's really possible that the teenage kid has the same ability as that metal-coated mutant, then Andrew's threat should be adjusted accordingly and they should develop weapons to deal with someone that has a healing factor. Fortunately, Fury was a bit relieved that he's not going to spend any more funds for that development since the owner of the Trask Industries himself is getting on his way to perfecting his mutant inhibitor collar and X-gene suppressing weapons, those products should already be ready to be mass produced by the time a year passed or maybe even earlier than that. Though, arriving at the thought of mutants and Andrew, Fury couldn't help but facepalm inwardly as he remembered the latter. He and Phil Cowlson has suspected that the two cousins shouldn't be mutants or maybe partially. They had the suspicions that the crystal that they recovered from an underground cave in Seattle was somehow connected to the three kids named Andrew Detmer, Matt Goretti and Steve Montgomery acquiring that telekinetic abilities. The reason they managed to connect the dots was after comparing the energy signatures of both the mysterious glowing crystal, that even has its own gravitational pull, and the corpse of the friend of the two cousin named Steve Montgomery. They are already aware of the antics of the three friends as the moment they tried flying in the sky, s.h.i.e.l.d.e.'s own satellite detected that anomaly but just stayed silent as they thought that the three was mutants and assumed that the X-Men would eventually reach out to them. But, days passed and the three friends wasn't reached out by the X-Men but they just stayed silent and just finally made a move when Andrew and Matt battled their differences in Seattle. They managed to scan the kid named Matt's body and found unusual energy readings from his seemingly dead body and conducted tests to find where this energy came from since they didn't see any X-gene in the DNA of the kid and assumed that the kid acquired his powers from external source. Though, when they are halfway complete in their tests, the body of Matt Goretti vanished and no evidence was seen if the kid somehow came back to life and escaped or was taken away by someone purposely. Not willing to let their tests come to a halt just like this, Fury agreed to the suggestion of one of his scientists to take the corpse of the kid named Steve Montgomery and just replace the coffin with a random body, thinking to themselves that they would put back the body when they are finished with the tests. After conducting the necessary tests for days that come, the result came out and they managed to develop some kind of device and found the source of the energy that they found in the body of Steve and Matt. After finding the crystal underground, they also conducted tests on it and even exposed some test subjects to the crystal but they were disappointed as nothing happened, it was as if the crystal was on offline mode and wouldn't give any useful lead to them. Months later and they found out that one of their only lead to uncovering the secrets of crystal was alive as they hurried off to apprehend him, forgetting the fact that the kid was the one responsible for overturning a street and overestimated their own power, and as the inevitable outcome. Fury and Carlson came back empty-handed and the former was even more furious to find out that their main problem, the crystal, was missing. Though the body of Steve was still there, but it's now useless so Fury made the choice to place it back to where it came from, showing some sort of respect for the dead kid. Fury took a deep breath adjust Andrew's threat evaluation accordingly and find me that crystal, mobilize all that we have and find it and that Andrew and that Matt for me. Phil Carlson nodded with a serious look and with a yes, director. He turned around and walked out of the room, carrying his director's order seriously like the best agent that he is. Fury rubs his smooth bald head for a good feel to calm his shaking nerves due to his anger as he muttered his problems motherfucker. Stones people, stones. BTW should I post tomorrow? Some of you seems upset that I didn't post a bonus chapter yesterday saying that we reached 1.5k stones but fellas, we only reached the required stones after 17 hours past in Thursday, so don't blame me PLS. So I'ma tell you this, make us reach 2k plus stones at the exact time that Saturday day hits and you got a deal, Capus? Okay. Equals 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 equals. Comment. 37 comments. Vote. Two left.